Phyllis Gran and Leslie Geldman True Betrayals, Chapter 1 When she pulled the letter from her mailbox, Kelsey had no warning it was from a dead woman. The creamy stationery, the neatly handwritten name and address, and the Virginia postmark seemed ordinary enough. So ordinary, she had simply stacked it with her other mail on the old Belker table under her living room window while she slipped out of her shoes. She went into the kitchen and poured herself a glass of wine. She would sip it slowly, she told herself, before she opened her mail. She didn't need the drink to face the slim letter or the junk mail, the bills, the cheery postcard from a friend enjoying a quick trip to the Caribbean. It was the packet from her attorney that had shaken her. The packet she knew contained her divorce decree. The legal paper that would change her from Kelsey Monroe back to Kelsey Biden, from married woman to single, from half of a couple to a divorcee. It was foolish to think that way, and she knew it. She hadn't been married to Wade in anything but the most technical legal sense for two years, almost as long as they'd been husband and wife. But the paper made it all so final, so much more so than the arguments and tears, the separation, the lawyer's fees and legal maneuvers. Till death do us part, she thought grimly, and sipped some wine. What a crock! If that were true, she'd be dead at twenty-six, and she was alive, alive and well and back in the murky dating pool of singles. She shuddered at the thought. She supposed Wade would be out celebrating with his bright and spiffy-looking associate in the advertising agency, the associate he had had an affair with, the liaison that he told his stunned and furious wife had nothing to do with her or with their marriage. Funny, Kelsey hadn't thought of it that way. Maybe she didn't feel she'd had to die or kill Wade in order to part, but she'd taken the rest of her marriage vows seriously, and forsaking all others had been at the top of the list. No, she felt the perky and petite Larry with the aerobically sculpted body and cheerleader smile had had everything to do with her. No second chances had been given. His slip, as Wade had termed it, was never to be repeated. She had moved out of their lovely townhouse in Georgetown on the spot, leaving behind everything they had accumulated during the marriage. It had been humiliating to run home to her father and stepmother, but there were degrees of pride, just as there were degrees of love, and her love had snapped off like a light the instant she'd found Wade cozied up in the Atlanta hotel suite with Larry. Surprise, she thought with a sneer. Well, there'd been three very surprised people when she'd walked into that suite with a garment bag, and the foolishly romantic intention of spending the weekend leg of Wade's business trip with him. Perhaps she was rigid, unforgiving, hard-hearted, all the things Wade had accused her of being when she'd refused to budge on her demand for a divorce. But, Kelsey assured herself, she was also right. She topped off her wine and walked back into the living room of the immaculate Bethesda apartment. There was not a single chair or candlestick in the sun-washed room that had stood in Georgetown. Clean break. That's what she had wanted, that's what she'd gotten. The cool colors and museum prints that surrounded her now were hers exclusively. Stalling, she switched on the stereo, engaged the CD changer, and filled the room with Beethoven's Patatique. Her taste for the classics had been passed down from her father. It was one of the many things they shared. Indeed, they shared a love of knowledge, and Kelsey knew she'd been in danger of becoming a professional student before she'd taken her first serious job with Monroe Associates. Even then, she'd been compelled to take classes, in subjects ranging from anthropology to zoology. Wade had laughed at her, apparently intrigued and amused by her restless shuffling from course to course and job to job. She'd resigned from Monroe when she married him. Between her trust fund and Wade's income, she hadn't needed a job. She'd wanted to devote herself to the remodeling and redecorating of the townhouse they'd bought. She'd love every hour of stripping paint, sanding floors, hunting in dusty antique shops for just the right piece for just the right spot. Laboring in the tiny courtyard, scrubbing brick, digging weeds, and designing the formal English garden had been pure pleasure. Within a year, the townhouse had been a showplace, a testament to her taste and her effort and her patience. Now it was simply an asset that had been assessed and split between them. She had gone back to school, that academic haven where the real world could be pushed aside for a few hours every day. Now she worked part-time at the National Gallery, thanks to her art history courses. She didn't have to work, 
not for money. The trust fund from her paternal grandfather could keep her comfortable enough so that she could drift from interest to interest as she chose. So she was an independent woman. Young, she thought, and glancing over at the stack of mail. Single. Qualified to do a little of everything and a lot of nothing. The one thing she'd thought she'd excelled at, marriage, had been a dismal failure. She blew out a breath and approached the Belker table. She tapped her fingers against the legal packet, long, narrow fingers that had received piano lessons, art lessons, fingers that had learned to type, to cook gourmet meals, to program a computer, a very competent hand that had once worn a wedding ring. Kelsey passed over the thick envelope, ignoring the little voice that hissed the word coward inside her head. Instead, she picked up another, one with handwriting oddly like her own, It had the same bold, looping style, neat but a little flashy. Only mildly curious, she tore it open. Dear Kelsey, I realize you might be surprised to hear from me. She read on, the vague interest in her eyes turning to shock, the shock to disbelief. Then the disbelief turned into something almost like fear. It was an invitation from a dead woman, a dead woman who happened to be her mother. In times of crisis, Kelsey had always, for as long as she could remember, turned to one person. Her love for and trust in her father had been the one constant in her restless nature. He was always there for her, not so much a port in a storm, but a hand to hold until the storm was over. Her earliest memories were of him, his handsome, serious face, his gentle hands, his quiet, infinitely patient voice. She remembered him tying bows in her long, straight hair, brushing the pale blonde tresses while Bach or Mozart sang from the stereo. It was he who had kissed her childhood hurts better, who had taught her to read, to ride a bike, who had dried her tears. She adored him, was almost violently proud of his accomplishments as the chairman of the English department at Georgetown University. She hadn't been jealous when he'd married again. At 18, she'd been delighted that he'd finally found someone to love and share his life with. Kelsey had made room in her heart and home for Candace, and had been secretly proud of her maturity and altruism in accepting a stepmother and teenage stepbrother. Perhaps it had been easy because she knew deep in her heart that nothing and no one could alter the bond between herself and her father. Nothing and no one, she thought now, but the mother she'd thought was dead. The shock of betrayal was warring with a cold, stony rage as she fought her way through rush-hour traffic toward the lush, palatial estates in Potomac, Maryland. She'd rushed out of her apartment without her coat and had neglected to switch on the heater in her spitfire, but she didn't feel the chill of the February evening. Temper had whipped color into her face, adding a becoming rosy glow to the porcelain complexion, a snap to lake gray eyes. She drummed her fingers against the steering wheel as she waited for the light to change, as she willed it to change so she could hurry, hurry. Her mouth was clamped in a thin line that masked its lush generosity as she fought to keep her mind a blank. It wouldn't do to think now. No, it wouldn't do to think that her mother was alive, alive and living hardly an hour away in Virginia. It wouldn't do to think about that, or Kelsey might have started to scream but her hands were beginning to tremble as she cruised down the majestically tree-lined street where she'd spent her childhood, as she pulled into the drive of the three-story brick colonial where she'd grown up. It looked as peaceful and tidy as a church, its windows gleaming, its white, trim, pure as an unblemished soul. Puffs of smoke from the evening fire curled from the chimney, and the first shy crocuses poked their delicate leaves up around the old elm in the front yard. The perfect house in the perfect neighborhood, she'd always thought. Safe, secure, tasteful, only a short drive to the excitement and culture of D.C., and with the well-polished hue of quiet, respectable wealth. She slammed out of the car, raced to the front door, and shoved it open. She'd never had to knock at this house. Even as she started down the Berber runner in the white-tiled foyer, Candace came out of the sitting room to the right. She was, as usual, immaculately dressed, the perfect academic wife in conservative blue wool, her mink-colored hair swept back from her lovely, youthful face to reveal simple pearl earrings. Kelsey, what a nice surprise. I hope you can stay for dinner. We're entertaining some of the faculty, and I can always use... Where is he? Kelsey interrupted. 
Candace blinked, surprised by the tone. She could see now that Kelsey was in one of her snits. The last thing she needed an hour before her house filled up with people was one of her stepdaughter's explosions. Automatically, she shifted her stance. Is something wrong? Where's Dad? You're upset. Is it Wade again? Candace dismissed the problem with a wave of her hand. Kelsey, divorce isn't pleasant, but it isn't the end of the world either. Come in and sit down. I don't want to sit down, Candace. I want to talk to my father. Her hands clenched at her sides. Now, are you going to tell me where he is, or do I have to look for him? Hey, sis. Channing strode down the stairs. He had his mother's strong good looks and a thirst for adventure that had, according to his mother, come from nowhere. Though he'd been fourteen when Candace married Philip Biden, Channing's innate good humor had made the transition seamless. What's up? Kelsey deliberately took a deep breath to keep from shouting. Where's Dad, Channing? The prop's in his study, buried in that paper he's been writing. Channing's brows lifted. He, too, recognized the signs of a rage in the making, the spark in the eye, the flush on the cheeks. There were times he would put himself out to bank that fire, and times he would indulge himself and fan it. Hey, Kells, you're not going to hang around with these bookworms tonight, are you? Why don't you and I skip out, hit a few clubs? She shook her head and tore down the hall toward her father's study. Kelsey! Candace's voice, sharp, annoyed, trailed after her. Must you be so volatile? Yes, Kelsey thought as she yanked open the door of her father's favorite sanctuary. Yes. She slammed the door at her back, saying nothing for a moment as the words were boiling up much too hot and much too fast in her throat. Philip sat at his beloved oak desk, nearly hidden behind a stack of books and files. He held a pen in his bony hand. He'd always maintained that the best writing came from the intimacy of writing and stubbornly refused to compose his papers on a word processor. His eyes behind the silver-framed glasses had the owlish look they took on when he amputated himself from the reality of what was around him. They cleared slowly, and he smiled at his daughter. The desk light gleamed on his close-cropped pewter hair. There's my girl, just in time to read over this draft of my thesis on Yeats. I'm afraid I might have gotten long-winded again. He looked so normal, was all she could think, so perfectly normal sitting there in his tweed jacket and carefully knotted tie, handsome, untroubled, surrounded by his books of poetry and genius. And her world, of which he was the core, had just shattered. She's alive, Kelsey blurted out. She's alive, and you lied to me all my life. He went very pale, and his eyes shifted from hers. Only for an instant, barely a heartbeat, but she'd seen the fear and the shock in them. What are you talking about, Kelsey? But he knew. He knew, and he had to use all of his self-control to keep the plea out of his voice. Don't lie to me now! She sprang toward his desk. Don't lie to me! She's alive! My mother's alive, and you knew it. You knew it every time you told me she was dead. Panic sliced through Philip, keen as a scalpel. Where did you get an idea like that? From her? She plunged her hand into her purse and dragged out the letter. From my mother. Are you going to tell me the truth now? May I see it? Kelsey tilted her head, stared down at him. It was a look that could pick clean down to the bone. Is my mother dead? He wavered, holding the lie as close to his heart as he held his daughter. But he knew, as much as he wished it could be otherwise, if he kept one, he would lose the other. No. May I see the letter? Just like that. The tear she'd been fighting swam dangerously close to the surface. Just a no? After all this time, all the lies? Only one lie, he thought, and not nearly enough time. I'll do my best to explain it all to you, Kelsey, but I'd like to see the letter. Without a word, she handed it to him. Then, because she couldn't bear to watch him, she turned away to face the tall, narrow window, where she could see evening closing in on the last bloom of twilight. The paper shook so in Philip's hand that he was forced to set the sheet on the desk in front of him. The handwriting was unmistakable. Dreaded. He read it carefully, word by word. Dear Kelsey, I realize you might be surprised to hear from me. It seemed unwise, or at least unfair, to contact you before. Though a phone call might have been more personal, I felt you would need time, and a letter gives you more of a choice on your options. They will have told you I died when you were very young. In some ways it was true, and I agreed with the decision to spare you. 
Over twenty years have passed, and you're no longer a child. You have, I believe, the right to know that your mother is alive. You will perhaps not welcome the news. However, I made the decision to contact you and won't regret it. If you want to see me or simply have questions that demand answers, you'd be welcome. My home is Three Willows Farm, outside of Bluemont, Virginia. The invitation is an open one. If you decide to accept it, I would be pleased to have you stay as long as it suited you. If you don't contact me, I'll understand that you don't wish to pursue the relationship. I hope the curiosity that pushed you as a child will tempt you to at least speak with me. Yours, Naomi Chadwick. Naomi. Philip closed his eyes. Good God, Naomi. Nearly twenty-three years had passed since he'd seen her, but he remembered everything about her with utter clarity. The scent she'd worn that reminded him of dark mossy glades, the quick, infectious laugh that never failed to turn heads, the silvery blonde hair that flowed like rain down her back, the sooty eyes and willowy body. So clear were his memories that when Philip opened his eyes again, he thought he saw her. His heart took one hard, violent leap into his throat that was part fear, part long-suppressed desire. But it was Kelsey, her back stiff, facing away from him. How could he have ever forgotten Naomi, he asked himself, when he had only to look at their daughter to see her. Philip rose and poured a scotch from a crystal decanter. It was kept there for visitors. He rarely touched anything stronger than a short snifter of blackberry brandy. But he needed something with bite now, something to still the trembling of his hands. "'What do you plan to do?' he asked Kelsey. "'I haven't decided.' She kept her back to him. "'A great deal of it depends on what you tell me.' Philip wished he could go to her, touch her shoulders. But she wouldn't welcome him now. He wished he could sit, bury his face in his hands, but that would be weak and useless. More, much more, he wished he could go back twenty-three years and do something, anything, to stop fate from running recklessly over his life. But that was impossible. It isn't a simple matter, Kelsey. Lies are usually complicated. She turned then, and his fingers clutched reflexively on the lead crystal. She looked so much like Naomi. The bright hair carelessly tumbled, the eyes dark, the skin over those long, delicate facial bones flushed luminously with passion. Some women looked their best when their emotions were at a dangerous peak. So it had been with Naomi, so it was with her daughter. "'That's what you've done all these years, isn't it?' Kelsey continued. "'You've lied to me. Grandmother lied. She lied.' Kelsey gestured toward the desk where the letter lay. "'If that letter hadn't come, you would have continued to lie to me.' "'Yes, as long as I continue to think it was best for you.' "'Best for me? How could it be best for me to believe my mother was dead? How can a lie ever be best for anyone?' "'You've always been so sure of right and wrong, Kelsey. "'It's an admirable quality.' "'He paused, drank. "'And a terrifying one. "'Even as a child, your ethics were unwavering. "'So difficult for mere mortals to measure up.' "'Her eyes kindled. "'It was close, much too close to what Wade had accused her of. "'So it's my fault. "'No, no.' He closed his eyes and rubbed absently at a point in the center of his forehead. None of it was your fault, and all of it was because of you. Philip, after a quick knock, Candace opened the study door. The Dorsets are here. He forced a weary smile onto his face. Entertain them, dear. I need a few moments with Kelsey. Candace flashed a look at her stepdaughter, disapproval mixed with resignation. All right, but don't be long. Dinner's set for seven. Kelsey, shall I set another place? No, Candace, thank you. I'm not staying. All right, then, but don't keep your father long. She eased the door shut. Kelsey drew a breath, stiffened her spine. Does she know? Yes, I had to tell her before we were married. Had to tell her, Kelsey repeated, but not me. It wasn't a decision that I made lightly that any of us made lightly. Naomi, your grandmother, and I all believed it was in your best interest. You were only three, Kelsey, hardly more than a baby. I've been an adult for some time, Dad. I've been married, divorced. 
You have no idea how quickly the years go. He sat again, cradling the glass. He'd convinced himself that this moment would never come, that his life was too staid, too stable to ever take this spinning dip on the roller coaster again. But Naomi, he thought, had never settled for staid. Neither had Kelsey, and now it was time for truth. I've explained to you that your mother was one of my students. She was beautiful, young, vibrant. I've never understood why she was attracted to me. Happened quite quickly, really. We were married within six months after we met. Not nearly long enough for either of us to understand how truly opposite we were in nature. We lived in Georgetown. We'd both come from what we could call privileged backgrounds. But she had a freedom I could never emulate, a wildness, a lust for people, for things, for places, and, of course, her horses. He drank again to ease some of the pain of remembering. I think it was the horses more than anything else that first came between us. After you were born, she wanted desperately to move back to the farm in Virginia. She wanted you to be raised there. My ambitions and hopes for the future were here. I was working on my doctorate, and even then I had my eye set on becoming the English department chairman at Georgetown. For a while we compromised, and I spent what weekends I could spare in Virginia. It wasn't enough. It's simplest to say we grew apart. Safer to say it, he thought, staring into a scotch, and certainly less painful. We decided to divorce. She wanted you in Virginia with her. I wanted you in Georgetown with me. I neither understood nor cared for the racing crowd she ran with, the gamblers, the jockeys. We fought, bitterly. Then we hired lawyers. A custody suit? Stunned, Kelsey gaped at her father. You fought over custody? It was an ugly business, unbelievably vile. How two people who had loved each other, had created a child together, could become such mortal enemies as a pathetic commentary on human nature. He looked up again, finally, and faced her. I'm not proud of it, Kelsey, but I believed in my heart that you belonged with me. She was already seeing other men. It was rumored that one of them had ties to organized crime. A woman like Naomi would always attract men. It was as though she was flaunting them, the parties, her lifestyle, daring me and the world to condemn her for doing as she pleased. So you won. Kelsey said quietly. You won the suit and me, and then decided to tell me she died. She turned away, facing the window that was dark now. In it she could see the ghost of herself. People divorced in the seventies. Children coped. There should have been visitation. I should have been allowed to see her. She didn't want you to see her. Neither did I. Why? Because she ran off with one of her men? No. Philip set the glass aside carefully on a thin silver coaster. Because she killed one of them. Because she spent ten years in prison for murder. Kelsey turned slowly, so slowly because the air was suddenly thick. Murder? You're telling me that my mother is a murderess? I'd hoped never to tell you. He rose then, Sure he could hear his own bones creak in the absolute silence. You were with me. I thank God you were with me rather than on the farm the night it happened. She shot her lover, a man named Alec Bradley. They were in her bedroom. There was an argument, and she took a gun from the drawer of the bedside table and killed him. She was twenty-six, the same age as you are now. They found her guilty of murder in the second degree, the last time I saw her, she was in prison. She told me she would rather you believe her dead. If I agreed, she swore she wouldn't contact you, and she kept her word until now. I can't understand any of this. Reeling, Kelsey pressed her hands over her eyes. I would have spared you. Gently, Philip took her wrists, lowering her hands so he could see her face. If protecting you was wrong... Then I'll tell you I was wrong, but without apology. I loved you, Kelsey. You were my entire life. Don't hate me for this. 
No, I don't hate you. In an old habit, she laid her head on his shoulder, resting it there while ideas and images spun in her brain. I need to think. It all seems so impossible. I don't even remember her, Dad. You were too young, he murmured, rocked by relief. I can tell you that you look like her. It's almost uncanny how much. And that she was a vibrant and fascinating woman, whatever her flaws. A crime of violence being one of them, Kelsey thought. There are so many questions, but I can't seem to latch on to one. Why don't you stay here tonight? As soon as I can get away, we'll talk again. It was tempting to give in, to close herself into the safe familiarity of her old room, to let her father soothe away the hurts and the doubts, as he always did. No, I need to go home. She drew away before she could weaken. I should be alone for a while. And Candace is already annoyed with me for keeping you from your guests. She'll understand. Of course she will. You'd better get along. I think I'll go out the back. I'd just as soon not run into anyone right now. The passionate flush had died away, he noted, leaving her skin pale and fragile. Kelsey, I wish you'd stay. I'm all right, really. All I need to do is absorb it. We'll talk later. Go see to your guests, and we'll talk more about this later. She kissed him, as much a sign of forgiveness as to hurry him along. Once she was alone, she walked behind the desk and stared at the letter. After a moment, she folded it and slipped it back into her purse. It had been a hell of a day, she decided. She'd lost a husband and gained a mother. Chapter 2 Sometimes it was best to follow your impulses. Perhaps not best, Kelsey corrected as she drove west along Route 7 through the rolling Virginia hills. But it was certainly satisfying. Speaking to her father again might have been wiser, taking time to think things through, but it was much more satisfying to simply hop into the car and head to Three Willows Farm and confront the woman who'd played dead for two decades. Her mother, Kelsey thought. The murderess. To distract herself from that image, Kelsey turned up the radio so that Rachmaninoff soared through the half-open window. It was a beautiful day for a drive. That's what she told herself when she'd hurried out of her lonely apartment that morning. She hadn't admitted her destination then, even though she'd checked the map to find the best route to Bluemont. No one knew she was coming. No one knew where she'd gone. There was freedom in that. She pressed down on the gas and reveled in the speed, the whip of the chilly air through the windows, the power of the music. She could go anywhere, do anything. There was no one to answer to, no one to question. It was she who had all the questions now. Maybe she'd dressed a bit more carefully than a casual drive in the country warranted. That was pride. The peach tone of the silk jacket and slacks was a good color for her, the breezy lines flattering to her slim frame. After all, any woman who was about to meet her mother for the first time as an adult would want to look her best. She'd fixed her hair into a neat and intricate braid and spent more time than usual on her makeup and accessories. All the preparations had eased her nerves, but she was beginning to feel them again as she approached Bluemont. She could still change her mind, Kelsey told herself as she stopped the car in front of a small general store. Asking for directions to Three Willows didn't mean she had to follow them. She could, if she wanted, simply turn the car around and head back to Maryland. Or she could just drive on, through Virginia, into the Carolinas. She could turn west or east toward the shore. One of her favorite indulgences was hopping in her car and driving wherever the whim took her. She'd spent an impulsive weekend at a lovely little bed and breakfast on the eastern shore after she'd left Wade. She could go there again, she mused. A call in to work, a stop at a mall along the way for a change of clothes, and she'd be set. It wasn't running away, it was simply leaving. Why should it feel so much like running away? The little store was so crammed with shelves and dairy cases and walls of tools that three customers made a crowd. The old man behind the counter had an ashtray full of butts at his elbow, a head as bald and shiny as a new dime, and a fresh cigarette dangling from the corner of his mouth. He squinted at Kelsey through a cloud of smoke. I wonder if you could tell me how to get to Three Willows Farm? He stared at her another minute, his smoke-reddened eyes narrowing with speculation. You'd be looking for Miss Naomi. Kelsey borrowed a look from her grandmother, one designed to put the questioner firmly in his place. I'm looking for Three Willows Farm. I believe it's in this area. 
Oh, yeah, it is. He grinned at her, and somehow the cigarette defied gravity and stuck in place. Here's what you do. You go on down the road a piece, say about two miles. There's a fence there, a white one. You're going to want to make a left on Chadwick Road and head on down another five miles or so. Go on past Longshot. Got a big wrought iron fence with a name on it so as you can't miss it. Next turn you come to's got two stone posts with rearing horses on them. That's three willows. Thank you. He sucked in smoke, blew it out. Your name wouldn't be Chadwick, would it? No, it wouldn't. Kelsey went out, letting the door swing shut behind her. She felt the old man's eyes on her even as she pulled the car back onto the road. Understandable, she supposed. It was a small town, and she was a stranger. Still, she hadn't liked the way he'd stared. She found the white fence and made the left out of town. The houses were farther apart now as the land took over, rolling and sweeping with the hills that were still caught between the haze of winter and the greening of spring. Horses grazed, manes ruffling in the breeze. Mares, their coats still thick with winter, cropped while their young gambled nearby on spindly, toothpick legs. Here and there a field was plowed for spring planting, squares of rich brown bisecting the green. She slowed the car at long shot. It wasn't a road, as she'd assumed, but a farm. The curvy, wrought-iron gate boasted the name, and through it she could see the long sweep of a McAdam lane leading up to a cedar and stone house on the crest of a hill. Attractive, she mused, commanding, as many levels and terraces would afford breathtaking views from every inch. The lane was lined with elms that looked much older and much more traditional than the house itself, which was almost arrogantly modern, yet it perched on the hill with a territorial pride. Kelsey sat there for some time, not that she was terribly interested in the architecture or the scenery, as compelling as it was. She knew if she continued down this road, she wouldn't turn back. Long shot, she decided, was the point of no return. It seemed ironically appropriate. Closing her eyes, she willed her system to level. This was something she should do coolly, pragmatically. This wasn't a reunion where she would launch herself, weeping into the arms of her long-lost mother. They were strangers who needed to decide if they would remain so. No, she corrected. She would decide if they would remain so. She was here for answers, not love, not even reasons. And she wouldn't get them, Kelsey reminded herself, if she didn't continue on and ask the questions. She'd never been a coward. She could add that to her list of vanities, Kelsey told herself, as she put the car in gear again. But her hands were cold as she gripped the wheel, as she turned between the two stone posts with their rearing horses, as she drove up the gravel lane toward her mother's house. In the summer, the house would have been shielded by the three graceful willows for which it had been named. Now the bowed branches were just touched with the tender green of approaching spring. Through their spindly fans she could see the white Doric columns rising up from the wide-covered porch, the fluid curves of the three-story plantation-style house. Feminine, she thought, almost regal, and like the era it celebrated, gracious and stately. There were gardens she imagined would explode with color in a matter of weeks. She could easily picture the scene heightened by the hum of bees and the chirp of birdsong, perhaps the dreamy scent of wisteria or lilac. Instinctively her gaze lifted to the upper windows. Which room, she wondered, which room had been the scene of murder? A shiver walked down her spine as she stopped the car. Though her intention had been to go straight up to the front door and knock, she found herself wandering to the side of the house where a stone patio spilled out of tall French doors. She could see some of the outbuildings from there, tidy sheds, a barn that looked nearly as stately as the house itself. Farther out, where the hills curved up, she could see horses cropping and the faint glitter of sun striking water. All at once another scene flipped over the vision. The bees were humming, the birds singing, the sun was hot and bright, and she could smell roses so strong and sweet. Someone was laughing and lifting her up and up until she felt the good, strong security of a horse beneath her. With a little cry of alarm, Kelsey pressed a hand to her lips. She didn't remember this place. She didn't. It was her imagination taking over. That was all. Imagination and nerves. But she could swear she heard that laughter, the wild, free seduction of it. She wrapped her arms around her body for warmth and took a step in retreat. 
She needed her coat, she told herself. She just needed to get her coat out of the car. Then the man and woman swung around the side of the house, arm in arm. They were so beautiful, staggeringly so, in that flash of sunlight, that for a moment Kelsey thought she was imagining them as well. The man was tall, an inch or more over six feet, with that fluid grace certain men are born with. His dark hair was wind-blown, curled carelessly over the collar of a faded chambray shirt. She saw his eyes, deeply, vividly blue in a face of angles and shadows, widen briefly in what might have been mild surprise. Naomi, his voice had the faintest of drawls, not slow so much as rich like a fine-aged bourbon. You have company. Nothing her father had told her had prepared her. It was like looking in a mirror at some future time, a mirror polished to a high sheen so that it dazzled the eyes. Kelsey might have been looking at herself. For one mad moment, she was afraid she was. Well, Naomi's hand clamped hard on Gabe's arm. It was a reaction she wasn't aware of, and one she couldn't have prevented. I didn't think I would hear from you so soon, much less see you. She'd learned years before that tears were useless, so her eyes remained dry as she studied her daughter. We were about to have some tea. Why don't we go inside? I'll take a rain check, Gabe began, but Naomi clung to his arm as if he were a shield or a savior. That's not necessary, Kelsey heard her own voice as from a distance. I can't stay long. Come inside, then. We won't waste what time you have. Naomi led the way through the terrace doors into a sitting room as lovely and polished as its mistress. There was a low, sedate fire in the hearth to ward off the late winter chill. Please, sit down, be comfortable. It'll only take me a moment to see about the tea. Naomi shot one quick glance at Gabe and fled. He was a man accustomed to difficult situations. He sat, drew out a cigar, and flashed Kelsey a smile fashioned to charm. Naomi's a bit flustered. Kelsey lifted a brow. The woman had seemed as composed as an ice sculpture. Is she? Understandable, I'd say. You gave her a shock. Took me back a step myself. He lighted the cigar and wondered if the raw nerves so readable in Kelsey's eyes would allow her to sit. I'm Gabe Slater, neighbor, and you're Kelsey. How would you know? Queen to peasant, he thought. It was a tone that would normally challenge a man, certainly a man like Gabriel Slater, but he let it pass. I know Naomi has a daughter named Kelsey, whom she hadn't seen in some time, and you're a little young to be her twin sister. He stretched out his legs and crossed them at his booted ankles. They both knew he'd yet to take his eyes off her, and he knew he didn't intend to. You'd pull off that dignified act better if you sat down and pretended to relax. I'd rather stand. She moved to the fire and hoped it would warm her. Gabe merely shrugged and settled back. It was nothing to him, after all, unless she took a few pot shots at Naomi. Not that Naomi couldn't handle herself. He'd never known a woman more capable or, in his mind, more resilient. Nonetheless, he was too fond of her to let anyone, even her daughter, hurt her. Neither did it concern him that Kelsey had obviously decided to ignore him. He took a lazy drag on his cigar and enjoyed the view. Stiff shoulders and a rigid spine didn't spoil it, he mused. It was a nice contrast to the long, fluid limbs and fancy hair. He wondered how easily she spooked, and if she'd be around long enough for him to test her himself. Tea will be right in. Steadier, Naomi came back into the room. Her gaze locked on her daughter, and her smile was practiced. This must be horribly awkward for you, Kelsey. It isn't every day my mother comes back from the grave. Was it necessary for me to think you were dead? It seemed so at the time. I was in a position where my own survival was a priority. She sat looking tailored and unruffled in her dun-colored writing habit. I didn't want you visiting me in prison, and if I had, your father would never have agreed to it. So I was to be out of your life for ten to fifteen years. Her smile shifted a few degrees, going brittle. How would the parents of your friends have reacted when you told them your mother was doing time for murder? I doubt you'd have been a popular little girl, or a happy one. 
Naomi broke off, looking toward the hallway as a middle-aged woman in a gray uniform and white apron wheeled in a tea tray. "'Here's Gertie. You remember Kelsey, don't you, Gertie?' "'Yes, ma'am.' The woman's eyes teared up. "'You were just a baby last time. You'd come begging for cookies.' Kelsey said nothing, could say nothing to the damp-eyed stranger. Naomi put a hand over Gertie's and squeezed gently. "'You'll have to bake some the next time Kelsey visits. Thank you, Gertie, I'll pour.' "'Yes, ma'am.' Sniffling, she started out, but turned when she came to the doorway. "'She looks just like you, Miss Naomi, just like you.' Yes, Naomi said softly, looking at her daughter. She does. I don't remember her. Kelsey's voice was defiant as she took two strides toward her mother. I don't remember you. I didn't think you would. Would you like sugar? Lemon? Is this supposed to be civilized? Kelsey demanded. Mother and daughter reunite over high tea? Do you expect me to just sit here sipping oolong? Actually, I think it's Earl Grey. And to tell you the truth, Kelsey, I don't know what to expect. Anger, certainly. You deserve to be angry. Accusations, demands, resentments. With hands that were surprisingly steady, Naomi passed Gabe a cup. To be honest, I doubt there's anything you could say or do that wouldn't be justified. Why did you write me? Taking a moment to organize her thoughts, Naomi poured another cup. A lot of reasons, some selfish, some not. I'd hoped you'd be curious enough to want to meet me. You were always a curious child, and I know that at this point in your life you're at loose ends. How do you know anything about my life? Naomi's gaze lifted, as unreadable as the smoke wafting up the flue. You thought I was dead, Kelsey. I knew you were very much alive. I kept track of you. Even in prison I was able to do that. Fury had Kelsey stepping forward, fighting the urge to hurl the tea tray in all the delicate china. It would be satisfying, oh, so satisfying, but it would also make her look like a fool. Only that kept her from striking out. Sipping tea, Gabe watched her struggle for control. High-strung, he decided, impassioned, but smart enough to hold her ground. She might, he thought, be more like her mother than either of them knew. You spied on me! Kelsey bit off the words. You hired what, detectives? Nothing quite so melodramatic as that. My father kept track of you while he could. Your father? Kelsey sat down. My grandfather? Yes, he died five years ago. Your grandmother died the year after you were born, and I was an only child. You're spared a flood of aunts and uncles and cousins. Whatever questions you have, I'll answer but I'd appreciate it if you'd give us both a little time before you make up your mind about me. There was only one she could think of, one that had continued to hammer at the back of her mind. So she asked it quickly before she could draw away from it. Did you kill that man? Did you kill Alec Bradley? Naomi paused, then lifted her cup to her lips. Over the rim, her eyes stayed steady on Kelsey's. She set the cup down again without a rattle. Yes, she said simply. I killed him. I'm sorry, Gabe. Naomi stood at the window watching her daughter drive away. It was really unforgivable of me to put you in that position. I met your daughter, that's all. On a weak laugh, Naomi squeezed her eyes shut. Always the master of understatement, Gabe. She turned then, standing in the strong light. It didn't bother her that the sun would highlight the fine lines around her eyes, show her age. She'd spent too long away from it, too long away. I was afraid. When I saw her, so much came flooding back, some expected, some not expected. I couldn't deal with it alone. He rose and went to her, laying his hands on her shoulders to soothe the strong, tensed muscles. If a man isn't happy to help a beautiful woman, he might as well be dead. You're a good friend. She lifted a hand to his, squeezed. One of the very few I can drop all pretenses with. Her lips curved again. Maybe it's because we've both done time. A quick smile lifted the corners of his mouth. Nothing like prison life to peck down common ground. Nothing like prison life. Of course, a youthful run-in over a poker game doesn't quite come up to murder, too, but... 
There you go, one up in me again. She laughed. We Chadwicks are so competitive. She moved away from him, shifting a vase of early daffodils an inch to the right on a table. What do you think of her, Gabe? She's beautiful. The image of you. I thought I was prepared for that. My father had told me, and the photographs. But to look at her and see myself, it still staggered me. I remember the child, remember the child so well. Now, seeing her grown up, impatient with herself, she shook her head. The years passed. She knew that better than anyone. But beyond that, she glanced over her shoulder. What did you think of her? He wasn't sure he could or would explain precisely what he'd thought. He, too, had been staggered, and he was a man rarely surprised. Beautiful women had walked in and out of his life, or he in and out of theirs. He appreciated them, admired them, desired them. But his first glimpse of Kelsey Biden had all but stopped his heart. He would dissect that interesting little fact later, but for now Naomi was waiting, and he knew his answer mattered. She was running on nerves and temper. She doesn't quite have your control. I hope she never needs it, Naomi murmured. She was angry but smart enough and curious enough to hold on to her temper until she gauges the lay of the land. If she were a horse, I'd have to say I need to see her paces before I could judge if she has heart, endurance, or grace. But blood tells, Naomi, your daughter has style. She loved me. Her voice shook, but she didn't notice, nor did she notice the first tear that spilled over and trailed down her cheek. It's difficult to explain to someone who's had no children what it's like to be the recipient of that kind of total, uncompromising love. Kelsey felt that for me and for her father. It was Philip and I who lacked. We didn't love enough to keep that unit whole. And so I lost her. Naomi brushed at the tear, caught it on her fingertip. She studied it as if it were some exotic specimen just discovered. She hadn't cried since she buried her father, hadn't seen the point. I'll never be loved that way again. She flicked the tear away and forgot it. I don't think I understood that until today. You're rushing your fences, Naomi. That's not like you. You had all of fifteen minutes with her today. Did you see her face when I told her I killed Alec? There was a smile on her lips as she turned back to Gabe, but it was hard, brittle as glass. I've seen it in dozens of others. Civilized horror. Decent people don't kill. People, decent or otherwise, do what they need to do to survive. He had reason to know. She won't think so. She might have my looks, Gabe, but she'd have her father's mores. Christ, they don't come any more decent than Dr. Philip Biden. Or more foolish since he let you go. She laughed again, easier this time, and kissed him firmly on the mouth. Where were you twenty-five years ago? She shook her head, nearly sighed. Playing with your Crayolas. I don't recall ever playing with them. Betting with them, maybe. Speaking of bets, I've got a hundred that says my coat will outrun yours at the Derby in May. Her brow rose. And the odds? Even. You're on. Why don't you come down and take a look at my prize yearling before you leave? In a couple of years, she'll leave anything you put against her in the dust. What did you name her? Her eyes glinted as she opened the terrace doors. Naomi's honor. She'd been so cool, Kelsey thought as she unlocked her apartment door. So cold. Naomi had admitted to murder as casually as another woman might admit to dyeing her hair. What kind of a woman was she? How could she have served tea and made conversation? So polite, so controlled, so horribly detached. Leaning against the door, Kelsey rubbed at the headache storming behind her temples. It was all like some insane dream. The big, beautiful house, the placid setting, the woman with her face, the dynamic man, Naomi's newest lover. Did they sleep in the same room where a man had died? He looked capable of it, she thought. He looked capable of anything. With a shudder, Kelsey pushed away from the door and began to pace. Why had Naomi written the letter, she wondered. There'd been no emotional storm, no fatted calf, no desperate apologies for the lost years. 
only a polite invitation to tea and the calm, unhesitating admission of guilt. So, Naomi Chadwick wasn't a hypocrite, Kelsey thought wryly, just a criminal. When the phone rang, she glanced over and saw that her message machine was blinking. Kelsey turned away and ignored both. She had two hours before her shift at the museum, and no need, no desire to speak with anyone before then. All she had to do now was convince herself that her mother's reappearance didn't have to change her life. She could go on just as she had before, her job, her classes, her friends. She dropped down on the sofa. Who was she trying to fool? Her job was no more than a hobby, her classes a habit, and her friends... Most of them had been shared with Wade, and therefore, in the odd byproduct of divorce, they had divvied up sides or simply faded into the background so as not to be touched by the trauma. Her life was a mess. She ignored the knock at the door. Kelsey? Another quick, impatient rap. Open the door, or I'll have the apartment manager open it for me. Resigned, Kelsey rose and obeyed. Grandmother, after lifting her cheek for the expected kiss... Millicent Biden strode into the apartment. She was, as always, flawlessly dressed and quaffed. Her hair was tinted a glossy auburn and swept back from a polished face that could, at a glance, pass for sixty rather than eighty. She kept her figure trim with unsentimental diet and exercise. Her size six Chanel suit was a pale blue. She tugged off matching kid gloves and set them down on an occasional table, then laid her mink over a chair. You disappoint me, sulking in your room like a child. Her almond-colored eyes scraped over her granddaughter as she sat, crossing her legs. Your father's desperately worried about you. Both he and I have called you at least half a dozen times today. I've been out, and Dad has no reason to be worried. No. Millicent tapped a lacquered fingernail against the arm of the chair. You burst in on him last night with the news that that woman has contacted you, then you dash off and refuse to answer your phone. That woman is my mother, and you and he knew she was alive. It caused an emotional scene, Grandmother, which I'm aware you might consider to be in poor taste, but that I felt was very justified. Don't take that tone with me, Millicent leaned forward. Your father has done everything to protect you, to give you a decent upbringing and a stable home, and you attack him for it. Attack him? Kelsey threw up her hands, knowing such an outward display would count against her. I confronted him. I demanded answers. I demanded the truth. And now that you have it, are you satisfied? Millicent inclined her head. You would have been better off, all of us would have been better off, if she had stayed dead to you but she was always selfish, always more concerned with herself than anyone else. For reasons Kelsey could never have explained, she picked up the spear of battle. And did you always hate her? I always recognized her for what she was. Philip was blinded by her looks, by what he saw as vivacity and verve, and he paid for his mistake. And I look like her, Kelsey said softly which explains why you've always looked at me as though I might commit some horrible crime at any moment, or at least an unforgivable breach of etiquette. Millicent sighed and sat back. She wouldn't deny it, saw no reason why she should. I was concerned, naturally, about how much of her was in you. You're a Biden, Kelsey, and for the most part you've been a credit to the family. Every mistake I've watched you make has her stamp on it. I prefer to think I've made my own mistakes. Such as this divorce, Millicent said wearily. Wade comes from a good family. His maternal grandfather is a senator. His father owns one of the most prestigious and well-respected advertising agencies in the East. And Wade is an adulterer. On a little sound of impatience, Millicent waved a hand. The diamond wedding ring on her widow's hand glinted like ice. You would blame him rather than yourself or the woman who seduced him. Almost amused, Kelsey smiled. That's right, I would blame him. The divorce is final, Grandmother, as of yesterday. You're wasting your time there. And you have the dubious honor of being the second Biden in family history to divorce. In your father's case, it was unavoidable. You, however, have done what you've made a habit of doing all your life, reacting impulsively. 
but that's another issue. I want to know what you intend to do about the letter. Don't you think that's between me and my mother? This is a family matter, Kelsey. Your father and I are your family. She tapped her finger again, carefully selecting both words and tone. Philip is my only child. His happiness and well-being have always been primary in my life. You are his only child. With genuine affection, she reached up and took Kelsey's hand. I want only the best for you. There was no arguing with that. However much her grandmother's code of behavior grated, Kelsey knew she was loved. I know. I don't want to fight with you, grandmother. Nor I with you. Pleased, she patted Kelsey's hand. You've been a good daughter, Kelsey. No one who knows you and Philip would doubt your devotion. I know you'd do nothing to hurt him. I think it would be best if you gave me the letter. Let me handle this business for you. You've no need to contact her or put yourself through this turmoil. I've already contacted her. I went to see her this morning. You... Millicent's hand jerked, then settled. You saw her? You went to her without discussing it first? I'm twenty-six years old, Grandmother. Naomi Chadwick is my mother, and I don't have to discuss meeting her with anyone. I'm sorry if it upset you, but I did what I had to do. What you wanted to do, Millicent corrected, without thought for the consequences. As you like, but they're my consequences. I'd think you and Dad would have to agree it's a normal reaction on my part. It may be difficult for you, but I can't imagine why it would make you so angry. I'm not angry, though she was furious. I'm concerned. I don't want some foolish emotional reaction to influence you. You don't know her, Kelsey. You have no idea how clever or how vindictive she is. I know she wanted custody of me. She wanted to hurt your father because he'd begun to see through her. You were the tool. She drank, and she had men, and she flaunted her flaws because she was so sure she could always win, and she ended by killing a man. Millicent drew a deep breath. Even the thought of Naomi burned at her heart. I suppose she tried to convince you it was self-defense, that she was protecting her honor, her honor. Unable to sit any longer, Millicent rose. Oh, she was clever, and she was beautiful. If the evidence against her hadn't been so damning, she might have convinced a jury to absolve her. But when a woman entertains a man in her bedroom in the middle of the night, in nothing more than a silk robe, it's difficult to cry rape. Rape, Kelsey repeated. But the word was only a shocked whisper, and Millicent didn't hear. Some believed her, of course. Some will always believe that kind of woman. Eyes hard, she snatched her gloves from the table and began to tap them against her palm. But in the end, they convicted her. She was out of Philip's life and yours. Until now. Will you be so stubborn, so selfish as to let her back in, to cause your father this kind of grief? It isn't a choice between him or her grandmother. That's exactly what it is. For you, not for me... Do you know, before you came here, I wasn't sure I would see her again. Now I know I will, because she didn't defend herself to me. She didn't ask me to choose. I'm going to see her again and decide for myself. No matter whom it hurts. As far as I can see, I'm the only one who's risking anything. You're wrong, Kelsey, and it's a dangerous mistake. She corrupts. Stiffly, Millicent smoothed on her gloves, finger by finger. If you insist on pursuing this relationship, she'll do whatever she can to destroy the bond between you and your father. No one could do that. Millicent lifted her gaze, and it was sharp as steel. You don't know Naomi Chadwick. Chapter 3 No, Kelsey didn't know Naomi Chadwick, but she would. Kelsey's years of higher education hadn't been wasted. If there was one thing she knew how to do well, it was how to research a subject, any subject. Naomi was no exception. For the next two weeks, she spent most of her free time poring over microfilm in the public library. Her first stop was the Society page, where she read the announcement of the engagement of Naomi Ann Chadwick, 21, daughter of Matthew and Louise Chadwick of Three Willows Farm, Bluemont, Virginia, to Professor Philip James Biden, 34, son of Andrew and Millicent Biden, Georgetown. 
a June wedding was planned. Kelsey found the wedding announcement. It was a shock to see her father looking so young, so carelessly happy, his fingers entwined at his heart with Naomi's. He'd worn a rosebud boutonniere. Kelsey wondered if it had been white, or perhaps a sunny yellow. Beside him, Naomi glowed. The grainy newsprint couldn't diminish the luster. Her face was impossibly young, heartbreakingly beautiful, her lips curved, her eyes bright as if on the verge of a laugh. They looked as though they could face anything together. It shouldn't hurt. Kelsey told herself it was foolish to be hurt by a divorce that had happened without her knowledge. But these two young, vital people had created her. Now they were no more to each other than painful memories. She made hard copies of what she wanted, made notes on the rest, as she would for any report. With feelings of amusement and bafflement, she found her own birth announcement. There was little after that, an occasional squib about attendance at a ball or charity function. It seemed her parents had lived a quiet life out of the Washington glitter for the short term of their marriage. Then there was the custody suit, a terse little article that had merited space in the Washington Post, she imagined, due to her paternal grandfather's position as Undersecretary of the Treasury. She read the names, her own, Naomi's, her father's, with a sense of detachment. The Post hadn't wasted much of its dignity on a domestic squabble. She found a few articles on three willows and racing. One mentioned the tragedy of a promising colt who had broken down at a race and was shot. It merited a single picture of Naomi's beautiful, tear-streaked face. Then there was murder. Such matters rated more space, a few prominent headlines. Lover's quarrel ends in tragedy. Pastoral Virginia, scene of violent death. Her mother was described as the estranged wife of a Georgetown English professor and the daughter of a prominent thoroughbred breeder. The victim was somewhat flippantly referred to as a playboy with ties to the racing world. The story was straightforward enough. Alec Bradley had been shot and killed in a bedroom at Three Willows Farm. The weapon belonged to Naomi Chadwick Biden, who had notified the police. She and Bradley had been alone in the house at the time of the shooting. Police were investigating. The Virginia papers were a bit more informative. Naomi never denied firing the fatal shot. She claimed, through her attorney, that Bradley had attacked her and she had resorted to the weapon in self-defense. The facts were reported that Naomi and Bradley had a friendly relationship and had been seeing each other socially for weeks. And, of course, that Naomi was in the midst of a messy custody suit over her three-year-old daughter. A week after the murder, there were more headlines. Virginia woman arrested for murder. New evidence derails claim of self-defense. And damning evidence it was. Kelsey's blood chilled as she read of the photograph taken by a detective hired by her father's lawyers to obtain ammunition for the custody battle. Rather than an illicit affair, the detective had recorded murder. He testified at the trial as well. Stubbornly moving from page to page, she read on, about witnesses who agreed under oath that Naomi and Bradley behaved in public as intimate friends, that Naomi was an expert marksman, that she enjoyed parties, champagne, the attention of men, that she and Bradley had quarreled the evening of his death over his flirtation with another woman. Then Charles Rooney had taken the stand and told his story. He'd taken dozens of photographs of Naomi, at the track, at the farm, at various social events. He was a licensed private investigator in the state of Virginia, and his surveillance reports were carefully documented. They formed a picture of a reckless, beautiful woman who craved excitement, who was eager to break the bonds of an inhibiting marriage to an older man, and one who, on the night of the murder, invited the victim into her home, where she was alone and dressed only in a negligee. Rooney was unable to swear to what was said between the two, but his photographs and his observations said a great deal. The couple had embraced, brandy was poured. Then they appeared to argue, and Naomi had stormed upstairs. Bradley had followed. Eager to fulfill his duties, Rooney had climbed a handy tree and aimed his telephoto lens at the bedroom window. The argument had continued there, becoming more heated. Naomi had slapped Bradley's face, but when he turned to go, she pulled a gun out of the nightstand drawer. The camera had captured the shock on his face and the fury on Naomi's as she fired. Kelsey stared at the photo for a long time and at the headline above it that shouted, Guilty. 
Carefully, she made more copies, then shut off the machine and gathered her files and notes. Before logic could interfere with emotion, she found a payphone and dialed. Three willows. Naomi Chadwick, please. May I ask who's calling? This is Kelsey Biden. There was a small, strangled sound, quickly muffled. Miss Naomi's down at the stables. I'll buzz her. Moments later, an extension was picked up. Kelsey heard Naomi's voice, cool as sherbet over the line. Hello, Kelsey. It's good to hear from you. I'd like to talk to you again. Of course, whenever you like. Now. It'll take me an hour to get there, and I'd prefer that we'd be alone this time. Fine. I'll be here. Naomi hung up and wiped her damp hands on her jeans. My daughter's coming, Moses. So I gathered. Moses Whitetree, Naomi's trainer, trusted employee, and longtime lover, continued to study his breeding reports. He was half Jew, half Choctaw, and had never taken the mix for granted. He wore his hair in a long, graying braid down his back. There was a glint of a silver star of David around his neck. Whatever there was to know about horses, he knew, and he preferred them, with few exceptions, to people. She'll have questions. Yes. How do I answer them? He didn't glance up, didn't need to. He knew every nuance of Naomi's face. You could try the truth. A lot of good the truth had done me. She's your blood. It was always so simple for Moses, Naomi thought impatiently. She's a grown woman. I hope she's her own woman. She won't accept me simply because we share blood, Moses. I'd be disappointed if she did. He set his paperwork aside and rose. He wasn't a big man, only a few pounds and a few inches over his one-time dream of being a jockey. In his worn-down boots, he was eye-level with Naomi. You want her to love you, to accept you, but you want her to do it on your terms. You've always wanted too much, Naomi. With tenderness, she touched a hand to his wind-bitten cheek. It was impossible to stay irritated with him. He was the man who had waited for her, who never questioned her, who had always loved her. So you've always told me. I didn't know I would need her so much until I saw her again, Moses. I didn't know it would matter as much as it does. And you wish it didn't. Oh, I wish it didn't. That he understood. He'd spent most of his life wishing he didn't love Naomi. My people have a saying. Which people? He smiled. They both knew he made up half his sayings and twisted the other half to suit his purposes. Only the foolish waste their wishes. Let her see what you are. It'll be enough. Moses? A groom looked into the office, then tipped his hat toward Naomi. Miss? I don't like the way Serenity's favoring her near foreleg. Got some swelling, too. She ran well this morning. Moses' brow puckered. He'd been up before dawn to watch the early workouts. Let's take a look. Moses kept his office in a small area at the front of the stables. It was cramped and often smelled of horse urine, but he preferred it to the airy space his predecessor had used in a whitewashed building near the west paddock. Moses often said the earthy smell of horses was French perfume to him, and he didn't want any fancy digs away from the action. In truth, the stables were nearly as sparkling as any luxury hotel, and usually busier. The concrete slope between the lines of stalls was scrubbed and spotless. The individual stalls were marked with an enameled plaque with the name of each horse scrolled in gold. It was an affectation of Naomi's father's that she'd continued when she'd taken over running the farm. There were scents of horses, of liniment, of hay and grain and leather, a potpourri Naomi had missed sorely during her years in prison, and one she never failed to appreciate. It was, to her, the scent of freedom. As Moses passed, horses stuck their heads out of stalls. He, too, had a scent, one they recognized. His boots might have clattered quickly along the slope, but there was always time for a quick stroke, a murmured word. Stable hands continued their work. Perhaps pitchforks or curry combs moved with more enthusiasm now that the man was in view. I was going to take her out to pasture when I saw how she favored the leg. The groom paused beside Serenity's box stall, noticed the swelling and thought you'd want to take a look for yourself. Moses merely grunted, passing his hands over the glossy chestnut coat. He studied the filly's eyes, smelled her breath, 
murmuring to her as he worked his way down from cheek to chest to leg. There was swelling just above the fetlock and some heat. As he applied some slight pressure, the filly jerked back and blew a warning. Looks like she knocked into something. Reno was riding her this morning. Naomi remembered that the jockey had made a special trip to the farm for the workout. See if he's still here. Yes, m The groom scurried off. She had a beautiful run this morning. Eyes narrowed, Naomi crouched beside Moses and examined the lame leg herself, gently lifting it forward and back to check for shoulder strain. Looks like an overreach, she muttered. There was discoloration, a sign of blood clotting under the skin. The bone was probably bruised, she thought. If they were lucky, there'd be no fracture. She was due in Saratoga next week. She might still make it, but he didn't think so, not on that leg. We can get the swelling down. Better call the vet, though. An x ray wouldn't hurt. I'll take care of it, and I'll talk to Reno. She straightened, hooking an arm around the mayor's neck. They were an investment, a business, but that didn't negate her love for them. She's got the heart of a champion, Moses. I don't want to hear that she can't race again. Less than an hour later, Naomi watched grimly as the filly's injury was treated. Already a stream of cold water had been applied directly to the wound. Now Moses himself was massaging the bruise with a mixture of vinegar and cool water. Her vet stood in the stall and prepared a syringe. How long before she can start training again, Matt? A month. Six weeks would be better. He glanced toward Naomi. Matt Gunner had a long, pleasant face, kind eyes. The bones bruise, Naomi, and there's some tissue damage, but there's no fracture. You keep her stabled, keep up the massage, some light exercise, and she'll do. We were going at a fast pace, Reno put in. The jockey stood just outside the box, watching the procedure. He'd changed from his morning workout into one of the smart tailored suits he preferred. But he was a race tracker. There was nothing of more concern to him or the others than a thoroughbred's delicate legs. I didn't notice any chains of gait. Neither did I, Naomi added. Reno says she didn't stumble. I was watching the run this morning, and I would have noticed if she had. This filly has a quiet temperament. She's not one to kick in her stall. Well, she took a hard knock, Matt said. If your groom hadn't been alert, it would have been a great deal worse. This'll ease the pain. There you go, girl. Easy now. He slid the needle under Serenity's flesh, just above the wound. She rolled her eyes, snorted, but didn't struggle. She's strong and she's healthy, Matt said. She'll run again. Moses, there's nothing I can tell you about treating that leg that you don't already know. You give me a call if it heats up. Otherwise. He trailed off, staring over Naomi's shoulder. Excuse me. Kelsey stood back, clutching her purse and her file. I'm sorry to interrupt. I was told up at the house I'd find you here. Oh. Distracted, Naomi dragged a hand through her hair. I lost track of time. We've had a small crisis here. Matt, this is my daughter, Kelsey, Kelsey Biden. A Matt Gunner, my vet. Matt reached out, the syringe still in his hand. He drew it back, flushed. Sorry, hello. Nerves aside, she had to smile. Nice to meet you. And Moses Whitetree, Naomi continued, my trainer. Moses continued to massage the mayor's leg and merely nodded. Reno Sanchez, one of the best jockeys on the circuit. The best, he said with a wink. Nice to meet you. And you, Kelsey said automatically. You're busy here. I can wait. No, there's nothing more I can do. Thanks for coming so quickly, Matt. Sorry I interrupted your day, Reno. Hey, no problem. I've got plenty of time before the first post. He looked at Kelsey again with undisguised admiration. You'll have to come to the track, see me ride. I'm sure I'd enjoy it. Moses, I'll be back to check on her myself again later. Why don't we go up to the house? Naomi gestured, careful, very careful not to make contact, then led the way out of the rear of the building. You have a sick horse? Injured, I'm afraid. We'll have to scratch her from her races for the next several weeks. That's a shame. Kelsey glanced toward the paddock where a yearling was being put through his paces on a lunge line. Another, with a rider up, was being led by a handler toward the walking ring. A groom was giving a glossy chestnut a bath, spraying streams of water over the gilding with a hose. Other horses were simply being walked in wide, repetitive circles. Busy place, Kelsey murmured, aware that eyes had turned her way. 
Oh, most of the work gets done in the morning, but it'll be busy again when the track closes this afternoon. You're racing today? There's always a race, Naomi said absently. But right now we've still got mares dropping foals, so what doesn't get done in the morning happens in the middle of the night. She smiled a little. They always seem to have them in the middle of the night. I guess I didn't realize you had such a large operation. In the last ten years, we've become one of the top thoroughbred farms in the country. We've had a horse do no less than show in the last three derbies. Won the St. Ledger in Belmont. Took the Breeders' Cup two years running. One of our mares took a gold in the last Olympics. Naomi cut herself off with a laugh. <laughs> Don't get me started. I'm worse than a grandmother with a wallet full of snapshots. It's all right. I'm interested. More, Kelsey mused, than she realized. Actually, I took riding lessons when I was a girl. I guess most of us go through a horse-crazy stage. Dad hated it, but... She trailed off, suddenly understanding why he'd been so unhappy when she developed the traditional girlhood obsession with horses. Of course he did, Naomi said with a thin smile. It's perfectly understandable. But you had your lessons anyway. Yes, I hounded him for them. She stopped and looked straight into her mother's eyes. She could see the small, subtle signs of aging that she'd been too nervous to notice at their first meeting. Fine lines fanning out from the eyes. Others, either from temper or worry, gently scoring the high, creamy forehead. It must have hurt him to see me, simply to see me day after day. I don't think so. However Philip came to feel about me, he adored you. She looked away then because it was easier to stare at the hills. A horse whinnied high and bright, a sound sweeter to Naomi than any aria. I haven't asked you about him. How is he? He's well. He's the chairman of the English department at Georgetown now. Has been for seven years. He's a brilliant man, and a good one. But not good enough for you. Naomi lifted a brow. Darling Kelsey, I was never good enough for him. Ask anyone. Naomi tossed her hair back and continued to walk. I'm told he married again. Yes, when I was eighteen. They're very happy together. I have a stepbrother, Channing. And you're fond of them, your family? Very. Naomi crossed the same patio, used the same terrace doors as she had the first time. What can I get you? Coffee, tea, some wine, perhaps? It isn't necessary. I hope you'll indulge Gertie. She made cookies when she heard you were coming. I know you don't remember, but you meant a great deal to her. Trapped, Kelsey thought, by manners and compassion. Tea and cookies, then. Thanks. I'll tell her. Please sit down. She didn't sit. It seemed only fair that she take a closer look at her mother's things. At first glance, the room was quietly elegant, a world apart from the bustle and manure-coated boots of the stable area. The low fire burned sedately. Rose-colored drapes were pulled back to welcome the sun. That sun shone on a dozen or so lovely crystal horses in clear and jewel hues. The oriental rug on the polished chestnut floor picked up the colors of the drapes and the creamy tones of the sofa. Nothing ostentatious, nothing jarring, until you looked again. The walls were covered in watered silk, the same cool ivory as the upholstery. But the paintings, large and abstract, were explosions of bold and restless color. Violent works, Kelsey thought, sated with passion and anger, and signed, she saw with a jolt, with a blood-red N.C. Naomi's work, she wondered. No one had mentioned that her mother painted. No amateurish works these, Kelsey decided, but skilled and capable and disturbing. They should have unbalanced the steady dignity of the room, she thought as she turned away, yet they humanized it. There were other telling touches throughout the room, a statue of a woman, her alabaster face carved in unfathomable grief, a glass heart in pale green with a jagged crack down the center, a small bowl filled with colored stones. Those were yours! Guiltily, Kelsey dropped a pebble back into the bowl and turned. Gertie had wheeled in the tea tray and stood beaming at her. I'm sorry. You always liked pretty rocks. I kept them for you when you... Her smile wobbled. When you went away. Oh... How was she supposed to answer that? You've worked here a long time, then. I've been at Three Willows since I was a girl. My mother kept house for Mr. Chadwick. Then I took over when she retired, moved to Florida. 
chocolate chip was always your favorite. The woman looked as though she could devour Kelsey whole. The desperate yearning in her eyes was difficult to face, the desperate joy beneath that worse. They still are, Kelsey managed. You come sit and help yourself. Miss Naomi got a phone call, but she'll be right along. All but humming with happiness, Gertie poured tea, arranged cookies on a plate. I always knew you'd come back. Always knew it. Miss Naomi didn't think so. She fretted about it all the time. But I says to her, she's your girl, isn't she? She'll come back to see her mama all right. And here you are. Yes, Kelsey made herself sit and accept the tea. Here I am. And all grown up. Unable to help herself, Gertie stroked a hand over Kelsey's hair. A grown-up woman now. Her lined face crumpled, and she let her hand fall. Turning quickly, she hurried from the room. I'm sorry, Naomi said when she came in moments later. This is an emotional time for Gertie. It must make you uncomfortable. It's all right. Kelsey sipped her tea. Oolong this time, she noted with a tiny smile. Understanding, Naomi laughed. Just my subtle sense of humor. She poured herself a cup, then sat. I wasn't sure you'd come back. Neither was I. I'm not sure I would have, at least so soon, if Grandmother hadn't all but forbade me to. Ah, Millicent. Trying to relax, Naomi stretched out her long legs. She always detested me. Well, she said and shrugged. It was mutual. Tell me, have you been able to satisfy her high standards? Not quite. Kelsey's smile came and went. It felt disloyal to discuss her grandmother. Family honor, Naomi said, nodding. You're absolutely right. I shouldn't goad you into criticizing Millicent. Besides, I'm not the one who should be asking the questions. How can this be so easy for you? Kelsey set down her cup with a snap of china against china. How can you sit there so calmly? I learned a great deal about taking what comes when I was in prison. You have the reins here, Kelsey. I've had a lot of time to think this through, and I had to promise myself before I contacted you that I would accept whatever happened. Why did you wait so long? You've been out of prison for twelve years, eight months, ten days. Ex-cons are more obsessive than ex-smokers, and I'm both. She smiled again. But that doesn't answer your question. I considered contacting you the day I got out. I even went to your school. Every day for a week, I sat in my car across the street and watched you in the little playground. Watched you and the other girls watching the boys and pretending not to. Once I even got out of my car and started across the street. And I wondered if you'd smell prison on me. I could still smell it on myself. Naomi moved her shoulders, chose a cookie. So I got back in my car and drove away. You were happy, you were secure. You didn't know I existed. Then my father became ill. The years passed, Kelsey. Every time I thought about picking up the phone or writing a letter or just walking back into your life, it seemed wrong. Why now? Because it seemed right. You're not so happy, not so secure, and I thought it was time you knew I existed. Your marriage is over. You're at a crossroads. Perhaps you don't think I can understand how you feel, but I do. You know about Wade? Yes, and your job, your academic career. You're fortunate you inherited your father's brain. I was always a lousy student. If you don't want the cookies, stick a few in your purse, will you? Gertie will never know the difference. With a sigh, Kelsey picked one up and took a bite. I don't know how to feel about all of this. I don't know how to feel about you. Reality is rarely like those big emotional reunions on Oprah, Naomi commented. Long-lost mother reunited with daughter, all is forgiven. I'm not asking for all to be forgiven, Kelsey. I'm hoping you'll give me a chance. Kelsey reached for the file she'd set beside her on the sofa. I've done some research. The hell, Naomi decided and reached for another cookie. I thought you might. Newspaper articles on the trial? Among other things. I can arrange for you to have a transcript. Kelsey's fingers faltered on the file. A transcript? I'd want one if I were in your place. It's public record, Kelsey. 
If I had something to hide, I couldn't. When I came here before, I asked you if you were guilty, and you said yes. You asked if I'd killed Alec, and I said yes. Why didn't you tell me you'd claim self-defense? What difference does it make? I was convicted. I paid my debt to society, and I am, according to the system, rehabilitated. Was it a lie, then? Was it a legal maneuver when you said you'd shot him to protect yourself from rape? The jury thought so. I'm asking you, Kelsey shot back, firing up, a simple yes or no. Taking a life isn't simple, whatever the circumstances. And what were they? You let him into your house, into your bedroom? I let him into my house, Naomi said evenly. He came into my bedroom. He was your lover. No, he was not. Hands icily calm, Naomi poured more tea. He might have been, eventually, but I hadn't slept with him. Her gaze met her daughter's. The jury didn't believe that, either. I was attracted to him. I thought he was a charming fool, harmless and amusing. You fought with him over another woman. I'm territorial, Naomi said blithely. He was supposed to be madly in love with me, which meant I was allowed to flirt and he wasn't. And because he was beginning to bore and annoy me, I decided to break off the relationship. Alec didn't want it to be broken. So we had a scene in public. Then another one later in private. He was furious, called me a few names, tried to make his case with some rough handling. I didn't care for it and ordered him to leave. Though she fought to keep it calm, her voice shook as the night flooded back. Instead, he followed me upstairs and called me several more names and got quite a bit rougher. Apparently, he decided he would show me what I'd been missing by forcing me into bed. I was angry and I was afraid. We struggled, and I realized he would do exactly what he'd threatened to do. I broke away, got my gun, and I shot him. Without a word, Kelsey flipped open the file and took out the copy of the newspaper photo. When Naomi took it, only a quick spasm at the side of her mouth betrayed any emotion. Not terribly flattering to either of us, is it? But then we didn't know we had an audience. He isn't touching you. He has his hands up. Yes, I guess you had to be there. She handed the photo back. I'm not asking you to believe me, Kelsey. Why should you? Whatever the circumstances, I'm not blameless. But I've paid. Society has given me another chance. That's all I'm asking you to do. Why did you let me think you were dead? Why did you allow that? Because I felt I was. Part of me was. And whatever my crimes, I loved you. I didn't want you to grow up knowing I was in a cage. I couldn't have survived those ten years thinking of that. And I needed to survive. There were other questions, dozens of them swirling around in Kelsey's head like bees. But she didn't think she could bear to hear the answers. I don't know you, she said at last. I don't know if I'll ever feel anything for you. Your father would have instilled a sense of duty in you. Certainly Millicent would have. I'm going to use it and ask you to come here, to stay here for a few weeks, a month. Kelsey was completely taken aback for a few moments. You want me to live here? She finally managed to say. An extended visit, a few weeks of your life, Kelsey, for the lifetime I lost. She didn't want to beg. God, she didn't want to beg. But she would if there was no other choice. It's selfish of me and not terribly fair, but I want the chance. It's too much to ask. Yes, it is, but I'm asking anyway. I'm your mother. You can't avoid that. You can choose to avoid me if that's what you want, but I'll still be your mother. We'll have time to see if there's anything between us. If not, you'll walk away. I'm betting you won't walk away. Naomi leaned forward. What are you made of, Kelsey? Is there enough Chadwick in there for you to accept a dare? Kelsey angled her chin. It was a risk. Perhaps she'd needed it to be put that way rather than as a request. I won't promise a month, but I'll come. She was surprised to see Naomi's lips tremble once before they curved into that cool, steady smile. Good. If I can't enchant you, three willows should. We'll have to see how much you picked up in those writing lessons. I don't get thrown easily. 
Neither do I. Chapter 4 Dinner with the family was a civilized affair. Excellent food was served with dignity, like any last meal, Gelsey thought, as she spooned up her leek soup. She didn't want to think of the evening in her father's house as an obligation, or worse, as a trial, but she knew it was both. Philip made casual conversation, but his smile was strained. Since Kelsey had told him of her upcoming visit to Three Willows, he'd been able to think of little else but the past. It seemed disloyal somehow to Candace that his mind should be so full of his first wife, his nights restless and disturbed by memories of her. No matter how often he told himself it was illogical, foolish, even indulgent, he couldn't quite chase away the fear that he was losing the child he'd fought so hard to keep. A woman now. He had only to look at her to be reminded of that. Yet he had only to close his eyes to remember the girl and the guilt. Millicent waited until the roast chicken was served. Normally she disliked discussing unpleasant matters over a meal, but as she saw it, she'd been given no choice. You leave tomorrow, I'm told. Yes. Kelsey took a sip from her water glass, watched the thin lemon slice dip and float. First thing in the morning. And your job. I've resigned. Kelsey lifted a brow in challenge and acknowledgement. It was little more than volunteer work. I may look for something at the Smithsonian when I get back. It may be difficult to get anything with your record of coming and going. It may. The Historical Society is always looking for an extra pair of hands, Candace put in. I'm sure I could put in a word for you. Thank you, Candace. Always the peacemaker, Kelsey thought. I'll think about it. Maybe you'll catch racing fever, Channing winked at Kelsey. Buy yourself some stud and make the circuit. That would hardly be acceptable or wise, Millicent dabbed a napkin at her lips. Such things may seem romantic and exciting at your age, Channing, but Kelsey's old enough to know better. Sounds like a great deal to me, hanging out at the stables, placing a few bets at the track. He shrugged, making quick work of his dinner. I wouldn't mind spending a few weeks playing in the country. You could visit me. It'd be fun. Is that all you can think of? Incensed, Millicent set her fork down with a clatter. Fun? Have you no idea what this is doing to your father? Mother. But Millicent overrode Philip's objections with an impatient wave of her hand. After all the pain and unhappiness we went through, to have that woman simply snap her fingers to make Kelsey come running, it's appalling. She didn't snap her fingers. Under the table, Kelsey balled her hands into fists. It would be much too easy to create a scene, she told herself. She asked, I agreed, I'm sorry if this hurts you, Dad. My concern's for you, Kelsey. I wonder, Candace spoke up, hoping to ward Millicent off and salvage some of the evening. Is it really necessary for you to stay there? It's only an hour or so away, after all. You could move more slowly. Go out on a weekend now and then. She glanced toward Philip to gauge his reaction, then smiled bolsteringly at Kelsey. It seems more sensible. If she was sensible, she would never have gone out there. Kelsey bit back a sigh at her grandmother's comment and sat back. It's not as if I've signed a contract. I can leave at any time. I want to go. This she addressed to her father. I want to find out who she is. Sounds natural to me, Channing said over a bite of chicken. If I'd found out I had a long-lost mother who'd done time, that's what I'd do. Did you ask her what it was like inside? I'm a sucker for those women in prison movies. Channing, Candace's voice was a horrified whisper. Must you be so crude? Just curious. He speared a perfectly boiled new potato. Bet the food sucked. Delighted with him, Kelsey let out a laugh. I'll be sure to ask her. God, are Channing and I the only ones around here who don't see this as some drawing-room melodrama? You should be relieved I'm not running traumatized to some therapist or washing my shock away with cheap wine. I'm the one who has to make the adjustments here, and I'm doing the best I can. You're thinking only of yourself, Millicent said between stiffened lips. Yes, I am. I'm thinking of myself. Enough was enough, Kelsey decided, and she pushed back from the table. It might interest you to know that she had nothing but good things to say about you, she told her father. There's no insidious plot to turn me against you, and nothing could. She walked to him, bending down to kiss his cheek. 
Thanks for dinner, Candace. I really have to get home and finish packing. Channing, if you have a free weekend, give me a call. Good night, Grandmother. She hurried out. The moment she shut the door behind her, she took a deep gulp of air. It tasted like freedom, she thought. She intended to enjoy it. In the morning, Gertie met Kelsey at the door. You're here! The woman snatched Kelsey's suitcases before Kelsey could object. Miss Naomi's down to the stables. We didn't know what time you'd come, so she told me to call her when you got here. No, don't bother her. I'm sure she's busy. Let me take those. They're heavy. I'm strong as an ox. Gertie backed up, still beaming. I'll show you up to your room. You just bring yourself, that's all. She might have been small and thin, but Gertie strode effortlessly up the stairs, chattering. We got everything ready. It's good to be busy again. Miss Naomi, she doesn't take any care at all. Hardly needs me around. I'm sure that's not true. Oh, for company she does, but she eats like a bird and she does for herself mostly before I can do for her. Gertie led the way down a wide hall carpeted in faded cabbage roses. Sometimes she has people over, but not like there once was. Used to be there was always people and parties. She stepped across a threshold and set both cases on an elegant four-poster bed. The room streamed with light from a double window seat that faced the hills, the long, slim windows overlooking the gardens. Deep colors and floral accents gave the room an elegant European feel. It's lovely. Kelsey stepped to a cherry vanity table where tulips speared up out of fluted crystal. Like sleeping in a garden. It was your room before. Of course it was done up different then, all pink and white like a candy cane. Gertie nodded her lip when she saw the surprise in Kelsey's eyes. Miss Naomi said if you didn't like it, you could take the room across the hall. This is fine. She waited for a moment, wondering if she'd be bombarded with some sensory memory, but all she felt was curiosity. Your bathroom's through here. Anxious to please, Gertie opened a door. You just ask if you need any more towels, or anything, anything at all. I'll go call Miss Naomi. No, don't. On impulse, Kelsey turned away from the suitcases. I'll go on down. I can unpack later. I'll do that for you. Don't you worry about that. You go on down and have a nice visit. Then you can have lunch. You want to button that jacket? The air's chilly. Kelsey fought back a smile. All right. I'll be back for lunch. Make your mama come. She needs to eat. I'll tell her. Kelsey left Gertie, happily opening the suitcases. It was tempting to do a quick turn around the house to poke into rooms and explore hallways, but it could wait. The day might have held the chill of the dying winter, but it was gloriously sunny. And, Kelsey hoped as she went out, promising. She wasn't going to start the visit by chasing its shadows. It would have to be done, of course. Still, it seemed harmless to enjoy one uncomplicated day in the country, with the smells of hardy spring blooms and new grass in the air, the panorama of hills and horses and sky. She could look at it, at least for now, as a short vacation. Until she'd literally packed her bag, she hadn't realized just how much she'd needed to get away from the confinement of her apartment, the fill-in job, the tedious routine of learning to be single again. And here, she thought as she caught the first poignant smell of horse, was something else to be learned, after all. She knew nothing about the racing world, nothing of the people and little of the animals that composed it. So, she would study and find out. It seemed to follow that the more she discovered, the better she would understand her mother. As before, there was activity at the stables, horses being walked or washed, men and women carrying tack, hauling wheelbarrows. Kelsey tolerated the sidelong glances and outright stares and walked inside. A groom was bandaging a mare's legs in the first box. Kelsey hesitated when he cut his eyes up to hers. His eyes were shadowed under the bill of his cap, and his face was incredibly old, cracked like neglected leather left in the sun. "'Excuse me, I'm looking for Miss Chadwick.' "'Grew up, did you?' The man shifted a tobacco plug into the pocket of his cheek. "'Heard you was coming.' "'There now, sweet thing, hold your water.' It took Kelsey a moment to realize the last comment was addressed to the mare and not to her. "'Is something wrong with her?' Kelsey asked. "'The horse?' "'Just a little sprain. Old she is, but still likes to run. "'You remember the days, don't you, girl? "'Won her first race and her last, and a goodly number between. Twenty-five she is. "'Was a spry young filly when you last saw her.' His grin, mostly toothless, flashed. 
Don't remember me, I expect. Her nor me. I'm Boggs. Put you up on your first pony. Forget how to ride, have you? No, I can ride. Kelsey reached out a hand to stroke the old mare's cheek. What's her name? Queen Vanity Fair. I just call her Queenie. The mare wickered, her soft brown eyes looking deeply into Kelsey's. She's too old to race now, Kelsey murmured. Or to breed. Queenie's in retirement, but she gets to thinking she's still a girl and kicks up her heels. If I was to bring a saddle in here, her ears would perk right up. She can still be ridden, then? With the right rider. Your ma's in the breeding shed out the back to your left. Big doings today. Oh, thank you, um, Boggs. Welcome home. He turned back, running his gnarled, calloused hands as gently as silk over the mare's legs. Best to wear boots around here next time. Yes. Nonplussed, Kelsey looked down at her soft Italian flats. You're right. She walked through the stables, pausing with a quick look over her shoulder before stopping at Serenity's box. She was rewarded by a welcoming snort and nuzzle. Outside, she didn't require Boggs's directions. There was enough activity around the outbuilding to the left to have drawn her in any case. She recognized Gabe and was torn for a moment as to who looked more magnificent, he or the rearing chestnut stallion he was fighting to control. He stood at the horse's head, boots planted, muscles straining, the reins shortened while the stallion quivered and called. His own hair flying in the breeze, Gabe tossed back his head and laughed. Anxious, are you? Don't blame you a bit. Nothing like having a beautiful female ready for sex to get the blood moving. Hello, Kelsey. He continued to control the stallion without looking around. He'd known she was there. He almost believed he'd smelled her as the stallion scented the mare. You're just in time for the main event. Aren't skittish, are you? No, I'm not. Good. Naomi's inside with the mare. Longshot and three willows are about to breed a champion. Kelsey skimmed her gaze over the horse. Handlers were positioned around him, helping Gabe to keep the stud from charging the shed. Magnificent he was, his coat already gleaming like flame from sweat, his eyes fierce, his muscles bunched. You're going to turn him loose on some poor, unsuspecting mare? Gabe grinned. Believe me, she'll be grateful. She'll be terrified, Kelsey disagreed, and strode into the shed. She saw her mother and Moses calming the mare, who looked to be every bit as eager to get on with things as the stallion. She, too, was a chestnut, as regal as her intended mate. Even though she was hobbled, protected at the neck by a thick jacket of leather and canvas, she looked proud and valiant. Kelsey! Covered with grime and sweat, Naomi wiped a hand over her brow. Gertie was supposed to let me know when you got here. I told her not to bother. I'm in the way. No, Naomi looked doubtfully at Moses. But things are about to get a little frantic and graphic. I know a little about sex, Kelsey said dryly. Stay here, Moses added, and you'll learn more. She's ready, he said to one of the handlers. Keep back out of the way, Naomi warned her daughter. This isn't as simple as an hour in the local motel. She could smell the sex. Even as Gabe and his handlers brought the stallion in, the air in the shed thickened with it. "'sharp, edgy, elemental. "'The mare called out in protest or welcome, "'and the stallion answered with a sound "'that caused something to tighten in Kelsey's stomach. "'Orders were given, movements were quick. "'In a powerful lunge, the stallion reared up "'and mounted the mare. "'Wide-eyed, Kelsey stared as Moses stepped in "'and assisted in the most technical aspect of the coupling. "'Then her breath caught as she saw "'why the mare wore the leather neck cover. "'Surely the stallion would have bitten through her flesh without it, he plunged wildly, his need frantic and somehow human. He covered her, commanding, demanding. She accepted, her eyes rolling in what Kelsey thought must surely be pleasure. Hardly realizing it, she moved closer, fascinated by the passionate frenzy of mating. Her own heart was pounding, her blood hot. The quick, sharp pang of arousal staggered her. She found herself looking at Gabe. Sweat was running down his face. His muscles strained against his shirt, and his eyes were on hers. It was shocking to see her own primitive and unexpected reaction mirrored there, staggering to have the vision flash through her mind of being taken as the mare was being taken, fiercely, violently, heedlessly. He smiled, a slow movement of lips that was both arrogant and charming. 
smiled, she thought, as if he knew exactly what she was thinking, as if he'd intended her to think it. Incredible, isn't it? Naomi stepped back beside her. It was the third mayor they'd bred that morning, and her body was aching with the effort. Hundreds of pounds lost in the most basic of needs. Does it... <clears throat> Kelsey cleared her throat. Does it hurt her? I doubt she notices if it does. Out of her back pocket, Naomi took a plain blue bandana to mop her damp throat. Some stallions breed very kind, like a shy or long-time lover. She grinned wryly at the panting horses. There's not a shy bone in that one's body. He's a beast. And what woman doesn't want a beast now and again? She glanced at Moses. The intellect, Kelsey thought as her pulse danced. It would be better, or at least more comfortable, to explore the logistics. How do you choose which stallion for what mare? Bloodlines, dispositions, tendencies, even color. We make up genetic charts. Then you cross your fingers. Christ, I know it's a cliché, but I could use a cigarette. Let's get some air. They're nearly done here. Naomi pulled a stick of gum out of her pocket as she stepped outside. Want some? No, thanks. It's a poor substitute for tobacco. She sighed a little as she folded the stick in her mouth. But most substitutes are poor in any case. Tilting her head, she studied her daughter more thoroughly. You look tired, Kelsey. Restless night? Somewhat. Naomi sighed again. Her daughter had once been so open with her, a chatterbox of news and questions. Those days, like so many others, were over. You can tell me if you'd rather I leave it alone, but I'd like to ask if Philip is against this visit. I think it's more accurate to say he's hurt by my decision to accept your invitation. I see. Naomi looked down at the ground and nodded once. I'd tell you I'd talk to him myself, try to reassure him, but I think it would only make matters worse. It would. All right, then. He'll be uneasy for a few weeks. Her eyes were hard when she looked up again. Damn it, she deserved this. One short month out of so many years. He'll survive. I can't be dead just because so many people would prefer it. She glanced over as Gabe led the sweaty stallion out of the shed. Her smile bloomed, softening her face again. So, do you think we have a merger? If not, it's not for lack of trying. He slapped the stallion's neck before giving the reins to a handler. The first of many, I hope. Well, Kelsey, you've had an interesting initiation into life on a horse farm. If you stick around till after the first of next year, you'll see the results of today's tryst. That's a very understated description of what went on in there. She didn't appear to have much choice in the matter. Neither did he. Grinning, Gabe took out a cigar. That kind of primitive attraction doesn't allow for choice. Moses will let me know if we need a repeat performance, he said to Naomi, but I got a hunch we won't. I'd ask for odds, but I prefer to go with your hunch on this one. Excuse me, just a minute. I want to check on the mare. Kelsey looked over to where the stallion was being cooled down. Shouldn't you be over there exchanging lies and letting him puff on that cigar? I gave up lying about my sex life in high school. Do I make you nervous, Kelsey, or is it just the atmosphere? Neither. He made her something all right, she thought, but that was her problem. So you own the neighboring farm, then, long shot? That's right. I admired your house from the road. It's quite a bit less traditional than the others in the area. So am I. The very dignified Cape Cod that stood on the hill when the farm passed into my hands didn't suit me, so I tore it down. He blew out a stream of smoke. You'll have to come over, have a tour. I'd like that, but I think I'll concentrate on touring Three Willows first. You won't find a better operation on the East Coast unless it's mine. A snort from behind him made him turn, then grin at Moses. Of course, I'd have the best in the country if I could lure White Tree away. Double what she pays you, Moses. Keep your money, boy. Buy yourself another fancy suit. Moses handed the mare to a stable boy for a rubdown. Owners like you flash in the pan. That's what you said five years ago. That's what I say now. Give me a cigar. You're a hard man, White Tree, Gabe obliged him. Yep. Moses stuck the cigar in his pocket for later. Your groom with the broken nose? There was gin on his breath. Gabe's easy smile faded. His eyes narrowed. I'll take care of it. 
Tell your trainer to take care of it, Moses shot back. It's his job. My horses, Gabe corrected. Excuse me. He turned on his heel and headed for the trailer where the stallion was being loaded. He'll never learn that one, Moses muttered. There's no chain of command as far as Gabe is concerned. Watching Gabe confront the groom, Naomi shook her head. You should have told his trainer, Moses. And Jameson shouldn't need me to tell him what goes on under his nose. Ah, Kelsey held up a hand. Would you mind telling me what's going on? Gabe's firing one of his grooms, Naomi told her. Just like that? You don't drink when you're working. Moses hissed a breath out of his teeth as the groom's enraged voice carried to them. Owners should stay out of shed row business. Why? Kelsey asked. Because they're owners. With a shake of his head, Moses strode off toward the stables. Never a dull moment, Naomi touched Kelsey's arm. Why don't we... Shit! What? Kelsey looked over in time to see the groom swing at Gabe, and to see Gabe evade once, twice, fluid as a shadow. Gabe didn't strike back, though the instinct was there, the back alley that always lurked under the civilized man he'd made himself. The groom was pitiful, he thought, and half his size, and the worst of it was that it had taken Moses to point out that he'd had a drunk handling his horse. "'Go back and get your gear, Lipsky,' Gabe repeated, icily calm, as the groom stood with cocked fists. "'You're through at long shot.' "'Who are you to tell me I'm through?' Lipsky ran a hand over his mouth. He wasn't drunk, not yet. He'd had only enough of the gin in his flask to make him feel tall and mean. "'I know more about horses than you ever will. You lucked your way into the big time, Slater. Lucked and cheated and everybody knows it, just like everybody knows your old man's a drunken loser.' The heat that flashed into Gabe's eyes had the handlers easing back. In tacit agreement, they silently formed a ring. It was, they believed, nearly showtime. "'Know my father, do you, Lipsky? I'm not surprised. "'You're welcome to look him up, have a few drinks. "'But in the meantime, pick up your gear and the pay that's coming to you. "'You're fired. "'Jameson hired me. I've been at Cunningham Farms for ten years, "'and I'll be there after you've gone back to your roulette wheels and blackjack tables.' "'Over Lipsky's head, Gabe saw two of the handlers exchange glances. "'So,' he thought, those were the cards he was dealt. "'He'd play them out later.' but now he had to finish this hand. There's no Cunningham farm and no place for you at long shot. Jameson might have hired you, Lipsky, but I write your checks. I don't write checks for drunks. If I see you near any of my horses, I can promise you it won't be Jameson who deals with you. He turned, his gaze cutting straight to Kelsey. She stood like the handlers watching the show. She had a moment to think she'd prefer that the calm disdain in Gabe's eyes wasn't directed at her, before she caught the glint of sun on steel. The warning strangled in her throat, but Gabe was already whipping back to face the knife. The first lunge sliced almost delicately down his arm rather than plunging into his back. The sight and smell of blood had the handlers shifting quickly from their mildly interested attitudes. Keep back, Gabe ordered, ignoring the pain in his arm. His mistake, he thought, was in not judging correctly how far the drink would push. You want to take me on, Lipsky? His body was coiled now, ready. When you couldn't walk away from a fight, you dove in and played the odds. Well, you'll need that knife, so come on. The blade trembled in Lipsky's hand. For a moment, he couldn't remember how it had gotten there. The hilt had seemed to leap into his hand. But it was there now, and so was first blood. Pride stirred by gin wouldn't allow him to back off. He crouched, fainted, and began to circle. We have to do something! The horror in Kelsey's throat tasted like rusted copper. Call the police! No, not the police. Pale as wax, Naomi clenched her hands at her sides. Not the police. Something! Good God! She watched the blade gleam and lunge, slipping by inches from Gabe's body. No one moved but the two in the center of the circle. Then the stallion began to kick in his trailer, excited anew by the scent of blood and violence. Before she could think, Kelsey grabbed a pitchfork leaning against the side of the shed. She didn't want to dwell on what the tines would do to flesh, so she hefted it and began running forward, only to stumble to a halt when the knife flashed again. It arched up, flying free, as Lipsky hit the ground. She hadn't seen the blow. Gabe hadn't appeared to move at all, but now he was standing over the groom, his eyes cold, his face as calm as carved stone. 
Let Jameson know where you end up. He'll send your gear and your money. In an effortless move, he hauled Lipsky up by the scruff of the neck. The stink of gin and blood curdled in his stomach, sour memories. Don't let me catch you around here again, or I might forget I'm a gentleman now and break you in half. He tossed the limp groom down again and turned to his men. Let him off at the road. He can ride his thumb out of here. Yes, sir, Mr. Slater. They scrambled as impressed as boys at a schoolyard brawl, dragging Lipsky up and carrying him to the truck. Sorry, Naomi. In a careless gesture, Gabe raked the hair out of his eyes. I should have waited a fireman till we were back at long shot. She was trembling and hated it. Then I would have missed the performance. Forcing a smile on her face, she moved closer. Blood was dripping down his arm. Come on up to the house. We'll clean that arm. That's my cue to say it's just a scratch. He glanced down at it, grateful it wasn't much more than that, no matter how nastily it throbbed. But I'd be a fool to turn down nursing by beautiful women. He looked at Kelsey then. She still held the pitchfork, her knuckles white as bone on the handle. Valiant color rode high on her cheeks, and shock glazed her eyes. I think you can put that down now. He took it from her, gently. But I appreciate the thought. Her knees began to shake, so she locked them stiff. You're just going to let him go? What else? People are usually arrested for attempted murder. She looked back at her mother, saw the wry smile curve Naomi's lips. Is this how things are handled around here? You'll have to ask Moses, Naomi replied. He does the firing at Three Willows. Taking the bandana out of her pocket, she staunched the blood on Gabe's arm. Sorry, I don't have a petticoat to tear up for you. So am I. Hold it there, press hard, she instructed him. Let's go up to the house and get it bandaged. They started off, Gabe keeping his pace slow until Kelsey caught up. He turned his face to hers and grinned. Welcome home, Kelsey. Chapter 5 Kelsey left the first aid to her mother and the bustling and clucking to Gertie. She would have voted for a trip to the emergency room, but no one seemed particularly interested in her opinion. Knife wounds, it seemed, were to be taken philosophically and mopped up in the kitchen. Once Gabe's arm was cleaned, medicated, and bandaged, bowls of chicken soup and hot biscuits were served. Talk was of horses, of bloodlines and races, of times and tracks. Since it wasn't a world Kelsey understood, she was free to observe and speculate. She had yet to determine Naomi's relationship with Gabriel Slater. It appeared intimate, easy. It was he who rose to refill coffee cups, not his hostess. They touched each other often, casually, a hand over a hand, fingertips against an arm. She told herself it didn't matter what they were to each other. After all, her mother and father had been divorced for more than twenty years. Naomi was free to pursue any relationship she chose. And yet it bothered her on some elemental level. Certainly they suited each other. Beyond the easy flow between them, over and above their interest in horses that consumed them both, there was a strain of violence in each, controlled, on ice, but as she knew with her mother, and as she'd seen for herself with Gabe, deadly. Kelsey might enjoy a trip to the track for some morning workouts, Gabe put in. He was enjoying his coffee, enjoying watching Kelsey. He could almost see the thoughts circling around in her head. The track? She was interested, despite having her private musing interrupted. I thought you worked the horses out here. We do both, Naomi told her. Using the track gives a horse a feel for it. And the handicappers a chance to gauge their bets, Gabe put in. The track draws an interesting and eclectic group, particularly in those dawn hours long before post time. Dawn's no exaggeration, Naomi smiled at her daughter. You might not like to start your day quite so early. Actually, I'd like to see how it's done. Tomorrow? The lift of Gabe's brow was a subtle challenge. Fine. We'll meet you there. Naomi glanced at her watch. I've got to get down to the stables. The farriers do. As she rose, she pressed a hand to Gabe's shoulder. Finish your coffee. Kelsey, you'll keep Gabe company, won't you? He'll tell you what to expect in the morning. She grabbed a denim jacket and hurried out. She doesn't stay in one place very long, Kelsey murmured. First part of the year is the busiest in the business. Gabe leaned back, the coffee cup in his hand. So, should I tell you what to expect? I'd rather be surprised. Then tell me something. Would you have used that pitchfork? 
She considered, let the question hang. I guess neither of us will know the answer to that. I'd lay odds you would have. Hell of a picture you made, darling. More than worth a prick on the arm to see it. You're going to have a scar, Slater. You're lucky it was your arm and not your pretty face. He was aiming for my back, Gabe reminded her. I didn't thank you for the warning. I didn't give you one. Sure you did. Your face was as good as a shout. He slipped a hand into his pocket and pulled out a worn deck of cards. Casually, he began a riffling shuffle. You play poker? Confused, she scowled at him. I don't as a rule, but I know the game. If you ever take it up, never bluff. You'd lose more than your shirt. Have you lost more than your shirt? More times than I care to remember. Out of habit, he began to deal two hands of stud, faces up. Would you bet on your queen? Kelsey moved her shoulders. I suppose. He flipped up the next cards. After a while, if you're smart, you don't risk what you can't afford to lose. I got plenty of shirts. Your queen's still high. So it is. For some absurd reason, she was enjoying the game. On the third card, her spade queen still reigned, and on the fourth. Still mine. Is it the betting or the horses that interest you? I've got more than one interest. Including Naomi? Including Naomi. He turned over the last card, smiled easily. Pair of fives, he mused. Looks like they usurp your queen. Her mouth moved into what was very close to a pout. It's a shame to lose to such pathetic cards. No cards are pathetic if they win. He took her hand, amused when the fingers went rigid. An old southern tradition, ma'am. He brought her hand to his lips, watching her. I owe you for Lipsky. Payment's your choice. It had been a long time since she'd felt this quickening in the blood. Since it couldn't be ignored, it would have to be fought. Don't you think it's in questionable taste for you to make a move on me in the kitchen? Christ, he loved the way she could come up with those prim little phrases and deliver them in that husky voice. Darling, this isn't even close to a move. Keeping her hand firmly in his, he turned it palm up. Lady hands, he murmured. Teacup hands. I've always had a real weakness for long, narrow hands with soft skin. He pressed his lips to the center, lingering while her pulse bumped like a hammer under his thumb. That, he said, curling her fingers closed as if to ensure she kept the imprint of his lips there, was a move. As far as taste goes, yours suits me. You'll probably want to keep that in mind. He released her hand, scooped up his cards, and rose. I'll see you in the morning, unless you're having second thoughts. Dignity, she reminded herself, was as important as pride. I'm not having any thoughts at all, Slater, that involve you. Sure you are. He leaned down until they were face to face. I warn you not to bluff, Kelsey. You lose. He left her steaming over cold coffee. It was a damn shame, he thought, that he couldn't indulge himself in a few afternoon fantasies, but he had work to do. As soon as he returned to Longshot, Gabe sought out Jameson. The trainer had been Cunningham's man, but when Gabe took over the farm, it hadn't taken much to induce Jameson to stay. His loyalties had always been more with the horses than with the owner. He was a big-bellied man who liked his food and his beer. Though he'd trained generations of horses that had finished in the money, no one but his staunchest friends would have considered him in Moses Whitetree's league. He'd come from the county of Kerry as a babe in his mother's arms. His earliest memories were the shed row, the smell of the horses his father had groomed. Jameson had lived his entire life in the shadow of the thoroughbred. Now, at sixty-two, he sometimes dreamed of owning his own small farm and one champion, just one to carry him comfortably into retirement. "'Well, Gabe,' he set aside his condition book and rose as Gabe walked in. "'I shipped Honest Abe to Santa Anita and Reliance to Pimlico. Missed the first post.' He smiled wanly. But I heard you'd had a spot of trouble and thought you'd want to see me before I headed to the track. How many times have you caught Lipsky drinking on the job? No prevaricating or how was your day with the likes of Gabriel Slater, Jameson thought. He'd known the boy for some twenty years and had yet to fully understand him. Twice before. I gave him a warning and told him he'd be cut loose if it happened again. He's a good hand. A weakness for gin, it's true, but he's worked on this farm for a decade. He glanced at the bandage on Gabe's arm and sighed. 
I swear on my mother's heart, I'd no notion the man would try to stick you. Drunks are unreliable, Jamie. You know my feelings about that. I do indeed. Jameson folded his hands over his belly. He should be at the track, not here, smoothing feathers. And maybe I understand why you've no tolerance for that particular weakness. Still, the lads are my province, aren't they? And I followed my own judgment. Your judgment was faulty. It was. A hand drinks on the job. From you down to the lowest stable boy, he's gone. No more warnings, Jamie. No exceptions. Irritation might have flickered in his eyes, but Jameson nodded. You're holding the bat, Gabe. Satisfied, Gabe picked up the condition book himself, skimming pages. I'll be spending more time around the barn and the back stretch, he said. I don't want you to feel I'm breathing down your neck. It's your barn, Jamie returned, his voice stiffening. Your back stretch. Yes, it is. And it was very clear to me today that the men don't consider me an integral part of this operation. That's my fault. He set the book down again. The first couple of years after the farm changed hands, I was involved with building the house and shoehorning my way into the tight little club of owners. Since then, I've let most of the day-to-day -day business stay in your hands and played owner. Now I'm going to get down to work. You're my trainer, Jamie, and as far as the horses go, I'll accept what advice you give me. But I'm back in the game now. I don't intend to lose. It would pass, Jameson decided. Owners rarely concern themselves with the real work for long. All they wanted was their spot in the paddock and the purse. You know your way around a shed row as well as anyone. It's been a long time since I picked up a pitchfork. Gabe smiled as the image of Kelsey brandishing one like a spear flashed into his mind. He looked at the big-faced clock Jameson had nailed to the wall of his office. We can make it to Pimlico by three. Who'd you send with the filly? Car stairs. Torquey's up on her, Lynette's groom. Let's go see what kind of team they make. Since she was left to her own devices, Kelsey changed her shoes for boots and headed out. She didn't go toward the stables, aware that she would just be in the way or stared at as if she were an oddity. Instead, she walked toward the soft roll of hills where the horses were at grass. The quiet, the undeniable peace were a welcome change from the frantic morning. Even so, she had to fight a restlessness that urged her to keep walking, keep moving, until she found what was over the next rise. How could she have walked here as a child and remember nothing? It frustrated her to think that the first three years of her life were a virtual blank. It wouldn't matter in most cases, but her destiny had been skewed in those early years. She wanted them back, wanted to decide for herself what was right, what was wrong. She stopped by a tidy white fence, leaning on it while a trio of mares began an impromptu race, their babies skipping after them. Another mother stood patiently, cropping grass while her foal suckled. It was almost too perfect, Kelsey thought, a postcard that was just slightly too clear, too bright for reality. Yet she found herself smiling at the foal, admiring the impossibly delicate legs, the tilt of the somehow elegant head. What would he do, she wondered, if she climbed the fence and tried to pet him? Spectacular, aren't they? Naomi joined her at the fence. The breeze ruffled the hair she'd cut to chin length for convenience more than fashion. I never get tired of watching them, spring after spring, year after year. It's soothing, the routine of it, and exciting, the possibility of it. They're beautiful, sedate somehow. It's hard to imagine them streaking down a racetrack. They're athletes, bred for speed. You'll see that for yourself tomorrow. Naomi tossed back her hair, then, impatient with it, pulled a soft cap out of her jacket pocket and put it on. The one there, nursing, he's five days old. Five? Surprised, Kelsey turned back, studying the mother and her baby more closely. The foal was sleek and healthy and appeared wise to the ways of the paddock. That doesn't seem possible. They grow quickly. In three years, he'll be prime. It starts here, or more accurately, in the breeding shed then goes to that final blur of color at the wire. He'll be fifteen, sixteen hands, perhaps twelve hundred pounds, and he'll race the oval with a man on his back. It's a beautiful thing to watch. But not easy, Kelsey commented. It can't be easy to take something so delicate and turn it into a competitor. No, Naomi smiled then. Her daughter already understood. That, she supposed, was in the blood. It's work and dedication and quite often disappointment, but it's worth it every time. 
She angled her hat so the brim shaded her eyes. I'm sorry I left you so long. The farrier likes to talk. He was a friend of my father's. He does the work for me here rather than at the track because of old ties. It's all right. I don't expect you to entertain me. What do you expect? Nothing. Yet. Naomi looked back at the nursing mare, wishing it could be that easy to bond with her own child. Are you still angry about this morning? Angry's the wrong word. Kelsey turned away from the fence so she could study her mother's profile. Baffled is better. Everyone just stood there. You didn't. With a grin, Naomi shook her head. I thought you were going to run that drunken fool through. I envy you that, Kelsey, that knee-jerk reaction that comes from a lack of fear or a surplus of honor. I froze. I have too much fear and not nearly enough honor left. A lifetime ago, I wouldn't have hesitated either. She braced herself and shifted to face her daughter. You're wondering why the police weren't called. Gabe did that for me. He may or may not have handled it differently on his own place, but here, well, he would have known I'd be reluctant to talk to the police again, ever again. It's none of my business. Naomi closed her eyes. The simple fact they both had to face was that it was all Kelsey's business now. I wasn't afraid when they came to arrest me. I was so arrogantly sure that they would end up looking like fools and I a heroine. I wasn't afraid when I sat in the interrogation room with its long mirror, gray walls, the hard chair designed to make you squirm. She opened her eyes again. I didn't squirm, not at first. I was a Chadwick. But the fear creeps up on you, inch by crafty inch. You can beat it back, not away, but back. Before I left that horrible room with the mirror and the gray walls, I was afraid. She took a steadying breath, reminded herself she was free of that. Free of it, but for the memories. Through the trial, the headlines, the stares, I was afraid, but I didn't want to show it. I hated the idea of everyone knowing I was terrified. Then they tell you to stand up, so the jury of your peers can deliver the verdict. Your verdict. You can't beat it back then. It has a choke hold on you and you can't breathe. You might stand there pretending to be calm, pretending to be confident because you know they're watching you. Every eye is on you. But inside you're jelly. When they say guilty, it's almost anticlimactic. She drew another deep breath. So you see, I'm very reluctant to talk to the police again. She said nothing for a moment, expected no response. Do you know, we used to come here when you were little. I'd sit you up on the fence. You always loved visiting the foals. I'm sorry. And she was suddenly deeply sorry. I don't remember. It doesn't matter. See the one there sunning himself, the black? He's a champion. I knew it when he was born. He might prove himself to be one of the best to come out of Three Willows. Kelsey studied the foal more closely. He was charming, certainly, but she didn't see anything to separate him from the other young in the pasture. How can you tell? It's in the eyes. Mine and his. We just know. She leaned on the fence, looking out over the fields with her daughter, and was, for a moment, nearly content. Late that night, when the house was quiet and the wind tapped seductively at the windows, Naomi curled her body to Moses. She liked it best when he came to her bed. It had more of a sense of permanence than when she crept up to his rooms above the trainer's shed. Not that she didn't enjoy the thrill of doing just that. The first time, their first time, she'd walked into his room, surprising him as he sat in his underwear nursing a beer and poring over paperwork. He'd been a tough seduction, she recalled, stroking a hand along the firm skin of his chest. But his eyes had given him away. He'd wanted her just as he'd always wanted her. It had just taken her sixteen years to realize she wanted him, too. I love you, Moses. It always jolted him to hear her say it. He supposed it always would. He laid his hand over hers, over his heart. I love you, Naomi. How else could you have talked me into coming up here with your daughter down the hall? She laughed, shifting her head so that she could nibble on his neck. Kelsey's an adult. I doubt she'd be traumatized even if she knew I had you in bed. She rolled over, straddling him. And I do have you, Moses. 
It's hard to argue with that since all the blood just drained from my head and into my lap. In an old habit, he skimmed his hands up her slim torso to cup her breasts. You get more beautiful every day, Naomi, every year. That's because your eyes get older. Not when they look at you. Her heart simply melted. Christ, you destroy me when you get sentimental. I look at Kelsey and see how much I've changed. It's wonderful to see her, to have her close even for a little while. She laughed, shaking her hair back. And I'm still vain enough to look away from her and into the mirror and see every goddamn line. I'm crazy about every goddamn line. Being beautiful used to be so important to me. It was like a mission. No, like a duty. Then for so many years it didn't mean anything. Until you. She smiled, bending down to brush his lips with hers. And now you tell me you like wrinkles. Moses cupped a hand behind her head, drawing her more firmly to him. As she flowed into the kiss, he shifted her, raising her hips, lowering them so that he slid deep into her. He watched her arch back, thrilling to her quick, throaty moan. He set the rhythm slow, holding her to his pace, drawing the pleasure out for both of them. From the hallway outside her room, Kelsey heard the muffled sounds of lovemaking, the creak of the old mattress, the breathy moans and murmurs. She stood, the cup of tea she'd gone down to brew in one hand, a book in the other, flustered into immobility. Not once had she ever heard her father and Candace in the night. She assumed they were both too restrained and polite to make noisy love. There was certainly nothing restrained or polite about the sounds only partially smothered by the closed door down the hall. Nor, she reminded herself, was it polite to stand out here listening. She fumbled with the knob, spilling tea in her rush to get inside. Her mother, she thought, barraged by dozens of conflicting emotions. And Gabe Slater, she assumed. The emotions his presence behind that door conjured up were best not explored. The moment she had her own door safely closed, she leaned back against it. Part of her wanted to laugh at the absurdity of it, a grown woman shocked because another grown woman, who happened to be her mother, had an active sex life. But she wasn't very amused at the moment, at the situation or her own reaction to it. No longer wanting either, she set the tea and book aside. The dark, still-sleeping garden beneath her window was silvered with moonlight. Romantic, she thought, laying her brow against the glass, mysterious, as so much of Three Willows was. She didn't want romance. She didn't want mystery. At least, she didn't want to want them. She was here because it was important to learn about the half of her parentage that had been taken away from her. Turning from the window, she went back to bed. But she didn't sleep until long after she heard the door down the hall open and close and the sound of quiet footsteps moving past her room toward the stairs. Chapter 6 The Track at Dawn it was a different world from the one Kelsey had expected. Racing to her meant more than speed. It meant gambling and gamblers, fat cigars and bad suits, the smell of stale beer and loser's sweat. The drunken groom Gabe had fired the day before fit her image of the world she'd imagined much more cozily than the tranquil, somehow mystical reality of the dawn horse. The track was cloaked in mist when she arrived with Naomi. The horses had left even earlier to be offloaded, saddled, and prepped for their workouts. It was quiet, almost serene. Voices were muffled by the fog, and people moved in and out of the trailing mist like ghosts. Men leaned against the sagging rail around the oval, sipping from steaming paper cups. They're clockers, Naomi told her, speed boys. Some work for the track or daily racing form. They'll be here for hours, timing the horses, handicapping them, she smiled. Chasing speed. I guess that's what we all do. I thought you'd like to see it from this angle first. It's, well, it's beautiful, isn't it? The fog, the trees slipping through it, the all but empty grandstands. It's not what I pictured. She turned to the woman beside her, the slim, lovely blonde in denim jacket and jeans. Nothing seems to be. Most people see only one aspect of racing, two minutes around the oval, over and done in a flash. Thrilling, certainly, sometimes terrifying. Triumphant or tragic, often a man or woman is judged the same way by one aspect, or one act. There was no bitterness in her voice now, but simple acceptance. I'll take you around to the shed row. That's where the real action is. And the real characters, Kelsey discovered. Aging jockeys who'd failed at the post or put on weight 
hustled for the $40 they'd earn per ride as exercise boys. Others, hardly more than children, with an eager look in the eye, loitered, hoping for their chance. Horses were discussed, strategies outlined. A groom in a tweed hat gently walked a crippled horse, singing to it in a soothing monotone. There was no particular excitement or anticipation, just routine, one she realized went on day after day while most people slept or nodded over their first cup of coffee. She spotted a man in a pale blue suit and shiny boots in earnest conversation with a placid-eyed man in a tattered cardigan. Now and again the man in the suit would punctuate his words with a jab of a pudgy finger. A flashy diamond ring in the shape of a horseshoe winked with every move. "'Bill Cunningham,' Naomi said, noting who had captured Kelsey's attention. "'Cunningham?' Kelsey frowned and flipped through her memory. "'Isn't that the name I heard that groom Gabe fired yesterday mention?' "'Longshot used to be Cunningham Farm. "'Bill inherited it, oh, about twenty-five years ago, I guess.' "'The disdain in her voice leaked through. "'He was doing a first-class job of running it into the ground "'when he lost it to Gabe. "'Now he has an interest in several horses, "'owns one or two mediocre ones outright. "'He lives in Maryland. "'The trainer's Carmine.' "'works for Bill and several other owners. "'Right now, Carmine's listening to Bill's instructions. "'He's pontificating, and he's agreeing with everything. "'Then Carmine will do as he pleases, "'because he knows Bill's an ass. "'Oops,' she let out a sigh. "'He spotted us. "'I'll apologize ahead of time. "'Naomi!' "'In a strutting stride that showed off his boots, "'Cunningham closed in on them. "'His eyes glittered like polished marbles "'as he took Naomi's hands.' A beautiful sight on a gloomy morning, Bill. The years had given Naomi a high tolerance for fools, and she offered her cheek. We don't often see what workouts. Got me a new horse. Claiming race at Hialeah. She took the win as the rider pleased. I was just telling Carmine how she should be worked today. Don't want her rated. Of course not, Naomi said sweetly. Bill, this is my daughter, Kelsey. Daughter? He puffed out his cheeks in feigned surprise. Like everyone else in the area, he already knew about Kelsey. You must mean sister. Glad to meet you, dearie. He slapped a hand to Kelsey's and pumped vigorously. Going to follow in your ma's boot steps, are you? I'm just here to watch. Well, there's plenty to see. We'll have her hooked by dusk, he added with a wink to Naomi. You check with me before you make any bets this afternoon, honey. I'll show you how it's done. Thank you. Nothing's too good for Naomi's little girl. You know, if I hadn't shied at the gate, I might be your papa. You take care now. In a pig's eye, Naomi muttered under her breath as Bill strutted away to harass his trainer. He likes to think we were an item when the closest we came was me not quite avoiding one sloppy kiss. I appreciate your taste. What the hell was he saying about his horse? Oh, Naomi set her hands on her hips and enjoyed a good laugh. Bill likes to toss the lingo around, thinks it fools people into believing he knows something. Let's see. In plain English, he picked up the filly in a claiming race, meaning the owners had put it up for sale. The horse won easily, and Bill met the asking price. He feels the horse shouldn't be rated or slowed during the workout. She frowned at his back. He's the type who pays a jockey extra for every hit of a stick. If a horse isn't whipped over the finish line, Bill feels cheated. I'm surprised you were so polite. It doesn't cost me anything. She shrugged. And I know what it is to be an outcast. Come on, Moses should have a writer up by now. They moved through the paddock area where exercise boys were being given a leg up onto their mounts. With little between them, Kelsey noticed. The saddle was so tiny, hardly more than a slip of leather. The boys, as they were called regardless of sex, stood in the high stirrups while mounted trainers walked beside or behind them toward the track. That's one of ours, Naomi pointed to a trotting bay. Virginia's pride. If you can't resist betting today, you might want to put a couple of dollars on him. He's an amazing athlete, and he likes this particular track. Do you bet? Mmm. Naomi's eyes were on Moses, who rode a half-length behind the bay. I've always hated to refuse a gamble. Let's watch him run. There were other horses on the track. The mist was lifting now, and they cut through it like bullets through mesh, exploding through it, shredding it. Kelsey's breath caught at the sight of it, the sounds of it. Huge bodies on thin legs, spewing up dirt, necks straining forward with their tiny riders bent low. Her heartbeat picked up the pulse of the muffled thunder of hooves. There! 
Excitement lifted her voice as she pointed. That's your horse! Yes, that's ours. The track's fast today, but I imagine Moses told the boy to keep him just under two minutes. How would the rider know? He has a clock in his head. Gabe's voice came from behind her. Though Kelsey started, she didn't take her eyes off the horse rocketing around the track. He looks good, Naomi. He'll look even better by derby time. Her eyes narrowed. That one's yours, isn't he? Double or nothing. Gabe leaned on the rail as the horse sped past. He looked better by May, too. Kelsey didn't see how. Both horses looked magnificent now, eating up the track, tossing pieces of it toward the sky. They were airborne, those terrifyingly delicate legs lifting off the earth like wings. She could have stayed there for hours, watching horse after horse, lap after lap. True, it took only a minute or two, and the clockers stood with their stopwatches, the trainers with theirs, but it was timeless to her, like a lovely animated painting in a worn frame. Picked your favorite yet? Gabe asked her. No. She didn't look at him, didn't want him or the memory of what she'd heard in the night to spoil the mood. I'm not much of a gambler. Then I don't suppose you'd like to bet that you'll hit the windows before the afternoon's over. She shrugged, then found she couldn't resist. Bill Cunningham offered to give me some tips. Cunningham? <laughs> Gabe let out a roar of laughter. Then I hope you've got deep pockets, darling. He leaned against the fence. He considered taking out a cigar, but decided it would spoil his enjoyment of Kelsey's scent. Soft and subtle it was, the kind that crept into a man's senses and lingered long after the woman had slipped away. Morning's the best time, Naomi murmured, shading her eyes as the sun broke through the thinning mist and dazzled. Clean slate. Possibilities. Gabe looked down at Kelsey. It's all about possibilities. Later they walked back to the shed row. Horses steamed in the cool air as they were unsaddled and walked. Legs were checked for strains, sprains, and bruises. A roan's hooves were oiled. A groom posed another, crouching down, searching for injury. A farrier with leather apron and battered toolbox hammered a shoe. Like a painting, isn't it? Gabe asked, as if he'd plucked the image from Kelsey's brain. Yes, it is. Everything you see here would have been true a hundred years ago. Five hundred. Thoroughbred's legs can go any time, so we obsess about them. Look there. Where's the trainer looking? She turned to watch a horse being led in, the trainer behind. At the horse's feet. And he'll keep his eyes there. He nodded in another direction. They were probably around a thousand years ago. A man in a racing cap dogged Moses at the heels. He was talking fast, puffing to keep up. Who is he? Jockey agent. They hustle from barn to barn trying to convince everyone they represent the next Willie Shoemaker. Casually, he tucked Naomi's hair behind her ear. Can I get you some coffee? I'd love some. Kelsey? Sure, thanks. Is it all right if I get a closer look at your horse while he's being walked? Go ahead. Naomi settled down on an upturned bucket. The morning's work was nearly done, and the waiting would start. She'd gotten very good at waiting. There was a pleasure in it now, watching her daughter circle with the hot walker, asking questions Naomi imagined. The child had always been full of questions, but never aloof as she was now. For a moment that morning, as they stood in the mist watching the first horses round the practice track, she'd felt something relax between them. Then the stiffness had come back, Subtle, but then there were so many subtleties to her daughter, so many contrasts. Kelsey laughed. It was the first time Naomi had heard the sound easy, without reservations. She's enjoying herself, Gabe commented as he passed Naomi a cup of coffee. I know. It's good to see it. I'm sitting here telling myself that it won't always be so awkward between us. She eased her dry throat with the hot, sweetened coffee. I just want to touch her, to hold her just once and I can't. She might let me out of pity. That would be worse than rejection. She's here. Gently he ran a hand down her hair over her shoulder. She doesn't strike me as the type to be here if she didn't want to be. I don't expect her to love me again, but I do want her to let me love her. She reached for the hand on her shoulder, covered it with her own. Kelsey tried to ignore the intimacy of the pose when she walked back to them. It was their business, she reminded herself. She kept a smile on her face and reached out for the coffee Gabe offered. Thanks. I've just been given the winner in every race today. 
I should leave here, I'm told, flush. Jimmy's always got a tip, Naomi said, and they're right as often as they're wrong. Oh, but these are sure things, Kelsey grinned as she lifted her cup. He swore he'd never give Miss Naomi's daughter anything but a cinch tip. I'm supposed to bet on Necromancer in the first because the field's slow and he's generous and should win laughing. She arched a brow. Did I get that right? No one would guess it's your first day, Gabe said soberly. Oh, I'm a quick study. She glanced around. The pace was definitely slowing down, she noted. What happens now? We wait, Naomi rose, stretched. Come on, I'll buy us some doughnuts to go with this coffee. Waiting, it seemed, was a way of life around the track. By ten, the workday was over for the horses not scheduled to race. Trailers pulled in, pulled out. The track was groomed. By noon, the grandstands began to fill. The glassed-in restaurant behind them served lunch, catering to those who preferred their racing experience away from the noise and smells of the masses. In the shed row, horses were prepped once again. Swollen legs were iced down in buckets. According to personal strategy, some were kept on edge, others soothed like babies. Jockeys donned their silks. Now the anticipation was there, the excitement that had been missing from the mist-coated morning. Horses pranced, fidgeted, athletes eager to run. Some calmed when their jockeys were tossed onto their backs, others pawed and quivered. From the paddock area they walked toward the track, single file, some led by grooms, some unaccompanied. Now the grandstands buzzed, newcomers sprinkled among regulars, all of them hoping today would be their day. The post-parade, the foundation of the dozens of racing rituals, began with the horses stepping onto the track. At the bugler's call they circled it, in order of post-position. Those eager to bet studied racing forms, horses, jockeys, hoping to pick a winner. If a horse was sweating, he might be nervous. Advantage or disadvantage? Each player had his own opinion. Bandaged forelegs could be trouble. Ah, that one hauling at his bit might be bad temper today, or he might be fast. That one looks like a winner. At the finish line, barely five minutes after it had begun, the parade dissolved like colorful confetti tossed in the air. It didn't matter to Kelsey. There was too much to see. Odd, the track wasn't really flat at all. It was wide, textured with furrows and air pockets, a circular mile of speed and dreams. She could all but smell the dreams as she stood at the rail, from the jockeys, from the grandstands. Some were fresh and floral, others stale, powdered dry with dust. And she understood, standing there, what a powerful drug it was to want to win. I think I'll take that first tip. Naomi laughed. She had been expecting it. Take her up, will you, Gabe? Nobody should face their first window alone. I'm sure I can handle it, Kelsey said when Gabe took her hand. Everybody thinks that. He wound his way up inside where lines were already forming at the windows. Let me give you a quick lesson on playing the horses. Have you figured how much cash you'd play? She frowned, annoyed. About a hundred? Double it. Whatever you figure you'll play, double it. Then consider it gone. Now, you've got your racing form? Yes, I got it. She didn't understand it, but she had it. Normally, you'd need about four hours in a quiet place to study it, reviewing the races in order, eliminating horses, ranking others. Best to whittle it down to two or three. No binoculars, huh? No, I didn't think... Never mind, you can borrow mine. He eased her into a line, draped an arm companionably over her shoulder. He didn't smile. He wanted to, but he didn't. She was listening to him as a prized student would to a veteran teacher. Now, you want to forget betting the doubles or the exact as any of the combinations, and you want to bet to win. Of course I do. That's right, aggressive betting. It's its own reward. Betting to show is for wimps. He had the satisfaction of seeing the man in the line behind him wince and curl his shoulders. Did you check the odds board? No, she said, feeling like a fool. Your horse is at four to one. That's fine. Betting favorites is for cowards. Too bad you told me you weren't much of a gambler or I wouldn't let you eat or drink before betting. What? Never eat or drink before you pick a winner, Kelsey. Her eyes narrowed. You're making this up. Nope, it's all gospel. Now he grinned. And it's all bullshit. Bet to play because it's fun. Close your eyes and pick a number. Horses are athletes, not machines. You can't figure them. Thanks a lot. Amused now, she stepped up to the window. Ten dollars on Necromancer. She shot a look at Gabe. To win. With his arm still around her shoulder, Gabe reached for his wallet. Fifty on number three. To win. 
Clutching her own ticket, she frowned. Who's number three? Couldn't say. He slipped the ticket into his pocket. You just bet a number? Just a number? A hunch. Want to make a side bet on who comes in first, your tip or my hunch? Another ten, she shot back. And you said you weren't much of a gambler. He got her back to the rail just as the horses entered the starting gate. Foolish it might have been, but her heart was thudding, her palms damp. At the clang of the bell, she strained forward, dazzled by the blur of color. No misty work out now, but a crowd of muscled bodies fighting for position, their riders a burr on their backs. In seconds, they reached full stride, with front runners hugging the rail. The sound was overwhelming, thunder in front, roaring in back. Then they were at the turn. Number three's got it, Gabe said in her ear. Kelsey shook him off. They've barely started. She could hear jockeys screaming threats or encouragement while their whips flashed. Down the stretch, the wire in sight, and Kelsey had forgotten the bet entirely. Every emotion was caught up in the race itself, the showmanship of it, the drama of speed. She saw a horse coming from behind, straining, digging in. Hardly aware of the decision, she began to root for him, thrilled by that flash of courage and heart. He nipped the leader on the outside and took the wire by half a length. Oh, did you see him? She threw her head back and laughed. He was beautiful. Gabe hadn't seen the finish, but he'd seen her. The polite mask had melted away with excitement, revealing the passion and energy of the woman beneath. He wanted that woman more than he'd ever wanted a winning hand. Lips pursed, Naomi considered the look in Gabe's eyes. That was something she'd have to think about. Your horse finished fifth, she told Kelsey. It doesn't matter. Kelsey drew a deep breath. She could still smell the glamour. It was worth it. Did you see how he came up like that? It was almost out of nowhere. Number three, Gabe said, and waited until her eyes met his. A hunch paid off. That was number three? She turned toward the winner's circle, torn between annoyance at losing to him and her enjoyment of watching the horse win. This must be your lucky day. You could be right. So, she slid her eyes up to his and smiled. Who do you like in the next race? Sometime during the afternoon, she devoured a hot dog and washed it down with a watered-down soft drink. She felt a surprising stab of pride, very personal, when Virginia's pride dominated his field. It was so obvious, she thought, even to her untrained eye, that there wasn't another horse in the race to compare with him. Another, less identifiable emotion pricked her when Gabe's horse crossed the wire first. As dusk fell, the grandstands were littered with losing tickets, cigarette butts, and shattered hopes. Can I interest you two ladies in some dinner? Oh, distracted, Naomi buttoned up her jacket. She was already looking for Moses. I'm going to be at least another hour here. Why don't you take Kelsey? Instinctively, Kelsey sidestepped. I don't mind waiting for you. No, go ahead, have fun. I'll see you at home in a couple of hours. Really, I... But Naomi was already hurrying away. I appreciate the offer, Gabe, but, but you're too well-mannered to refuse. He took her arm. No, I'm not. Then you're too hungry. A single hot dog doesn't fuel all that energy, and I can help you count your winnings. I don't think that's going to strain anyone's math. In any case, she was hungry. She let him guide her through the parking lot to a bottle green Jaguar. Nice car. She's fast. He was right. Kelsey leaned back and enjoyed the ride through the purling twilight. She'd always liked to drive fast, top-down, radio-blasting. Wade had lectured her countless times as he'd stuck to the heart of the speed limit. Sensible, she thought now, responsible. But he'd never understood that now and again she had to cut loose, do something, anything, full out. He'd preached moderation, and she had agreed, except when she couldn't. An impulsive spending spree, a speeding ticket, a last-minute urge to fly to the Bahamas— those quicksilver changes in her had been the cause of most of their domestic quarrels. Small stuff, she'd always thought. Incorrectly, she realized now. What had her impulsive surprise visit to Atlanta gotten her? Freedom, she reminded herself, and determinedly closed the book on it. When she began to pay attention to the scenery again, she realized they were nearly at Bluemont. I thought we were going to have dinner. We are. Do you like seafood? Yes. Is there a restaurant out here? One or two, but we're eating in. I called home earlier. How does grilled swordfish strike you? That's fine. She straightened in her seat, listening to the alarm bells in her head. How did you know I'd be coming to dinner? I had a hunch. 
He cruised down the road, zipped through the iron gates and up the drive. You can take a look at the house before we eat. His gardener had been busy. Beds had been tidied for spring so perennials could flaunt their new growth. A few brave daffodils had already bloomed, their bright yellow heads nodding charmingly. Funny, she'd never have picked Gabe as the daffodil type. The front door was flanked by beveled glass panels etched in geometric designs. With the light inside glowing through them, they glinted like diamonds. She remembered now that his jockey's silks had resembled diamonds as well, a dramatic red and white. How did you pick your colors, the silks? A straight flush, diamonds, eight through king. He opened the door, a hand of cards. I drew the ten and jack against the odds. People will tell you that's how I came into this place, winning a hand of cards. Did you? More or less. She stepped inside into a tiled atrium, all open space, dizzying ceilings with art skylights. The copper rail that circled the second floor followed a gently curving staircase. Huge terracotta pots hung suspended, spilling out greenery. Quite an entrance, she managed. I don't like to be closed in. I'll get you a drink. All right. She followed him through a wide arch into a living area. This, too, opened into another room through archways. Glass doors invited the night inside. Lamps already lit softened it. There was a fire crackling in the hearth of river stone. A table was set in front of it. For two, she noted. A white cloth, candles, champagne chilled in a bucket beside it. Did you also have a hunch that Naomi wouldn't be joining us? She usually goes into conference with Moses after a day at the track. He opened the bottle with a quick, celebrational pop. Do you want to look around, or would you rather have dinner right away? I'll look around, since I'm here. She accepted the glass, noting there was no matching flute by the second plate. You're not celebrating? Sure I am. I don't drink. Why don't we start upstairs and work down? He led her out up the curving stairs. She counted four bedrooms before they climbed a short flight into the master suite. This was a split-level affair, the bedroom three tiled steps above the sitting area. A stone fireplace would warm the foot of the lake-sized platform bed, and the skylight would invite a restless sleeper to watch the moon. Like the rest of the house, it was a mix of the classic and the modern. A Chippendale table held an abstract bronze and copper sculpture. A Persian carpet glowed on the floor beneath a free-form coffee table of polished teak. Mice and vases beside modern art. The art, the painting, drew her. Even from across the room, Kelsey recognized it as a work by the same artist who had done those in her mother's home. So much passion, she thought, as she studied the frenetic brushstrokes, the violent juxtaposition of primary colors. Not a very restful piece for a bedroom. It seemed to belong here. N.C., she murmured. Did Naomi paint this? Yes. Didn't you know she painted? No, no one mentioned it. She's very talented. I know several art dealers who would be begging at her door. She wouldn't thank you for it. Her art's personal. All art's personal. She turned away from it. Has she always painted? No, you should ask her about it sometimes. She'll tell you whatever you want to know. I'll have to decide what that is first. Sipping her champagne, she wandered the room. I don't know what that dignified Cape Cod looked like, but I doubt it could have measured up to this. More at ease, she turned back. Did you horrify the neighborhood by having it raised? Appalled everyone within twenty miles, and enjoyed every minute of it. Damn right, what's the use of having a reputation if you can't live up to it? And what is your reputation? Slippery, darling, very slippery. Anyone would tell you that being alone with me in my bedroom is the first step to perdition. It's a long way from the first step to the last fall. Not as far as you might think. With a shrug, she tossed back the rest of her drink. Tell me about the card game. Over dinner. He held out a hand. I'm a sucker for atmosphere and a lot closer to that last fall than most. Intrigued, she put her hand in his. That doesn't sound very slippery to me, Slater. I'm just getting started. Downstairs, he refilled her glass. Some invisible servant had already set two silver dome plates on the table, lit the candles, and switched on music. They sat down to Gershwin. The card game? All right. How much do you know about poker? I know what beats what, I think. She took a bite of the delicately grilled fish and closed her eyes. This definitely beats the track cooking all to hell. I'll tell the cook you said so. 
Anyway, about five years ago I was in a game, a marathon. Big stakes, heavy hitters. Around here? Not around here. Here, in the dignified Cape Cod. She narrowed her eyes. Isn't gambling illegal in this state? Call a cop. Do you want to hear this or not? I do. So you were in a big, illegal poker game. Then what? Cunningham was having a run of bad luck, not just during the game, but for several months. His horses were breaking down. He hadn't had any finish in money for more than a year. He had a pile of outstanding dits. He figured, like most do when they're on a downswing, that all he needed was one big score. Hence the poker game. Exactly. I had interest in a horse, and he'd been running well, so I was, he smiled devilishly, flush. I wanted a farm like this, always had. I went into the game thinking that if I didn't lose my stake, I might finesse enough for another horse, work my way up. Sounds sensible in a skewed sort of way. Reckless was how it sounded, she thought. Admirably reckless. Obviously, you won more than a horse. I couldn't lose. It was one of those sweet moments when everything falls in your lap. If he had three of a kind, I had a full house. He had a straight, I had a flush. His trouble really started when he wouldn't let it go. He was down about sixty, sixty-five. Hundred? Charmed, he took her hand, kissed it lavishly. Thousand, darling. And he didn't have it to lose. Not cash, anyway. So he upped the stakes. Wouldn't take no for an answer. And, of course, you tried your best to bring him to his senses. I told him he was making a mistake. He said he wasn't. Gabe moved his shoulders. Who am I to argue? There were only four of us left by then. We'd been at it for about fifteen hours. This was going to be the last hand. Five thousand open, no limit on raises. That was twenty thousand before you even got started? And over a hundred and fifty by the time it got down to me and Cunningham. Her fork stopped halfway to her mouth. A hundred and fifty thousand dollars on one hand? He thought he had a winner. Kept bumping the pot. I had the last raise. Bumped at another fifty myself. I thought it might put him out of his misery, but he matched it. She lifted her glass and sipped slowly to wet her dry throat. She felt she could almost be there, sweaty palmed and dry mouthed, with a small fortune riding on the turn of a card. That's a quarter of a million dollars. He grinned. You're a quick study. I felt sorry for him, but I'm not going to say I didn't relish the moment when I laid down that straight flush to his three kings. He didn't have the cash. Gabe tipped more champagne into her glass. He barely had the assets. So we made a deal. You could say Cunningham bet the farm and lost it. You just kicked him out? Gabe inclined his head, studied her. What would you have done? I don't know, she said after a moment. But I don't think I could have thrown the man out of his own house. Even after he'd gambled with money he didn't have? Even then. So you're a soft touch. We made a deal, Gabe said again, that satisfied both of us. And because I played against the odds, I got something I'd wanted my whole life. That's quite a story. I guess you met the unlucky Bill Cunningham at the track. No, at least not initially. I used to work for him. Here? She set down her fork. You used to work here? I walked hot, shoveled manure, polished tack. For three years, I was one of Cunningham's boys. He had a fine line back then. Of course, he never gave a good goddamn about the horses. They were just money to him. He cared a lot less about the people who took care of them. Our rooms were like little cells, cramped, dingy. He didn't believe in putting any of his capital into unnecessary improvements. I don't think it bothered you at all to take his house. I didn't lose any sleep over it. When I left here, I did some time at Three Willows. Now that's a farm. Chadwick had the touch. So does your mother. When I left, I was about seventeen then, I figured I'd come back one day, money dripping out of my pockets and buy myself one place or the other. And you did, in a manner of speaking. What did you do while you were away? That's another story. Fair enough. Relaxed with food and wine, she propped her chin on her fist. I bet you hated that Cape Cod. Every fucking inch of it. Laughing, she leaned back again and picked up her glass. I think I'm starting to like you. I hope you didn't make all that up. I didn't have to. Want dessert? I can't. With a little moan, she pushed away from the table to wander the room. When I first saw this house, I thought it looked arrogant and territorial. I think I was right. She closed her eyes for a moment. 
My point of no return. What? Nothing. She shook her head and walked closer to the windows. It must be quite a feeling to look out any window and see so much of your own. What do you see out of yours? A restaurant, a small shopping center with a terrible little boutique and a wonderful bakery. It's practically next door to the metro, and I thought I wanted convenience. He put his hands on her shoulders, then turned her so that they were face to face. But you don't. No. A quick tremble caught her by surprise when he skimmed his hand up the side of her neck. What then? I haven't decided. He framed her face, letting his fingers dip into her hair. I have. His mouth lowered to hers, soft at first, testing hardly more than a nibble that gave them both the choice to step back. But she didn't, not with his taste still vibrating on her lips and the low, drugging ache of unexpected need churning. She didn't step back, but forward, her arms winding recklessly around his neck, her mouth melding hotly with his. So much to feel, she'd forgotten there was so much to feel, or perhaps she'd never known. There was nothing civilized or tentative about this embrace. It was groping and wild, an explosion of sensation that mocked the gentle candlelight and soft music. She stripped his mind clean. There was nothing left for him but naked sensation, the smell of her, the taste which mixed together like some exotic drug. The feel of her straining against him, the sound of his quickened breathing as she dragged him greedily closer. The need for her, sharp and edgy as a knife, peeled away the layers of manners, behavior, and ethics he'd carefully crafted and bared the reckless man beneath. He needed to touch her. His hands streaked down over in a desperate race to possess. She arched under them, eager for more. Hurry, she wanted to beg him to hurry, not to let her think, not to let her reason. Then he ran a hand over her face, combing her hair behind her ear. The image of him performing that same careless gesture for her mother only hours before flashed into her mind. The horror and the shame were like two vicious heavy blows. She shoved away, fighting for air. Don't! She stumbled back when he reached for her. Don't touch me! She could still taste him, still want him. How could you do this? How could I do this? I want you. He had to fight every instinct in his body to keep from lunging forward and taking what had nearly been his. You want me. Because it was true, urgently true, she had no choice but to strike back. I'm not a mare to be hobbled and serviced, and I didn't come here tonight so you could find out if the daughter takes after the mother. To restrain them, Gabe stuck his hands in his pockets. Clarify. I'm not excusing myself, but at least I have the decency to stop this before it goes any further. You have no decency at all. She shoved her tumbled hair back. Fury, fueled by an acid guilt, turned her voice into a whip. Is this all just another game to you, Slater? Lure the daughter, wine and dine her, charm her into bed and see if she's as good as the mother? Did you place bets, calculate the odds? He took a moment before he answered. When he did, neither his face nor his voice revealed any of the clawing anger. You think I'm sleeping with Naomi? I know you are. I'm flattered. You're... What kind of man are you? You have no idea, Kelsey. None at all. I doubt very much you've come across my kind in that nice, comfortable little world of yours. He stepped forward, curling his hand around the back of her neck. It was a small, nasty way of paying her back. But he was feeling small, and he was feeling nasty. However stiff she held her spine, her body began to tremble. Take your hands off me. You like my hands on you, he said softly. Right now you're afraid, excited but afraid, and wondering what you would do if I'd drag you upstairs. Hell, why go to all that trouble when there's a floor right here? His voice was smooth and cool as cream, but there was a light in his eyes, a dangerous burn. What would you do, Kelsey, if I took you right here, right now? Fear clawed up her throat, shredding her voice. I said, take your hands off me. He could read the terror on her face. It was clear as a scream even when he released her and stepped back. It didn't quite fade, nor did the feeling of disgust that simmered inside him. I'll apologize for that, only for that. He studied her for a moment. The color he'd deliberately frightened out of her cheeks was coming back. 
You are quick to judge, Kelsey. Since you've made up your mind, we won't waste time discussing fact or fantasy. I'll take you home. Chapter 7 Naomi was tying the belt of her robe when she heard the front door slam. Surprised by the angry sound, she hesitated before going out into the hall. Was it her place, she wondered, to question Kelsey after an evening out? She had no precedent. If she'd lived through those teenage years with Kelsey, through the late-night talks, the arguments and worries, through the triumphs and tragedies of adolescence, she'd know. But she had no guideposts, only instincts. The sound of Kelsey's feet rushing up the stairs decided her. She opened her own door, certain she could keep the whole experience very casual. No prying, just a quick, how was your evening? One look at Kelsey's face erased all intentions. What happened? Before either of them could think, she moved forward to take Kelsey's arms. Are you all right? Still revving on temper, Kelsey went instantly on the attack. How can you associate with him, much less... God, you all but asked me to spend the evening with him. Gabe? Naomi's fingers tightened. She trusted Gabe implicitly, without question, but a small female dread curled in her gut. What did he do? He kissed me, Kelsey shot back. Her color flared at the ridiculously lame understatement of what had happened between them. Kissed you, Naomi repeated, while relief and amusement twined through her. And that's it? Don't you care? Frustrated, Kelsey jerked back. I'm telling you he kissed me. I kissed him back. We were groping at each other, and it wouldn't have stopped if I hadn't remembered. Out of your depth, Naomi, she thought. If they couldn't deal as mother to daughter, perhaps they could begin as woman to woman. Come in and sit down. I don't want to sit. But Kelsey followed Naomi into the bedroom. I do. Rearranging her thoughts, Naomi settled on the padded stool of her vanity table. Kelsey, I know you might still be raw from your divorce, but you are divorced and free to develop other relationships. Kelsey stopped her restless pacing and gaped. I'm free. This isn't about me. It's about you. Me? What's wrong with you? Now there was insult added to temper, insult that the woman who shared her blood could be so shallow. Don't you have any pride? Actually, Naomi said slowly, I've often been told I have too much, but I don't see how that applies at the moment. I'm telling you that your lover wanted to sleep with me and it doesn't apply? Naomi's mouth worked silently before she could get it around the words. My lover. God knows how you can let him touch you, Kelsey barreled on. You've known him for years and you must see what he is. Oh, he's attractive and he may be charming on the surface, but he has no scruples, no honor, no loyalties. Naomi's eyes flashed, her jaw stiffened. Who are you talking about? Slater. On the edge, it was all Kelsey could do to keep from screaming. Gabriel Slater, how many lovers do you have? Just one. Naomi folded her hands and drew a deep breath. And you think it's Gabe. After a moment's consideration, she began to smile. Then, to Kelsey's astonishment, she began to laugh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sure this isn't funny to you. Helpless, she pressed a hand to her stomach. But it's wonderful, really. I'm so flattered. Kelsey spoke through gritted teeth. He said the same thing. Did he? Chuckling, Naomi wiped a tear from her eye. You mean you actually asked him if he was sleeping with me? God, Kelsey, he's in his thirties. I'm nearly fifty. What difference does that make? She couldn't stop it. Naomi's smile spread like a sunbeam. Now I'm really flattered. Do you actually believe a gorgeous, God knows he's gorgeous, hot-blooded man like Gabe would be romantically interested in me? She studied Naomi as dispassionately as her mood allowed, taking in the classic features, the slim, elegant body in the simple white robe. I didn't say anything about romance, Kelsey said flatly. Oh. Naomi nodded, struggling to compose herself. Well, now, so you assume that Gabe and I are, what, engaged in a hot sexual affair? She pursed her lips. I'm feeling younger all the time. Before you bother to deny it, I'll say two things. Head high, Kelsey looked down at her mother. First, it's none of my business who you sleep with. 
You can have twenty lovers and it's none of my concern. Second, I heard you last night, in here, with him. Oh, Naomi blew out air. That is awkward. Awkward? The word all but exploded out of her mouth. This is awkward? Realizing she was going to have to be very clear and precise, Naomi lifted a hand. Let's handle your statements in order. First, despite what you think or have been told, I've never been promiscuous. You may not choose to believe me, but your father was my first lover. There was no one else until two years after I got out of prison. He's been my only lover since. She stood so they were eye to eye. If that's true, it's even worse. How can you not care that he would cheat on you this way? No man would cheat on me more than once, Naomi said in a tone Kelsey not only believed but understood. It wasn't Gabe you heard in here with me last night, Kelsey. It was Moses. She couldn't speak. It was impossible to ignore the truth when it was slapped so neatly across her face. Silently she sank to the bench herself. Moses? Your trainer? Yes, Moses, my trainer, my friend, and my lover. But Gabe, he's always touching you. To risk a cliché, we're very good friends. Gabe is, excepting Moses, my closest friend. I'm sorry you misunderstood. Jesus! Kelsey squeezed her eyes shut as everything she'd said rushed back to humiliate her. Oh, Jesus, no wonder he was so angry. The things I said. Risking rejection, Naomi brushed a hand over Kelsey's hair. I don't suppose you bothered to ask him. No. Her own words came back to her, stinging like bullets. No, I was so sure, and I was so ashamed that he'd made me forget myself, even for just a minute. I've never... With Wade, it was always... It doesn't matter, she said quickly. The point is, I jumped in with both feet and said some filthy things to him. You were in a difficult position. I'll call him and explain. No, I'll go over in the morning and apologize face to face. Hateful, isn't it, apologizing? Almost as bad as being wrong. It was always a chore to swallow pride. I'm sorry. There's no need where I'm concerned. You've walked into a world filled with strangers, Kelsey. You trusted your instincts. Whatever you did tonight, you did because you have a strong moral code, a finely developed sense of right and wrong. You're making excuses for me. I'm your mother, Naomi said quietly. Maybe we'll both get used to that in time. Go get some sleep. And if you don't want to face the lion in his den alone tomorrow, I'll go with you. But she went alone. It was a matter of self-respect. At first she thought she'd drive over, but that would be so quick. Despite lying restless most of the night, she had yet to come up with the exact words or tone she wanted to use. She decided to ask for a mount and clear both head and nerves with a ride from farm to farm. She found Moses rubbing liniment over the throat of a roan gelding. Foolishly, she found herself hesitating. How did she approach him now that she knew he was Naomi's lover? For the moment she just stood back and watched him. His hands were gentle, darkly tanned, wide at the palm. At his wrist he wore a bracelet of hammered copper. There was nearly as much gray as black in his braid. He had a distinctive face, though no one would have called it handsome, with its prominent nose and weather-scored skin. His body was tough and wiry, with little of the lithe, muscular grace of Gabe's. Hard to figure, isn't it? There was a touch of amusement in Moses's voice. He didn't have to turn for Kelsey to deduce it would be reflected in his eyes. Beautiful woman like her, rich, classy, and a half-breed runt like me. He set the liniment aside and reached for a bowl of watery gruel. Can't blame you for being surprised. Surprises me all the time. I'm sorry. Naomi figured she should let me know she told you about us. Wincing, Kelsey rubbed a hand over her face. How much more embarrassing could it possibly get? Mr. White Tree, Moses, let's make it Moses, considering the situation. Come on, boy. Murmuring, he urged the gruel on the gilding. Try a little now, just a little at a time. 
I fell in love with her when I first came to work here as a groom. She'd have been about 18 then. I'd never seen anything like her in all my life. Not that I expected her to look at me twice. Why should she? Kelsey watched him nurse the horse, saw the kindness, the strength, the simple sturdiness. I think I can see why. Making the gesture, she stepped into the box until they were shoulder to shoulder. What's wrong with him? King Cole here's got laryngitis. Laryngitis? Horses get laryngitis? How can you tell? See here? Taking her hand, Moses guided it over the throat. You can feel it swollen. Yes, poor thing. She made soothing noises as she rubbed gently. Is it serious? Can be. If it's severe, the air passage gets blocked and he can choke. You mean die? Alarmed, she pressed her cheek to the geldings. But it's just a sore throat. In you. In him it's different. But he's coming along, aren't you, fella? He can't take food yet, but gruel or some linseed tea. Tea for a horse, Kelsey thought. Shouldn't the vet see him? Not unless it worsens. We keep him warm, use eucalyptus inhalations, smear camphor on his tongue three, four times a day. He's not coughing any more, and that's a good sign. How much of the doctoring do you do yourself? We only call Matt in when we can't handle it. I thought a trainer trained. A trainer does everything. Sometimes it seems the horses are the least of it. You spend a day with me sometime, you'll see. I'd like that. It had been an offhand remark, nothing he'd expected her to pick up on. Thoughtful, he eyed her. I start before dawn. I know, and you probably don't want me tagging along. But I was wondering if there was something I could do while I'm here. Muck out stables or clean tack. I wouldn't expect to be trusted with the horses, but I hate doing nothing. Her mother's daughter, Moses mused. Well, they'd see. There's always something to do around here. When do you want to start? This afternoon. Maybe tomorrow. There's something I have to do this morning. Her mood shifted downward at the thought. I'd rather shovel manure than do it, but it can't be avoided. Come down when you're ready, then. I appreciate it. I wonder, is there a riding horse I could borrow this morning? I do know how to ride. You're Naomi's daughter. That means you know how to ride, and you don't have to ask for permission to take a horse. I'd rather ask. We'll saddle up justice then, he decided. He'd suit you. The roan gelding liked to run. He'd been retired for three years, but he had never accepted his lowered status as a riding mount. He was often used to pony a contender onto the track for the post parade, and though he preferred to run, he performed his duties with dignity. He'd never been a champion, as Moses explained to Kelsey, but neither had he been common, and he had finished steadily in the money throughout his career. She didn't care if he'd lost every race, not when he took her flying over the hills, his body running like an oiled engine beneath hers. He responded eagerly to the slightest pressure of her knees, moving from churning trot to fluid gallop, as happy as she to have the morning and the rising fields stretched out before them. This was a pleasure she realized she'd denied herself for too long, and one she wouldn't deny herself again, no matter how her muscles might ache later. Even when she left Three Willows, she'd find a way to indulge herself in this one delight. Maybe she'd give up her apartment entirely, move out of town. There was no reason she couldn't buy a small place of her own, and a horse. She might have to have it stabled, of course, but that could be arranged. If she absorbed enough from Moses, she could even work at a stable. She gulped in the cool wine of early spring, the smell of grass and young growing things. Why in the world did she ever think she had to stay in an office or gallery hour after hour when she could be outside doing something for the sheer joy of it? She shook back her hair and laughed as they sailed over a narrow creek and thundered up a rise. Then she reined in, spotting the spread of buildings below. Long shot. Leaning forward, she patted Justice's neck and studied the scene. The ride had done her a great deal of good, but it hadn't solved the essential problem. She still hadn't a clue how to approach Gabe. So we'll play it by ear, she muttered, and clucked Justice into a dignified trot. Gabe saw her come down the rise. He stayed where he was, by the fence, watching a yearling respond to the lunge. He wasn't any more calm than he'd been the evening before. 
Nor, he realized as she rode closer, so slim and straight and golden on the majestic thoroughbred, did he want her any less. He took another drag on his cigar, expelled smoke lazily, and waited. As she dismounted and walked the gelding toward Gabe, Kelsey supposed she had been more miserable, but past miseries never seem as huge as current ones. "'You ride well,' he commented. "'An old trooper like this takes a steady hand.' "'I usually have one. "'If you have a few minutes, I'd like to talk to you. "'Go ahead.' "'Why should he make it easy?' she asked herself, "'and swallowed another lump of pride. "'Privately, please.' "'Fine.' "'He took the reins and signaled a groom. "'Cool him off, Kip.' "'Yes, sir.' "'Kelsey lengthened her stride to keep up "'as Gabe turned away from the stables. "'You have a nice operation here. "'It all looks very similar to Three Willows. "'Want to talk shop?' "'No.' She let the attempt at small talk wither and die. I realize you're busy. I'll try not to take up much of your time. Then she closed her mouth and said nothing more until he slid open a glass door at the rear of the house. It opened into the tropics. Lushly blooming plants tumbled from pots and basked in the sunlight that streamed through the glass roof. A tiled pool glinted in the center, oval-shaped and invitingly blue. It's beautiful, She trailed a finger over a flashy red hibiscus. I guess we didn't get this far last night. Continuing the tour didn't seem appropriate. He sat on a striped lounge chair and stretched out his legs. This is private. She watched the smoke curl from the tip of his cigar toward the gently rotating fan suspended from the ceiling. I came to apologize. Nothing, absolutely nothing, tasted less palatable. He merely arched a brow. For my behavior last evening. As if considering, he tapped out his cigar in a silver bucket of sand. You demonstrated varied behavior last evening. Can you be more specific? She rose helplessly to the bait. You're hateful, Slater. Cold, arrogant, and hateful. That's quite an apology, Kelsey. I did apologize. I came over here choking on it, but I apologized... You don't even have the decency to accept it. As you pointed out last night, I'm lacking in decency. Lazily, he crossed his ankles. I'm to assume from this sudden turnabout that you confronted Naomi and she set you straight? Her only defense was to angle her chin. You could have denied it. Would you have believed me? No. Infuriated all over again, she whirled away from him. But you could have denied it. You have to be able to see what it felt like to believe what I believed and to find myself... What? Crawling all over you. She all but spat the words as she spun around. I won't deny it. I jumped right into your arms. I didn't think, couldn't think. I'm not proud of it, but I won't pretend it was one-sided. I have needs, too, and urges, and damn it, I'm not cold. He wasn't sure which surprised him most the sudden vehemence of her last statement, or the tears glittering in her eyes. I'm the last one you'd have to convince of that. Why in hell would you have to convince yourself? Appalled, she fought back the tears. That's not the point, she said. The point is I made an enormous mistake. I said things to you that you didn't deserve and that I regret. She dragged both hands through her hair, then let them fall. God, Gabe... I thought you'd been in her room the night before I'd heard... Moses, he finished. She shut her eyes, sighed. The fool's always the last to know. I thought it was you, and the idea that you'd go from her to me, that I'd let you... She trailed off again. I'm sorry. She looked so lovely, the sun gilding her hair, regret darkening her eyes. He nearly sighed himself. You know... I really wanted to stay pissed off at you. I figured it was going to be easy, and Christ knows safer. He pushed out of the chair. You look tired, Kelsey. I had a lousy night. Me too. He reached up to touch her cheek, but she stepped back. Don't, okay? I feel like an idiot saying it. More than an idiot knowing it, but I'm in a vulnerable state right now, and you seem to set me off. He bit back a groan. 
I appreciate your sharing that with me, darling. It's sure to help me sleep at night. Don't touch me, Gabe. I might start crawling all over you again. She had to smile. Something like that. Why don't we start this whole business from the top? She offered a hand. Friends? He looked down at her hand, then back into her eyes. I don't think so. Watching her, he edged closer. Listen. She could already feel the heat moving up from her toes. I don't want to get involved. It's lousy timing for me. Cautious, she took a step back. Too bad. I'm real pleased with the timing myself. I'm telling you. She stepped back again, met empty air. Kelsey caught the grin in his eyes seconds before she hit the water. It was pleasantly cool, but no less of a shock. She surfaced, dragging wet hair out of her eyes. You bastard! I didn't push you. Thought about it, but didn't. Helpfully, he offered a hand to haul her out. Her eyes lit. She grasped it, tugged. She might as well have pulled at a redwood. Don't bluff, Kelsey. He simply released her hand and sent her under again. This time she took it philosophically and dragged herself over the side, sat. Nice pool. I like it. He sat cross-legged beside her. Come back sometime. Take a real swim. I might just do that. It's almost better in the winter. You can feel smug watching the snow fall outside. I bet. Idly, she wrung out her hair, then flicked water in his face. Gotcha. He merely took her hand, pressed the wet palm to his lips, and watched her eyes go smoky. Gotcha, he echoed. She scrambled up while her heart flailed around in her chest. I've got to get back. You're wet. It's warm enough out. She resisted, barely, the urge to retreat again when he unfolded his legs and rose. A textbook spring day. He wondered if she had any idea how desirable she was, flustered with nerves. I'll drive you back. No, really, I want to ride. I'd almost forgotten how much I enjoy it. I want to take advantage of it while I'm here and... She pressed a hand to her jittery stomach. Oh, God, I've got to stay away from you. Not a chance. He hooked a finger in the waistband of her jeans and jerked her an inch closer. I want you, Kelsey. Sooner or later, I'm going to have you. She forced a breath in and out. Maybe. He grinned. Place your bets. And released her. I'll get you a jacket down at the stables. She got out fast. Ten minutes later, she was galloping back toward Three Willows. Gabe waited until she disappeared over the first rise before he turned away. Fine-looking filly, that! The voice was like a twisting knife in his side, a sneak attack impossible to defend against. But he didn't startle easily. Gabe's face was a neutral mask as he looked at his father. Not much change, he noted. Rich Slater still had style. Maybe it leaned towards snake oil salesmen, but it was style nonetheless. He was a big man, broad through the shoulders, long through the arms. His natty gabardine suit was just a little snug around the chest. His shoes shone like mirrors, and his hair, glossily black, was trimmed under a snappy gray fedora. He'd always been striking, and had used his looks, the stunning blue eyes, the quick smile, to charm the unwary. Nearly six years had passed since Gabe had seen him, but he knew what signs to look for. The lines etched deep that no amount of pampering or praying could smooth out. The broken capillaries, the overbright sparkle in the eye. Rich Slater was exactly as he'd been six years earlier, and for most of his life, drunk. What the fuck do you want? Now, nah, is that any way to greet your old man? Rich laughed heartily and as if Gabe had tossed out the red carpet, wrapped his arms around his son. There was the unmistakable scent of whiskey under the peppermint on his breath. It was a combination that had always turned Gabe's stomach. I asked what you wanted. Just came by to see how you're doing, son. He slapped Gabe on the back before he leaned away. He didn't sway, didn't totter. Rich Slater could hold his drink, he liked to say. Until the second bottle, and there was always a second bottle. You done it this time, Gabe. Hit the jackpot. No more shooting craps and alleys for you, hey, son? Gabe took Rich by the arm and pulled him aside. How much? Though his eyes flashed once, he feigned hurt. 
Now, Gabe, can a father come visit his own flesh and blood without you thinking I'm after a handout? I'm doing fine, I'll have you know. Built me up a stake out west. Been playing the horses just like you. He laughed again, all the while judging and calculating the worth around him. But I wouldn't like settling down your way. You know me, boy, got to keep foot loose. He took out a cigarette, snapped a gold-plated lighter he'd had monogrammed at the mall. So who was a sexy blonde? Always had an eye for the ladies, he winked. And they always had an eye for you, just like your old man. Even the thought of it had Gabe's blood boiling. How much do you want this time? I told you, not a dime. Not a dime, Rich thought as he looked toward the near paddock where the yearling was still being worked. A man could make a splash with a couple of horses like that. A real splash. No, he didn't want a dime. He wanted a great deal more. Fine horse, that. I recollect how you used to pay more attention to the horses at the track than the game. And whenever he had, Gabe remembered, he'd been treated to the back of his father's big hand. I don't have time to discuss my horses with you. I have work to do. When a man makes a score like you've done here, he doesn't need to work. Or to sweat, Rich thought bitterly, or to hustle for petty cash. But I'm not going to hold you up, no indeed. Thing is, I'm planning on being in the area a while, looking up some old friends. He smiled as he blew out smoke. Since I'm going to be in the neighborhood, I wouldn't say no to spending a few days in that fancy house of yours. Have a nice visit. I don't want you in my house. I don't want you on my land. Rich's easy smile dimmed. Too good for me now, are you? Is that it? Got yourself all dolled up now and don't want to be reminded where you come from? You're an alley cat, Gabe. He jabbed a finger into his son's chest. You always will be. Don't matter if you live in a fine house and fuck fancy women. You're still a stray. You forget who put a roof over your head, food in your belly? I haven't forgotten sleeping in doorways or going hungry because you'd gotten drunk and lost every penny my mother had slave for. He didn't want to remember. He hated that the memories dogged him like his own shadow. I haven't forgotten sneaking out of some stinking room in the middle of the night because we didn't have the rent money. There's a lot I haven't forgotten. She died in a charity ward, coughing up blood. I haven't forgotten that. I did my best by your mother. Your best sucked. Now how much is it going to cost me to make you disappear? I need a place to stay. His nerves were taking over, bringing a whine to his voice. Unable to help himself, he reached for the flask in his back pocket. Just for a few days. Not here. Nothing about you is going to touch this place. Christ almighty. He took a long drink than another. I'll tell you straight, I got some trouble, a little misunderstanding about a game in Chicago. I was working it with this other guy and he got sloppy. You got caught cheating and now somebody's looking to blow off your kneecaps. You're a cold-blooded son of a bitch. The flask was from the second bottle. Rich was working through it quickly. Yo me, and don't you forget it. I just need to lay low for a few weeks till it cools off. Not here. You're just going to kick me out, let them kill me? Oh, yeah. Gabe studied his father with a humorless smile. But I'll give you an even chance. Five thousand ought to help you go to ground and keep you there. Rich looked around the farm, the well-tended buildings, the glossy horses. He was never too drunk not to calculate his take. It isn't enough. It'll have to be. Keep away from the house and my horses. I'll go write you a check. Rich tipped up the flask again while Gabe strode away. It wasn't enough, he thought, as the whiskey turned to bitterness in his blood. The boy had hit the big time, and all he wanted was a piece of the action. And he'd get it, Rich promised himself. He'd given the boy a chance. Now they'd play out the game another way. Chapter 8 It was foolish to be nervous. Yet Philip continued to check his watch between sips of white wine. Kelsey wasn't late. He was early. It was even more foolish to think she might have changed in some way during the two weeks she had been gone. That she might look at him differently somehow, or find him lacking, as he'd found himself lacking when he'd watched the woman he'd once loved taken away to prison. There was nothing he could have done, and no matter how many times he'd told himself that, the words rang hollow. The guilt had eaten at him for years, soothed only by the care and love he'd given his daughter. Yet even now, two decades later, 
He could see Naomi's face as it had looked the last time he'd seen her. It was a six-hour drive from Washington to Alderson, West Virginia, six hours to travel from the tidy, civilized world of university life to the gray and bitter reality of a federal facility. Both were regimented, both cloistered for their own purposes, but one was fueled by hope and energy, the other by despair and anger. No matter how he'd prepared himself, it had been a shock to see Naomi, vivid, arrogantly alive Naomi, behind the security screen. The months between her arrest and her sentencing had taken their toll. Her body had lost its subtle feminine roundness, so she'd appeared angular and bony in the shapeless prison uniform. Everything had been gray. Her clothes, her eyes, her face. It had taken every ounce of will inside him to meet her silent, steady gaze. Naomi. He felt foolish in his suit and tie, his starched collar. I was surprised you wanted to see me. Needed to. You learn quickly in here that what you want is rarely a consideration. She was three weeks into her sentence, and for the sake of her sanity had already stopped crossing off days on her mental calendar. I appreciate your coming, Philip. I realize you must be dealing with a lot of backlash right now. I hope it won't affect your position at the university. No, he said it flatly. I assume your attorneys will appeal. I'm not hopeful. She folded her hands, linking her fingers tight to keep them from moving. Hope was another weight on her sanity that she'd coldly dispatched. I asked you to come here, Philip, because of Kelsey. He said nothing, couldn't. One of his deepest fears was that she would ask him to arrange for Kelsey to visit, to bring his child into this place. She had a right. He knew in his heart she had a right to see her child, and he knew in his heart he would fight her to the last breath to keep Kelsey from the horror of it. How is she? She's fine. She's spending a day or two at my mother's so I could make the trip. I'm sure Millicent's delighted to have her. The sarcasm whipped back into her voice. The ache crept back into her heart. Determined to finish what she'd begun, Naomi banished both. I assume you haven't explained to her as yet where I am. No, it seems... No, she believes you're visiting someone far away for a while. Well, a ghost of a smile flitted around her mouth. I am far away, aren't I? Naomi, she's only a child. However unfair, he would use her love for Kelsey... I haven't found the right way to tell her. I hope in time to... I'm not blaming you, Naomi interrupted. She leaned closer, the shadows under her eyes mocking him. I'm not blaming you, she repeated, for any of this. What happened to us, Philip? I can't see where it all started to go wrong. I've tried. I think if I could pinpoint one thing... One time, one event, it would be so much easier to accept everything that happened after... But I can't. She squeezed her eyes shut, waiting until she was sure she could speak without a tremor in her voice. I can't see what went wrong, but I can see so many things that went right. Kelsey, especially Kelsey. I think of her all the time. Pity, the overwhelming weight of it, smothered him. She asks about you. Naomi looked away then, around the drab visiting room. Someone nearby was weeping, but tears were as much a part of this place as the air. She studied the walls, the guards, the locks, especially the locks. I don't want her to know I'm here. It wasn't what he'd expected from her. Off balance, he fumbled between gratitude and protest. Naomi, I've thought this through very carefully, Philip. I have plenty of time to think now. I don't want her to know they took away everything and put me in a cage. She drew a deep, steadying breath. It won't take long for the scandal to die down. I've been out of your circle for nearly a year as it is. Memories are short. By the time she goes to school, I doubt there'll be much more than a murmur, if that, about what happened in Virginia. That may be, but it hardly deals with now. I can't just tell her you've disappeared, Naomi, and expect her to accept it. She loves you. Tell her I'm dead. My God, Naomi, I can't do that. You can. Suddenly intense, 
She pressed a hand to the security screen. For her sake, you can. Listen to me. Do you want her to visualize her mother in a place like this, locked up for murder? Of course I don't want it. She can't be expected to understand, much less cope with it at her age, but... But, Naomi agreed. Her eyes were alive again, passionate, burning. In a few years she'll understand, and she'll have to live with it. If I can do anything for her, Philip, I can spare her from that. Think, she insisted. Think. She could be eighteen by the time I get out. All her life she'll have pictured me here. Would she feel obligated to come here herself to see me? I don't want her here. The tears came then, breaking through the dam of self-control. I can't bear it, even the thought of her coming here, seeing me like this. What would it do to her? How would it damage her? I tell you, I won't take that chance. Let me protect her from this, Philip. Dear God, let me do this one last thing for her. He reached out so that their fingertips met through the iron mesh. I can't stand to see you in here. Could any of us bear to see her sit where you are? No, he couldn't. But to tell her you're dead, we can't predict what that would do to her, or how any of us would live with the lie. Not so big a lie. She drew her fingers back, stemmed the tears. Part of me is dead. The rest wants to survive, quite desperately wants to survive. I don't think I could if she knew. She'll be hurt, Philip. She'll grieve. But you'll be there for her. In a few years, she'll barely remember me. Then she won't remember me at all. Can you live with that? I'll have to. I won't contact her or interfere in any way. I won't ask you to visit me here again, nor will I see you if you come. I'll be dead to her and to you. She braced herself. Their time was almost up. I know how much you love her and the kind of man you are. You'll give her a good life, a happy one. Don't scar it by making her face this. Please promise me. And when you're released? We'll deal with that when it happens. Ten to fifteen years, Philip. It's a long time. Yes. It made his stomach not to imagine it. What, he thought, would it do to a child? All right, Naomi, for Kelsey's sake. Thank you. She rose then, fighting nausea. Goodbye, Philip. Naomi. But she walked straight to the guard, through the door that clanged shut behind her. She hadn't looked back. Dad? Kelsey put her hand on Philip's shoulder and gave it a little shake. What century are you in? Flustered, he rose. Kelsey, I didn't see you come in. You wouldn't have seen a fleet of Mack trucks come in. She kissed him, drew back, then with a laugh kissed him again. It's good to see you. Let me look at you. Did she seem happier, he wondered, more settled? The thought caused a quick, ungenerous tug of war inside him. I can't have changed that much in two weeks. Just tell me if you feel as good as you look. I feel great. She slipped into a chair and waited for him to settle across from her. The country air, I suppose. Someone else's cooking and manual labor. Labor? You're working on the farm? Only in the most menial of capacities. She smiled up at the waitress. A glass of champagne. Nothing else for me, thank you. Philip looked back at his daughter. Are you celebrating? Pride took his race at Santa Anita today. Kelsey was still flushed with pleasure at the win. I muck out his stall when he's at Three Willows, so I feel some part of responsibility for the victory. In May, Virginia's pride is going to take the derby. She winked. That's a sure thing. Philip sipped his wine, hoping it would open his throat. I didn't realize you'd become so involved with the horses. They're wonderful. She took the glass the waitress set in front of her, lifted it in a toast. To pride, the most gorgeous male I've ever seen. On four legs, anyway. She let the bubbles explode on her tongue. So, tell me, how is everyone? I thought Candace would be with you. I suppose she understood that I wanted you to myself for a couple of hours. She sends her love, of course. And Channing, he has a new girl. Of course he does. What happened to the philosophy major? He claimed she talked him to death. He met this one at a party. 
She designs jewelry and wears black sweaters. She's a vegetarian. That ought to last about five minutes. Channing can't go much longer than that without a burger. Candace is certainly counting on that. She finds Victoria, ah, uh, that's her name, unsettling. Well, Kelsey opened her menu and skimmed. She wouldn't find anyone settling right now where Channing's concerned. He's still her baby. The most difficult thing any parent ever does is let go. That's why most of us just don't. He covered her hand with his. I've missed you. I haven't really gone anywhere. I wish you wouldn't worry so much. Old habit. Kelsey, he tightened his grip on her hand. I asked you to have dinner with me for a couple of reasons. I'm not sure you won't find one of them unpleasant, but I felt you'd prefer to hear it from me. She stiffened. You said everyone was all right. Yes. It's about Wade, Kelsey. He's announced his engagement. He felt her hand go limp. Apparently it's to be a small wedding in a month or two. I see. Odd, she thought, that there should still be so much emotion to swirl and collide inside her. Well, that was quick work. She hissed out a breath, annoyed by the edginess of her own tone. Stupid of me to resent it even for a minute. Human, I'd say. However long you were separated, the divorce is barely final. That was just a paper. I know that. The marriage ended in Atlanta more than two years ago. She picked up her glass, considered the wine bubbling inside. I was going to be civilized and wish him the best. Nope. She drank deeply. I hope she makes his life hell. Now, I think I'll try the blackened redfish. I feel like something with a little bite to it. Are you going to be all right? I'm going to be fine. I am fine. She closed her menu. After they'd given their order, she found herself smiling at her father. Were you afraid I'd throw a tantrum? I thought you might need a shoulder to cry on. I can always use your shoulder, Dad, but I'm finished crying over what's done. Maybe working, really working for a living's changing my outlook. You've been working for years, Kelsey, since you graduated from high school. I've been playing at jobs for years. None of them mattered to me. And this does. Mucking out stalls matters to you. The snap in his voice warned her. She chose her words carefully. I suppose I feel a part of a system there. It's not simply one race or one horse. There's a continuity, and everyone has a part in it. Some of it's tedious, some of it's rushed, and it's all repetitive. But every morning it's new. I can't explain it. And he would never understand it. All he knew at that moment was that she sounded so much like Naomi. I'm sure it's exciting for you, different. It is, but it's also soothing and demanding. Might as well get it done, she told herself, and she continued quickly. I'm thinking of giving up my apartment. Giving it up? And what, moving permanently to Three Willows? Not necessarily. Why did it have to hurt him, she wondered, then sighed. Why had it hurt her to hear Wade was about to remarry? That hasn't been discussed. But I've been giving some thought to moving out to the country. I like seeing trees out my window, Dad, seeing land instead of the next building. And I enjoy very much what I'm doing now. I'd like to keep doing it, see if I'm good at it. Naomi's influencing you. Kelsey, you can't let these kinds of impulses seduce you into rushing from one way of life to another. You can't possibly understand the world you're toying with after so short a time. No, I can't claim to understand it fully, but I want to. She held back as their salads were served. And I want to understand her. You can't expect me to walk away from her until I do. I'm not asking you to walk away, but I am asking you not to leap in without considering all the consequences. There's more than the romance of a horse at dawn or that last gallop over the finish line. There's ruthlessness, cruelty, ugliness, violence. And it's as much a part of who I am as the smell of books in the university library. Why, it's Kelsey, isn't it? Naomi's lovely daughter. Bill Cunningham sauntered over, a drink from the lounge in one hand, his diamond horseshoe winking on the other. No mistake in that face. Perfect timing, she thought, and forced a smile. Hello, Bill. Dad, this is Bill Cunningham, an associate of Naomi's. Bill, my father, Philip Biden. Well, I'll be goddamned, it's been years. 
Bill stuck out a hand. Don't believe I've seen you since the day you snatched Naomi out from under my nose. Teacher, aren't you? Yes. With the coolness he reserved for careless students, Philip nodded. I'm a professor at Georgetown University. Big time, Bill grinned, laying a hand on Kelsey's shoulder for a quick, intimate squeeze. You got yourself a real beauty here, Phil. It's a pure pleasure seeing her around the track. Heard your mama's top three-year-old outdistanced the field at Santa Anita today. Yes, we're very pleased. Things are going to shake down different in Kentucky. Don't let her talk you into laying your paycheck on Three Willis Colt, Phil. I got me the winner. You give your mama a kiss for me, honey. I got to get back to the bar, little meeting. As he walked away, Kelsey picked up her salad fork and began to eat with every appearance of interest. That's the kind of person you want to associate with? Dad, you sound like grandmother. Standards, Kelsey, never lower your standards. But Philip didn't smile. Dad, the man's an idiot, very similar to the pompous, blustering idiots I've run into at the university. In advertising, at galleries, you can't escape them. I remember him, Philip said stiffly. There were rumors that he bribed jockeys to lose or to deliberately force another horse onto the rail. She frowned and shoved the salad aside. So add sleazy to pompous and blustering. He's still an idiot and not someone I intend to cultivate a friendship with. He runs in the same circle as your mother. Parallel lanes, perhaps. There's a great deal I don't know about her or trust about her at this point, but I do know that Three Willows is more than a farm to her. The horse is more than business assets. It's her life. It always was. I'm sorry. Kelsey reached out helplessly to take his hands. I'm sorry that she hurt you. I'm sorry that what I'm doing now has brought all that hurt back. I'm asking you to trust me to look at the whole, to make my own choices. I need a goal in my life, Dad. I may have found it. He was afraid she had, and that when she reached it, he would no longer recognize her. Just promise me you'll take more time, Kelsey. Don't commit to anything or to anyone without more time. All right, she hesitated. You haven't asked about her? I was working up to it, Philip admitted. I wanted your impressions. She seems very young. She has this incredible will of energy. I've seen her start at dawn and keep going until after dark. Naomi loved to socialize. I'm speaking of work, Kelsey corrected. She never socializes. At least she hasn't since I've been there. To tell you the truth, with all the work, I don't see how anyone would have the strength left to party. She's usually in bed before ten. No point, she thought, in mentioning that Naomi wasn't always sleeping alone. She's very controlled, very contained. Naomi? Controlled? Contained? Yes. She paused, waiting while their entrees were served. I take it she wasn't always, but that's exactly how I'd describe her now. How do you feel about her? I don't know. I'm grateful she isn't forcing the issue. You surprise me. Patience was never part of her makeup. I suppose people can change. I may not understand her, but I do admire her. She knows what she wants, and she works for it. And what does she want? I'm not sure, Kelsey murmured. But she is. From the shadows of the bar, Cunningham watched Kelsey and her father talk over their meal. Pretty picture, he thought, all dignity and class. He rattled the ice in his bourbon. Quite a looker, Rich Slater said from beside him. Something familiar about her. He laughed, carefully pacing himself with his own drink. It wouldn't do to muddle his thinking just now. I guess there's something familiar about all beautiful young women after a man passes a certain age. Naomi Chadwick's daughter, spit an image of her. Naomi Chadwick. Rich's eyes gleamed with pleasure and with bitter memory. He was here, after all, to dredge up memories and to profit by them. There's a filly a man doesn't forget. My son's neighbor now. Small world. He enjoyed another swallow of whiskey. Quality stuff, since Cunningham was buying. You know, I think I saw her around the boy's place a couple of weeks ago. He'd have his eye on her if I know Gabe. He's been cozy with the mother. Guess it follows he'd be cozy with the daughter. 
and Gabe Slater wouldn't have had the chance to be cozy with either, Cunningham thought now, if it hadn't been for a hand of cards. Things would be different. Things were going to be different. If he plays his cards right, Cunningham continued, picking at his own scab, he could erase the border between the farms. Rich eyed Kelsey with more interest. So his son was making time with the ice bitch's daughter. That would be something he could use. Now, wouldn't that be something? That kind of merger would make them the top outfit in the state, I'd say. They might. Cunningham lifted one finger, signaling another round. Wouldn't care for it myself. I'd just as soon see that connection shaking a bit. He reached into the nut bowl, popped three into his mouth. Casual, he told himself. Keep it casual. It wouldn't do for Rich Slater to know just how much he was banking on the deal. Now, this business we're talking about, it might just accomplish that in the long term. Calculating, Rich admired the diamond ring on Cunningham's finger. And would that extra benefit be worth an appropriate bonus? It would? Well, now, let's just see what we can do about that. He shot Kelsey another look. We'll just see what we can do. I'm going to need those traveling expenses, Billy boy. Reaching inside his jacket, Cunningham took out an envelope. He slipped it into Rich's eager hands under the bar. The unsettling sense of deja vu had him glancing over his shoulder. Count it later. No need, no need at all. You and me go back a ways, Billy. I trust you. Once the envelope was safely tucked away, he lifted his glass again. And may I say it's a pleasure doing business with you again? Here's to old times. By noon the next day, Kelsey was concentrating on her lesson on the lunge line. The five year old mare on the other end was patient and knew a great deal more about the process than she did. It wasn't the horse being trained, but Kelsey. Bring her to a trot. Change her direction, Moses demanded. The girl had potential, he'd decided. She wanted to learn, therefore she would. She'll do anything you want. You get a yearling in there, he won't be so accommodating. Then give me a yearling, she called back and flipped her whip. I can handle it. Keep dreaming. But perhaps in a few weeks he'd assign her one, if she was still around. She had good hands, he mused, a good voice, quick reflexes. How long has she been at it? Naomi asked. About thirty minutes. Naomi rested a boot on the lowest fence rail. Both Kelsey and the mare still look fresh. They've both got stamina. I appreciate your taking the time to teach her, Moses. That's no hardship, except I think she's got her eye on my job. She laughed, then saw he wasn't quite joking. Do you really think she's that interested in training? Every time I spend an hour with her, I feel like a sponge that's been wrung dry. The girl never quits asking questions. I made the mistake of giving her one of my breeding books a few days ago. When she came back with it, she all but gave me a goddamn quiz. Pumped me about blood factors, dominant and co-dominant alleles. Did you pass? Just. I used to watch you do this. Grinning, he tugged on his earlobe. Ah, the fantasies. A man without fantasies is a man without a soul. I had a hell of a soul where you were concerned. You still do. I'll prove it to you later. Here comes Matt. I didn't know you'd sent for the vet. I didn't. Naomi ran her tongue around her teeth. He said he was in the neighborhood and thought he'd stop in to check out that case of sore shins. Moses glanced back at Kelsey. Ah, the fantasies, he thought again. Yeah, right. Smothering a laugh, Naomi welcomed the vet. Well, Matt, what's the verdict? She's doing fine. A blister's not necessary. Nice of you to take the time to stop by, Moses commented. I was over at Longshot. One of his colts was injured. Serious? Naomi asked. Could have been. A puncture. It was small, easily overlooked. There was a lot of infection. He kept his eyes on Kelsey as he spoke, admiring. I had to lance it. Too bad. Jameson said the horse was supposed to ship off to Hialeah tomorrow. Three aces? Instantly sympathetic, Naomi laid a hand on Matt's arm. Gabe was going down with him. That horse has been running like a dream. They'll both be staying home for now. I'll give Gabe a call later. Try to cheer him up. He could use it. 
Matt switched his attention back to Kelsey. Everyone seems healthy around here. When Kelsey acknowledged him with a quick wave, he grinned. She looks like she's been doing that all her life. When Moses took pity on him and signaled Kelsey to stop, she walked the horse over to the fence. She's so sweet-natured. She rubbed her cheek against the mare's. I wish you'd give me a brat, Moses, so I could feel I was accomplishing something. All journeys begin with one step. We'll see how many more you take before you trip. He's always boosting my confidence. She tipped back the cotton cap she wore. Well, Matt, is this a professional or a social visit? A mix. I had to stop in at Longshot. Oh? As casually as possible, Kelsey led the mare out of the paddock. Problem? An injury. He repeated his explanation. But three aces looked wonderful the last time I saw him run. When did it happen? From the look of it, three or four days ago. He ran at Charlestown three days ago, won by a full length. Frowning, she stroked the mare. A puncture. About the size of a sixpenny nail, just above the fetlock. How does that happen? Could have happened in transport, some sharp edge. That's likely. Unlikely it was deliberate. You mean that someone might have injured the colt so he couldn't run, or worse? Unlikely, Matt repeated. It wasn't that serious. How do you treat it? She listened carefully as he spoke of lancing and antiseptics, the difference between punctures and tears. See what I mean, Moses muttered to Naomi. She'll be cramming veterinary books next. His eyes narrowed as he looked toward the stables. Expecting anyone? No. Naomi pursed her lips and studied the young man approaching. Lean, narrow-shouldered, pretty face, Levi's and a sweatshirt. Ordinary enough, she mused, but the boots gave him away. They would have cost a cool three hundred. Anyone know the cowboy? Hmm? Curious, Kelsey turned, then let out a shout of pleasure. Channing! She raced forward, cracking Matt's heart when she threw her arms around the young man. What are you doing here? I thought I'd check the place out before I head down to Lauderdale, spring rake. Haven't you outgrown that yet? Outgrown girls in bikinis? I don't think so. Man, look at you. You look like an ad for country living. He slung an arm around her shoulders and glanced at the trio by the fence. Don't tell me that's your mother. That's Naomi. Come on, I'll introduce you. She kept her arm around his waist. Channing, this is Naomi Chadwick. Moses Whitetree and Matt Gunner, Channing Osborne, my stepbrother. Welcome to Three Willows. Naomi extended a hand, amused and charmed when Channing brought it to his lips. Kelsey's told me about you. Only the good parts, I hope. You got a great place here. Thanks. I'll give you a tour. I hope you can stay a while. I'm loose. Unable to resist, he reached over the fence to stroke a hand down the mare's nose. Just heading down to Florida for a week or so. To Oglo Coeds, Kelsey put in. Channing's in pre med, so he calls it anatomy lessons. He grinned and reached up to scratch the mayor's ears. Hey, youth is fleeting. Ask anyone. Am I breaking something up? Not at all, Naomi assured him. You're just in time for lunch. Matt, you'll join us, won't you? Wish I could. I've got to get over to the Bartlett farm. One of their foals is colicky. Hey, you're a vet? Channing perked up. I always thought it would be cool to treat animals. They don't complain as much as people, right? He added quickly when Kelsey shot him a surprised look. There's that, but people don't generally bite and kick. I'll take a rain check, Naomi. Thanks. Kelsey, good to see you again. Nice to meet you. I'll walk you up. Kelsey, bring Channing along when you're ready. If I know you, you're ready now. Want to take that tour after eat? <laughs> Sounds good to me. I didn't know you were interested in animal medicine. He shrugged, embarrassed. Just in passing, it's a kid thing. They began to walk slowly. I remember you wanting to save birds when they bashed into the picture window. And that old flea bag mutt you brought home one time with a limp? Yeah, he smiled, but the humor didn't reach his eyes. Mom put the skids on that, off to the pound. I guess he walked the last mile on three legs. I'd forgotten that. She laid her head against his shoulder. She was afraid he'd turn. He must have been a hundred years old. He wasn't a pure blood, Channing corrected, then shrugged. No big deal. She could never handle animals around the house with her allergies. 
Besides, like I said, it was a kid thing. Why hadn't she ever heard that resigned tone in his voice before, she wondered. Maybe she hadn't listened to it. Do you want to be a doctor, Channing? Family tradition, he said easily. I never thought about being anything else. Oh, except for an astronaut when I was six. Osborne men are surgeons, and that's that. Candace would never push you into doing something if she knew your heart wasn't in it. With a half laugh, Channing stopped and looked at her. Kells, you were 18 when they got married, and you had one foot out the door. Mom runs things. She does it subtly, and she does it well. But me and the prof, we pretty much do what we're told. You're angry with her over something. What is it? Hell, she yanked the allowance from my trust fund because I balked at taking a full course load this summer. I wanted to work, you know, get a taste of the real world. I had a construction gig lined up, you know, so I could wear a hard hat and make rude kissing noises at the secretaries who walked by at lunchtime. I just wanted a couple of months away from the books. That sounds reasonable enough. Maybe if I talk to her for you. No, she's not too happy with you at the moment either. This business, he said, gesturing to encompass the farm. She sees it as a strain on the prof. The magnificent Millicent is feeding that little neurosis. Kelsey blew out a breath. So, we're in the same boat. Listen, are you really set on Lauderdale and bikinis? If you're going to suggest that I go home, kiss and make up, no, I was going to suggest that you spend spring break here. I don't think Naomi would object if you hung out with me and the horses. Playing big sister? Yeah, got a problem with it? No. He leaned down and kissed her forehead. Thanks, Kills. Chapter 9 The groom's name was Mick. He'd been born and bred in Virginia, and liked to boast that he'd forgotten more about horses than most people ever learned. It might have been true. Certainly throughout his fifty-odd years as a race tracker, he'd tried every aspect of the game. In the early years, he'd risen from stable boy to exercise boy. He often boasted of how he'd gotten up on horses for Mr. Cunningham during the man's heyday. Before he'd hit twenty, he'd still been small and light enough to jockey. Though he'd never moved from apprentice to journeyman, he'd worn the silks. He didn't like people to forget it. For a short, unmemorable time, he'd bluffed his way into the trainer's position at a small farm in Florida. He'd even owned a gelding for a year, or at least fifteen percent of one. Maybe the horse had never lived up to his potential, proving himself to be nothing more than a morning glory who worked out fast and raced slow. But Mick had been an owner, and that was the important thing. He'd come back to Cunningham's when he'd heard the farm had changed hands. His position as groom satisfied him, particularly since Gabriel Slater had the look of a winner, and always had in Mick's memory. He enjoyed the fact that the younger hands often deferred to him. They might have called him Peacock behind his back, because he always sported a bright blue cap and tended to strut, but it was done with affection. His thin, lined face was known at every track from Santa Anita to Pimlico. That was just the way Mick wanted it. Track slow, Boggs commented, and meticulously rolled a cigarette. Mick nodded. The hard morning rain had tapered off to an incessant drizzle, and that was fine. Slater's double or nothing shone on a muddy track. It was the slow time between workout and post. Mick sat under an overhang, watching the rain drip from the eaves and thinking about the ten dollars burning a hole in his pocket. He figured to put it on Double's nose and watch it grow. He pulled out a crumpled pack of Marlboros to join Boggs in a smoke. It was quiet. The jockeys would be in their quarters or taking a steam to sweat off one more pound before post time. The trainers would be poring over the books, and the owners huddled inside enjoying the dry warmth and coffee. There was little activity around the shed row, but it would liven up again soon. Funny seeing Miss Naomi's girl around, Mick said conversationally. She rode over to Longshot a couple of weeks ago, rode off again soaking wet. Boggs nodded, blew out smoke. Heard. She was up on that roan gelding of yours. Handled him fine. Rides like her mother. Makes a picture. They sat, two lifelong bachelors, and smoked in silence. A full five minutes passed before Mick spoke again. Somebody else came by the barn that day. Yeah. 
Boggs wouldn't ask who. It wasn't the way they communicated. Haven't seen him around for a while, but I recognized him all right. He tossed the minute stub of his cigarette into a puddle and watched it sizzle out. Forgot his connection with the man till I seen them together. Hit me then all right. I remember when Mr. Slater was working as a stable boy for Mr. Cunningham. Yup, about fifteen years ago. Came over to Three Willers after. Stayed a time. Year or two. Hard worker. Didn't chew year off. Still doesn't say nothing, lest it's supposed to be said. Always was a loner. He chuckled a bit. Never did think I'd be working for him. Made something of himself. That he did. Lots wouldn't think he could have done it, the way he used to hang around and hustle up card games. Just another track rat, they'd figure. But I knew different. Always liked the boy myself. Boggs rubbed at a bruise on his forearm where a yearling had dipped him. Had a look about him. Still does. Yeah, I was there the day Lipsky tried to stick him. Didn't say no more than he had to then, either. Boggs spat on the wet ground, more an assessment of Lipsky than out of necessity. Man's got no business being drunk and handling a stud. That's the truth. Mick fell silent again, thought idly about lighting up another smoke. Mr. Slater, he's got no use for drunks. I forgot how his father used to slide into the bottle till I saw him round the barn that day. Rich Slater? Boggs' interest perked up. He came around long shot? That's what I'm telling you. The day Miss Naomi's girl rode off wet. Had himself all polished up like a Bible salesman. To better enjoy the relay of information, Mick decided to indulge in that second smoke. They talked for a little bit. Couldn't hear what Mr. Slater had to say. No reading that boy's face either. Gambler's eyes he's got. He chuffed out smoke, then inhaled deeply, secure in his old friend's interest. You could hear the old man, though, laughing and a jawn about how he was in the money, and he'd just come by to see how his boy was doing. Come by to soak it, more likely. Gotta figure it. Didn't like the way he was looking round the place like he was adding up figures on a computer. Polly had a yearling on the lunge. Inside straight, Mr. Slater named him. That Polly's got fine hands, she does. She does, Boggs agreed, seeing nothing odd about Mick's circuitous story. He nodded a greeting to one of the track rooms as the man passed. A good yearling manager. Might be Moses is grooming Miss Kelsey for that at Three Willows. Old Chip's talking about retiring again. Always is, just blowing smoke. So, Mick rounded back to his point. Mr. Slater, he goes on up to the house. Old Rich, he hangs around, sipping out of his flask. Silver one, shiny. He corners Jameson for a while, pumping him, I figure. Then Mr. Slater, he comes back, gives the old man a check, and boots him out. Subtle-like, but he gave him the boot for all that. Never had much use for Rich Slater. Me neither. Some say the apple, it don't fall far from the tree. But with these two, I figure it took a long roll. He's got class, Mr. Slater does. And he listens when you tell him something. Asked me the other day what I might think about that puncture in 3S's foreleg. That's a good horse. He is that. So I tell Mr. Slater, it don't look like no accident to me. He just looks, and he thanks me real polite-like. He rose, bones creaking. I'm going to take me a look at double. I think I'll get me some coffee. They parted, Mick wandering into the gloom of the stables. The rain drummed on the roof, muffling the sounds of horses shifting in their boxes. Another groom was adjusting a blanket on a filly. Mick stopped a moment, studying the lines. A little wide-fronted, he decided. The filly would probably paddle. No problem like that with Double. He was an even sixteen hands high, pure black with well-sloped shoulders and a short, strong body that had plenty of heart room. Most of all, Double had courage. Mick sauntered back toward the box. He liked to give Double a little pep talk before a race, 
and to look into the colt's eyes and see if it was a day to put a bet down. Well, now, boy, we called out some rain just for you. Mick opened the box door and scowled. What the hell are you doing here, Lipsky? You got no business around Mr. Slater's horse. Lipsky remained crouched and eyed Mick as he ran a hand up and down Double's leg. Just taking a look. Thought I might lay down a bet. You go ahead and do that, but you clear out. I'm going, I'm going. Lipsky angled his body away, but Mick's eyes were keen. What the hell you doing with that? In one fierce move, Mick clamped a hand on Lipsky's arm. The knife glinted, thin-bladed and bright in the dim light. You bastard! Gonna cut him, were ya? I wasn't gonna hurt him. Wary, Lipsky shifted his eyes over the door of the box. There wasn't much time. I was just gonna fix it so he wouldn't race today. Or ever, he thought, once he'd severed a tendon. Slater's got it coming. You got what you had coming, Mick corrected, and nobody messes with my horses. You low life. You did three aces, too. Don't know what you're talking about. Look, it was a bad idea. No harm done, though. You can see for yourself I never touched him. I'll take a look, all right. Now we'll go see what Mr. Slater once done about this. Lipsky jerked back, furious that the scrawny old man had such an iron grip. He ain't turning me in. Hell, I ain't. I'm turning you in, and you put a mark on this coat, I'll spit on your grave if Mr. Slater decides to kill you. I ain't touched this fucking horse. Desperate, Lipsky struck out. As the two men began to grapple, Double danced nervously to the side. The knife sliced through the air, and deflected by Mick's forearm, the point nipped across the colt's flank. Shocked by the pain, Double reared. Mick cursed and drew in the breath to shout. Then there was no air at all, as the blade plunged in just above his belt. Jesus! As stunned as his opponent, Lipsky yanked the blade free and stared at the spreading blood. Jesus Christ, Mick, I didn't mean to stick you. Bastard, Mick managed. He stumbled forward just as the colt, aroused and terrified by the scent of blood, reared. A hoof caught Mick at the base of the skull. After one bright flash of pain, he felt nothing, even when he fell face forward and the colt's thrashing hooves trampled him. Panic nearly had Lipsky racing from the box, but he held on, cowering in the corner. It wasn't his fault, he told himself. Hell, he wasn't no murderer. He'd never have pulled a knife on old Mick, especially seeing as he was stone-cold sober. If Mick had just listened, it wouldn't have happened. Wiping his fist across his sweaty mouth, he backed toward the door. He eased the bloody knife into his boot before slipping silently out of the box. Back hunched, he hurried out into the rain. He needed a drink. This is great! Channing stood in the wet grandstands, eating a hot dog. I mean, he said through a mouthful, who'd have thought there was so much to it? It's been like watching rehearsals for some hot Broadway play. Charmed by him, Naomi smiled. If she could have handpicked a sibling for her daughter, it would have been Channing Osborne. I'm sorry we can't provide better weather. Hey, it just adds to the drama. Horses thundering through the rain, colors flying, mud spewing. He grinned and washed down the hot dog with Coke. I can't wait. Well, it won't be long now, Kelsey assured him. In fact, they must be about ready to prep the horses for the post parade. You want to go take a look? Sure. It's really nice of you to let me hang out, Naomi. I'm just glad you chose us over sun, sand, and bikinis. This is better. In a gesture she found charming, he offered her his arm. When I get back next week, I can brag to all my sunburned, hungover pals how I juggled two gorgeous women. What about the vegetarian? Kelsey asked him. Who, Victoria? His grin was quick and careless. She dumped me when she realized I was an unconvertible carnivore. Very short-sighted of her, Naomi decided. That's what I said. I'm a prize, right, Kells? He glanced down at his stepsister and saw that her attention was focused elsewhere. Well, well, he thought, studying Gabe. He hadn't seen that look in Kelsey's eyes for a long, long time. Somebody you know? Hmm? Oh. Distracted, she reached up to adjust the brim of her cap. Just a neighbor. Gabe broke off his conversation with Jameson and turned to watch them approach. Damn, the woman looked good wet. He shifted his gaze from her to the man with his arm around her shoulder. Too young to be competition, he decided. 
He doubted if the guy was old enough to buy beer, but there was a territorial sense in the drape of the arm and a look in the eyes that was a combination of curiosity and warning. The stepbrother, Gabe concluded, and he stepped forward to meet them. "'Haven't you dried off yet?' he said to Kelsey, and watched the vague annoyance flit over her face. "'It's a new day, Slater. "'This is Channing Osborne, Gabriel Slater. "'It's nice you could pay your sister a visit.' "'I thought so.' "'It amused Gabe that Channing increased his grip "'several unnecessary degrees for the handshake. "'How's the mare, Naomi? "'I've been meaning to come over and take a look myself.' She's definitely in foal, and healthy. I heard about three aces when Matt stopped by yesterday. Is he healing well? Gabe's thoughts darkened, but his eyes remained placid. Yeah, he'll be back in top form in a few weeks. You've got double or nothing running today, don't you? Gabe looked back at Kelsey. Because he wanted to touch her and to irritate her, he skimmed a knuckle down her cheek. Keeping track of the competition, darling? You could say that. "'Your colt's running head-to-head head with ours. "'Want another side bet? "'You still owe me ten. "'Fine. "'In the spirit of things, we'll say double or nothing. "'You're on. "'Want to take a look at the winner? "'I've already seen Virginia's pride, thanks.' "'He grinned, took her hand. "'Come on.' "'As he tugged her away, Channing frowned. "'Has that been going on long?' "'I'm beginning to think so.' Looking after them, Naomi rubbed her wet nose. Does it worry you? She took the whole divorce thing hard. I don't want somebody taking advantage of that. How much do you know about him? Quite a bit, really, Naomi sighed. I'll fill you in later. Now, I suppose we'll go with them so you can stop worrying. Good idea. He glanced down at her as they walked into the barn. You're okay, Naomi. Pleased, she took his hand. So are you, Channing. You know I want to whip your butt on the track, Slater, but I am sorry about three aces. I don't suppose there's anything I can do, but... Fallen for them, haven't you? Kelsey tipped up her rim to get a better look at him. For who? The horses. She shrugged and continued to walk toward the rear of the stables. So what if I have? It looks good on you, the way it softens you up. Deliberately he slowed her down. He wanted another moment before they reached the box. When are you coming back? She didn't pretend to misunderstand him, but she did choose to evade. I've been busy. Moses gives us a lot to do. Would you rather I came to you? No. Edgy, she glanced over her shoulder. Naomi and Channing were only a few paces behind. No, she repeated, and this isn't the time to discuss it. You think your brother would go for my throat if I scooped you up and kissed you right here? Certainly not. Dignity was failing her. But I might. You're tempting me, Kelsey. Instead, he brought her hand to his lips. Tonight, he murmured. I want to see you tonight. I've got company, Gabe. Channing's visiting. Tonight, Gabe repeated. You come to me or I come to you. Your choice. He stopped at the box, keeping her hand in his. Hello, boy, ready to... He trailed off as he spotted the line of blood, still red and fresh against the black coat. God damn it! He yanked open the door and had hardly taken a step inside before he saw the body crumpled in the bedding. Stay back! Without looking, he flung out an arm to block Kelsey. What happened to him? The poor thing's bleeding! Focused on the colt, she pressed forward. When Gabe was forced to snatch at the halter to keep the horse from rearing... She saw the form sprawled in the bloody hay. Oh, God! Oh, my God! Gabe! Hold him! Snapping out the order, Gabe wrapped Kelsey's limp fingers around the halter. What is it? Alarmed by the pallor of Kelsey's cheeks, Naomi surged forward. The breath hissed between her teeth. I'll call an ambulance. She pressed her hand over Kelsey's. Can you handle this? Kelsey blinked, nodded, then cleared her throat. Yes, yes, I'm all right but she was squeamish enough to keep her back to what lay in the corner of the box. Oh, man! Channing swallowed hard, then put himself between Kelsey and Gabe, who crouched over the body. I'm only pre-med, he said quietly and squatted down, but maybe... It took only one close look to realize that he could have been as skilled and experienced a surgeon as his father had been, and he would still have been helpless. 
There was blood everywhere, pools of it coagulating in the stained hay. The gouge in the back of the skull had welled with it. A bright blue cap, now streaked with red, lay partially under the bedding. That horse must have gone crazy, Channing said grimly. Kelsey, get out of here. Get away from him. No, I've got him. Fighting to keep her breath even, she stroked the colt's neck. He's shaking. He's terrified. Damn it, he killed this guy. No, he didn't. Gabe's voice was low and hard. He gently rolled Mick over. The groom's pulled-up shirt exposed a vicious stab wound in the abdomen. But somebody did. Later, Kelsey stood shivering in the drizzle, trying to pretend she was drinking the coffee Channing had pressed on her. "'You should get away from here,' he said again. "'Let me take you home, or at least inside the clubhouse.' "'No, I'm all right. I need to wait. That poor man.' She looked away, out into the shed row. It didn't seem energetic or glamorous now. It was simply muddy, dreary. People were gathered in tight little groups, eyeing the barn, waiting. Gabe's been in there a long time with the police. He can handle himself. He glanced over to where Naomi sat on a barrel under an overhang. Maybe you should go over with your mother. She looks really spooked. Kelsey stared at the entrance to the barn. She wanted to be in there, to hear what was being said, to know what was being done. Gabe and I found him, she murmured. I feel like I should help. Then go help Naomi. Kelsey let out a long breath. All right, you're right. But it was hard to walk over, to face that blank look in Naomi's eyes. Here, she held out her untouched coffee. Brandy'd be better, but I don't have any handy. Thanks. Naomi accepted the cup and forced herself to sip. It had nothing to do with her, she reminded herself again. The police wouldn't come, they wouldn't take her away this time. Poor Mick. "'Did you know him very well?' "'He's been around a long time,' she sipped again. "'No, it didn't have that slapping warmth of brandy, but it helped. "'He and Boggs played gin rummy once a week, gossiping like little old ladies. "'I guess Mick knew as much about my horses as he knew about Gabe's. "'He was loyal.' "'She drew in a shaky breath. "'And he was harmless. "'I don't know who could have done this to him. "'The police will find out.' After a moment's hesitation, she laid a hand on Naomi's shoulder. Do you want me to take you home? No. Naomi reached up, covered her daughter's hand with hers. They both realized it was the first time they'd touched without reservation. I'm sorry, Kelsey, this is a horrible experience for you. For all of us. I would have spared you from it. She looked up, her eyes meeting Kelsey's. I'm not much good under these circumstances. Then I'll have to be. Kelsey turned her hand so that their fingers meshed. Naomi's were stiff with cold. You're going home, she said firmly. The police may want to talk to me, so Channing will take you. I don't want to leave you here alone. I'm not alone. Gabe's here and Moses. Boggs. She glanced over to where the old man stood alone in the rain, grieving. It's pointless for you to stay when you're so upset. You go home, take a hot bath and lie down. I'll come up as soon as I get back. She softened her tone, leaned closer. And I don't want Channing here. He'd feel as if he was doing some manly act if he took you away. That was a nice touch. Hating herself for the weakness, Naomi rose. All right, I'll go. My being around a crime scene only causes more speculation in any case. But please don't stay any longer than you have to. I won't, don't worry. Alone... Kelsey settled down on the barrel her mother had vacated and prepared to wait. It didn't take long. A uniformed officer stepped outside, scanned the groups of people, and focused in on her. A Miss Biden? Kelsey Biden? Yes? The lieutenant would like to speak with you inside. All right. She ignored the speculative looks and slid off the barrel. Inside, the routine of death was already underway. The last police photos had been taken... The yellow tape, cordoning off the far end of the barn, was in place. Gabe's eyes blazed once when he spotted her. I told you there was no need for her to be here. You both found the body, Mr. Slater. 
Lieutenant Rossi stepped over the tape and nodded to Kelsey. He was a twenty-year veteran of the force, with a craggy, handsome face and sharp cop's eyes. His hair, dark and thick and streaked with dignified gray, was only one of his many vanities. His body was a temple, fueled with vitamins, health juices, and a stringent low-fat diet, and honed by exercise. He might spend most of his time behind a desk with a phone at his ear, but it didn't mean he had to go to seed. He loved his work and thrived on procedure, and he hated murder. Miss Biden, I appreciate your waiting. I want to cooperate. Good. You can start by telling me exactly what happened this morning. You were here since dawn? That's right. She told him everything, from unloading the horses through the morning workouts. We stayed down at the track a while. It was my stepbrother's first trip, and we decided that he might like to watch the horses being prepped for post time. And that would have been about what time? Close to noon. Things are quiet between about ten and noon. We walked up here from the track and ran into Gabe. He was in the shed row talking to his trainer. She glanced over Rossi's shoulder to look for him and saw with dull horror the shiny plastic bag being carried out on a stretcher. Cursing under his breath, Gabe ducked beneath the tape and blocked her view. This doesn't have to be done now and certainly not here. No, it's all right. Gamely, Kelsey swallowed her nausea. I'd rather get it over with. I appreciate that. So, you ran into Mr. Slater just outside here? Yes, we talked for a few minutes, ragged each other because we had a horse running in the same race. I came in with Gabe to look at his colt. My mother and stepbrother were a little behind us. Your mother? Yes, it was actually her horse that was to run against Gabe's. She owns Three Willows, Naomi Chadwick. Chadwick. It rang a distant bell. Rossi jotted it down. So the four of you came in. Yes, but they were behind us a bit. They didn't get to the box until after... after we did. I guess Gabe and I saw the wound on the colt's left flank at the same time. He went in and stopped, tried to block me. But I was worried about the colt, so I followed behind him. I saw the blood and the body in the corner. I held the horse's head because he was starting to rear, and Channing and Naomi came up. She went right away to call an ambulance, and Channing went into the box, thinking, I suppose, that he might be able to help. I thought, I suppose we all thought for a moment, that the horse had done it, until Gabe turned the body over and we saw. She would never forget what she'd seen. We saw he hadn't. Gabe told Channing to call the police. And there was no one around the stall when you and Mr. Slater came in? No, I didn't see anyone. Some of the grooms were inside, of course, but it was still a little early for prepping. Did you know the deceased, Miss Biden? No, but I've only been at Three Willows for a few weeks. You don't live there? No, I live in Maryland. I'm just spending a month or so there. I'll need your permanent address for the record, then. When she gave it to him, he slipped his pad back into his pocket. I appreciate your time, Miss Biden. I'd like to talk to your mother and your stepbrother now. I had Channing take her home. She was very upset. In an unconscious move, Kelsey shifted her stance, placing her feet a bit wider, straightening her shoulders. In any case, they were both with me all morning. Neither of them could have seen anything I didn't. You'd be surprised what one person sees and another doesn't. Thank you. He dismissed her by turning back to Gabe. My information is that a man named Boggs might have been the last person to see the victim alive. Does he also work for you? He works for Three Willows. He's outside, Kelsey informed Rossi. I'll tell him to come in. She hurried out, eager to be away from the flat-voiced questions and shrewd eyes. Boggs was where she'd seen him last, simply standing in the rain. There's Lieutenant Rossi who wants to speak to you. She took his hands, vainly trying to warm them between hers. I'm so sorry, Boggs. We was just talking. Just sitting over there and talking. We had a card game on for tonight. Tears streamed down his face along with the rain. Who'd have done that to him, Miss Kelsey? Who'd have done old Mick that way? I don't know, Boggs. Come on, I'll go in with you. She slipped her arm around him and guided him back toward the barn. You don't have no family, Miss Kelsey. A sister, but he hadn't seen her in more than twenty years. I gotta take care of things for him. 
see that he gets buried proper. I'll take care of it, Boggs. Gabe stepped outside, intercepting them before they entered. You tell me what you want him to have, and we'll arrange it. Boggs nodded. It was only right. He thought high of you, Mr. Slater. I thought high of him. Come and see me as soon as you're able. We'll set everything up. He'd have appreciated it. Head bowed, Boggs walked inside. The lieutenant says you're free to go. Gabe took Kelsey's arm and steered her away. I'll take you home. I should wait for Boggs. He shouldn't be alone now. Moses will see to him. I want you out of here, Kelsey, away from it. I can't be. I'm as close to it as you are. You're wrong. He half dragged her across the muddy shed row. The box is mine, the colt is mine, and damn it, Mick was mine. Slow down. She dug in her heels and managed to grab him by the jacket. He might have shown little more than a flare or two of emotion inside the barn, but he was on slow burn now and ready for flashpoint. No cool gambler's eyes now, she thought. They were hot and lethal. You're getting out of here now. You're staying out of it. She could have argued. She certainly could have struggled against the grip he had on her arm. But she waited until they'd reached his car. Then she simply turned and wrapped her arms around him. Don't do this to yourself, she murmured. He held himself rigid, prepared to jerk away and shove her into the car. Do what? Don't blame yourself, Gabe. Who else? But his body relaxed and curled itself to hers. He pressed his face into the cool, damp comfort of her hair. Jesus, Kelsey, who else am I going to blame? He was trying to protect my horse. You can't know that. I feel it. He drew her away. His eyes were calmer now, but whatever was going on just behind that deep, cool blue had Kelsey trembling. I'm going to find whoever did this to him, whatever it takes. The police work their way. I work mine. Chapter 10 Death couldn't interfere with the routine of a thoroughbred farm. Not the death of a horse or a man. Dawn still signaled workouts. There were races to be run, legs to be wrapped, coats to be quartered and strapped. Talk around the paddocks or the shed row at sunrise might have been of murder and old Mick, but the pace didn't flag. It couldn't. There was a foal with the case of eczema, a yearling filly who still refused a rider, and a colt competing in a maiden race. Grieving and gossip had to be accomplished while filling feed tubs and walking huts. Maybe you want to see to strap and pride now that he's been cool, Miss Kelsey. Though his eyes were shadowed, his face drawn, Boggs was up and about his duties. He offered Kelsey the reins. He always seems happier when you do it. All right, Boggs. Her hand covered his gnarled one. Is there anything I can do for you? His eyes drifted past her as they focused on something private. Ain't nothing to do, Miss Kelsey. Just don't seem right, that's all. Don't seem right. She simply couldn't turn away. Would you mind coming with me? I'm still a little nervous about grooming the next derby winner. They both knew it was an excuse, but Boggs nodded and trudged along beside her. It was raining again, the same slow, incessant drizzle that had marred the previous afternoon. Though it was closing in on 10 a.m., the mist hung stubbornly. Inside the barn, stable boys were busy mucking out, so the air was perfumed with the smells of manure, hay, and mud. At Queenie's box, Kelsey paused and handed the colt's reins back to Boggs. This will only take a minute. She took a carrot out of her back pocket, offering it to the mare while she nuzzled the soft ears. There you go, old lady. You didn't think I'd forget, did you? The mare nibbled the carrot, then Kelsey's shoulder, curving her neck in response to the caress. Though she was aware of Boggs's interest, Kelsey completed what had become a daily routine with a kiss on Queenie's cheek. I know, I've already taken plenty of ribbing about female equophilia. After a last pat, Kelsey turned back to Boggs and the colt. And maybe I'm hooked, but I've caught more than one male groom cozying up to a horse. Your granddaddy loved that mare. Boggs led pride to his box where Kelsey had already cleaned out the soiled night bedding and replaced it with clean wheat straw for day. He'd sneak our sugar cubes every afternoon. We all pretended not to notice. What was he like, Boggs? He was a good man, fair. 
had a quick temper in him and could crack like lightning. As he spoke, his eyes scanned the box, noting that Kelsey had seen to the colt's fresh water and hay net. His job, usually, but he was sharing it with her as he shared the colt. Wouldn't tolerate laziness, no, sir, but if you did your work, you got paid well and on time. No him to sit up all night with a sick horse and to fire a man on the spot for a shoddy grooming. Kelsey crouched down, running her hands down Pride's legs to check for swellings or injuries. Boggs had already washed the leg wraps and hung them with the clothespins he kept clipped to his pant leg. Sounds as though he was a hard man to work for. Satisfied, she rubbed the light dampness of rain from the colt with straw. Not if you did what you was hired to do. He watched as she took the dandy brush from Pride's grooming kit. You got the touch, Miss Kelsey, he said after a moment. I feel as though I've been doing this all my life. She soothed the colt with murmurs and strokes as he shifted and shied. His temperament, like most aristocrats, was high-strung. He's a little restless this morning. Sharp's what he is. His mind's already at the starting gate. Kelsey continued to remove mud from the colt's saddle area, belly, and fetlocks. I'm told he ran well yesterday. She set the dandy brush aside and took up a hoof pick. I guess it seems cold, thinking about races and times after yesterday. Can't be no other way. You were friends with him a long time. About forty years. Boggs took out a tin of tobacco and helped himself to a pinch. He was already an old hand when I come along. I've never lost anyone close to me. Kelsey thought of Naomi, but it was impossible to remember whatever grief she'd felt at three. I don't want to say I can imagine what you must be feeling— "'But I know if you want some time off, Naomi would give it to you. "'No place I'd rather be than here. "'That policeman, he had a look about him. "'He'll find who'd done that to Mick.' "'Kelsey dampened a sponge and wiped the colt's eyes outward from the corners. "'She enjoyed the way he looked at her while she tended to him, "'the recognition and the trust they'd begun to build between them. "'Lieutenant Rossi, I didn't like him. I don't know why. "'Well, there's cold blood in there.' But cold blood means he'll think, and keep thinking step by step till it's done. Kelsey set the sponge aside and picked up the body brush and curry comb. She remembered the light in Gabe's eyes. There had been a need for revenge there, she decided, and she understood the sentiment too well. Will that be enough for you, Boggs? It'll have to be. There you are. Channing leaned against the box door. He watched her a moment the steady hands, the new muscles working in her shoulders. You look just like you know what you're doing. I do know what I'm doing, and the fact never failed to delight her. Missed you at breakfast. Overslept. His grin was more charming than sheepish. My body clock's not used to eating at 5 a.m. Listen, Matt dropped by. I'm going to go hang out with him on a couple of house calls, barn calls, whatever. Have fun, he hesitated. You're okay, right? Sure, I'm okay. I'll be back in a couple hours. Oh, and Moses said if I found you, he wants you back on the lunge line. Slave driver, she muttered, as soon as I'm finished here. She had no time to brood. A thorough strapping of a horse took an experienced groom an hour, and Kelsey about a quarter hour longer. Then it was time for the midday feeding. Oats, bran, and nuts that needed to be mixed, measured, weighed. She added a tablespoon of salt... Pride's vitamin supplement and electrolytes. Because he tended to be a finicky eater, she treated him to a helping of molasses to sweeten the feed. Later she would bring him an apple. Not just to spoil him, she thought. Moses had explained that horses required succulents added to their feed. Pride preferred apples to carrots. He had a taste for the tart Granny Smith variety. Now you're set, she murmured when he settled into his midday meal. And you eat it all here? He munched, eyeing her. "'We've got a lot riding on you, sweetheart, "'and I think you'd like standing in the winter's circle "'with a blanket of red roses.' "'He snorted what Kelsey took "'as the equine equivalent of a shrug. "'She chuckled, giving him one last caress. "'You can't fool me, boy. "'You want it as much as we do.' "'Rolling her shoulders, she left the barn "'to face the rest of the day's work.' She doubted that Moses had anything sadistic in mind when he whipped her through the morning, but the result was the same. By three, her still-developing muscles were sore, she was covered with mud, and her system was sending out urgent signals for fuel. 
After thoroughly scraping her boots, she went into the house through the kitchen and headed straight for the refrigerator. With a little cry of pleasure, she pounced on a platter of fried chicken. She had her mouth full of drumstick when Gertie came in. "'Miss Kelsey!' Outraged by the sight of her little girl leaning against the counter in filthy jeans, Gertie bustled to a cupboard for a plate. "'That's no way to eat!' "'It's working for me,' Kelsey said, with her mouth full. "'This is great. The best chicken I've had in my entire life,' she swallowed. "'This is my second piece. "'Sit down at the table. I'll fix you a proper lunch.' "'No, really. Sometimes manners simply didn't apply.' Kelsey bit in again. "'I'm too dirty to sit anywhere and too hungry to clean up first. "'Gertie, I've taken three cooking courses, one of them the Cordon Bleu, "'and I could never make chicken like this.' "'Flushing delightedly, Gertie waved a hand. "'Sure you could. It was my mama's recipe. "'I'll walk you through it sometime.' "'Well, you outdo the colonel all the hell.' "'At Gertie's blank look, Kelsey laughed. "'Kentucky Fried!' Gertie, I could compose a sonnet to this drumstick. Go on, you're teasing me. Red as a beet now, Gertie poured Kelsey a glass of milk. Just like that brother of yours. Why, you'd think that boy hadn't eaten a home-cooked meal in his life. He's been in here charming you out of house and home, hasn't he? I like to see a boy with a healthy appetite. He's got that. And so, Kelsey thought, did she, as she debated whether or not to eat one more piece. Is Naomi around? "'Had to go out. Hmm. "'So, Kelsey thought, it was just the two of them. "'Perhaps it was time she took advantage of the opportunity "'and asked Gertie some questions. "'I've wondered, Gertie, about that night. "'Alec Bradley?' "'Gertie's face sobered. "'That's done and gone. "'You weren't home?' Kelsey prodded gently. "'No?' "'Gertie picked up a dishcloth "'and began polishing the already spotless range.' "'and I've cursed myself every day for it. "'There we were, my mama and me at the movies and eating pizza pie "'while Miss Naomi was all alone with that man. "'You didn't like him. Hm. "'She sniffed and slapped her rag on the stove. "'Slick he was. Slick like you'd slide right off if you was to put a hand on him. "'Miss Naomi had no business with the likes of him. "'Why do you suppose she went around with him? "'How do reasons, I suppose?' She's got a stubborn streak, does Miss Naomi, and I expect she was feeling stubborn about your daddy. Then she was feeling low about losing a horse at the track. He went down and they had to shoot him. She took that hard. That'd be about the time she was seeing that man. Gertie's derision was plain. She refused, had always refused, to call Alec Bradley by name. He was handsome, but handsome is as handsome does, I say. I tell you what the crime was, Miss Kelsey. The crime was putting that sweet girl in jail for doing what she had to do. She was protecting herself. She said she was, so she was, Gertie said flatly. Miss Naomi wouldn't lie. If I'd been home that night, or her daddy, it wouldn't have happened. That man would never have laid a hand on her, and she wouldn't have needed the gun. Gertie sighed, took the rag to the sink, and rinsed it out thoroughly. Used to make me nervous, knowing she had that gun in her drawer. But I'm glad she had it that night. A man's got no right to force a woman, no right. No, Kelsey agreed, no right at all. She still keeps it there. What? Uneasy, Kelsey set down the half-eaten chicken leg. Naomi still has the gun upstairs? Not the same one, I expect, but one like it. It was her daddy's. Law says she can't own a gun now, but she keeps it just the same. "'Says it reminds her. "'I say, what does she need to be reminded of such a time for? "'But she says some things you don't want to ever forget.' "'No, I suppose she's right,' Kelsey said slowly. "'But she wasn't certain she would sleep more peacefully knowing it. "'Maybe it's not my place to say it, but I'll say it anyway,' "'Gertie sniffed once, then snatched a tissue to blow her nose. "'You were the sun and the moon to her, Miss Kelsey.' You coming back here like this, it's made up for a lot. There's no getting back what was lost, no taking back what was done. But old wounds can still be healed. That's what you're doing. Was it, Kelsey wondered. She was still far from sure of her own motivations, her own feelings. She's lucky to have you, Gertie, she murmured. Lucky to have someone who thinks of her first and last. Wanting to clear the tears from Gertie's eyes, she lightened her voice. "'and very lucky to have someone who can cook like you. 
Oh, go on. Gertie waved a hand, then dashed it over her eyes. Plain food, that's what I do. And you haven't finished that last piece you took. You need more meat on your bones. Kelsey shook her head just as the chimes sounded from the front door. No, Gertie, I'll get the door. Otherwise, I'll eat this platter and all. She took the milk with her, guzzling as she went. She passed a mirror and rolled her eyes. Dirt streaked her cheeks. The cap she'd tossed aside in the mudroom hadn't prevented her hair from becoming hopelessly tangled. She hoped, as she wiped at the mud with the sleeve of her manure-stained shirt, that the visitor was horse-related. Far from it. Grandmother! Kelsey's shock mixed with chagrin as Millicent winced at her appearance. What a surprise! What, in the name of God, have you been doing? Working! Kelsey saw the spotless Lincoln outside, the driver stoically behind the wheel. Out for a drive? I've come to speak with you. Head erect, Millicent crossed the threshold with the same unbending dignity that Kelsey imagined French aristocrats had possessed when approaching the guillotine. I felt this was much too important to discuss over the phone. Believe me, I do not enter this house lightly or with any pleasure. I believe you. Come in, please, and sit down. At least Naomi was out of the house on some errand. Kelsey could thank fate for that. "'Can I offer you something? Coffee? Tea? "'I want nothing from this house.' "'Millicent sat, her starched linen suit barely creasing with the movement. "'She refused to satisfy petty curiosity by studying the room "'and focused instead on her granddaughter. "'Is this how you spend your time? "'You're as grimy as a field hand.' "'I've just come in. You might have noticed it's raining.' "'Don't take that tone with me.' This is inexcusable, Kelsey, that you would waste your talents and your upbringing. Worse still, that you would send this family into a tailspin while you play out this little drama. Grandmother, we've been through all this. Kelsey set the milk aside and moved over to stir up the fire. Whether it was the rain or the visit, the room was suddenly chilled. I'm well aware of your feelings and your opinions. I can't believe you came all this way just to reprise them for me. You and I have rarely been sympathetic to each other's wishes, Kelsey. No. Thoughtfully, Kelsey replaced the poker and turned back. I suppose we haven't. But in this, I can't believe you would go against me. Your name was in the paper this morning. Your name in connection with a murder at a racetrack. News travels, Kelsey mused. She'd been up and at the barn before the first paper delivery. I didn't realize that. If I had, I certainly would have called Dad to reassure him. I was there, Grandmother. The man who was killed was a groom at the neighboring farm. My part in the investigation is very incidental. That you were there at all is the entire point, Kelsey, at a racetrack, associating with the sort of people they attract. Kelsey tilted her head. They attract me. Now you're being childish. Millicent's lips compressed. I expect more of you. I expect you to think of the family. What does that poor man being killed yesterday have to do with the family? Your name was linked with Naomi's, and her name in connection with the murder brings up old scandals. I shouldn't have to spell all this out for a woman of your intelligence, Kelsey. Do you want your father to suffer for this? Of course not. And why should he? Why would he? Grandmother, an old man was brutally murdered. By sheer coincidence, I happened to find him. Naturally, I had to give a statement to the police, but it ends there. I didn't even know him, and as far as Dad goes, he's completely removed from this. Stains are never completely removed. This world, Kelsey, is not ours. You were warned what to expect, what kind of people you would mingle with. Now the worst has happened, and because your father is too soft-hearted to take a stand, it's up to me. I'm going to insist that you pack your things and come home with me today. How little things change. Naomi stood in the doorway, pale as marble. Her slate-gray suit only accented the delicate fragility of her frame. But fragility can be deceptive. When she stepped forward, she was as elegant and as powerful as one of her prized fillies. I believe I overheard you say something quite similar to Philip once. Millicent's face went still and hard. I came to speak to my grandchild. I have no desire to speak to you. You're in my home now, Millicent. Naomi set her purse aside, 
and with seamless poise, chose a chair. "'You are certainly free to say whatever you like to Kelsey, "'but you won't run me off. Those days are over.' "'Prison taught you little, I see.' "'Oh, you can't begin to know all it taught me.' "'Her blood was cold now without sentiment. "'That pleased her. "'She'd never been sure how she would react "'if she confronted Millicent again. "'You're the same as you ever were, "'calculating, sly, unprincipled. "'Now you'd use Philip's daughter to satisfy your own ends. "'Kelsey is her own woman. "'You don't know her well if you believe she can be used.' "'No, I can't.' "'Kelsey stepped between them, "'not to block the venom, but to speak her mind. "'And don't talk around me, either of you. "'I'm not a pawn in anyone's game. "'I came here because I wanted to, "'and I'll stay until I decide to leave. "'You can't order me to pack, Grandmother, "'as though I were a child or a servant.' "'Color leaped into Millicent's cheeks and rode high. "'I can insist that you do what's right for the family.' "'You can ask me to consider what's right, and I will.' "'You've pushed yourself on her.' "'Millicent rose, her eyes boring into Naomi, "'using sentiment and sympathy to draw her to you. "'Have you told her about the men, Naomi? "'The drinking, the total disregard for your marriage, "'your husband and child? "'Have you told her that you set out to ruin a man, "'to destroy my son, but only succeeded in ruining yourself? "'That's enough.' Kelsey stepped back, hardly realizing the gesture put her squarely in Naomi's corner. "'Whatever questions I have, whatever answers I'm given, don't involve you. I'll make my own judgments, Grandmother.' Millicent fought to keep her breathing even. Her heart was thumping dangerously fast. She, too, would make her own judgments. "'If you stay here, you'll force me to take steps. I'll have no choice but to alter my will and to use the power I have to revoke your grandfather's trust.' It was sorrow rather than shock that settled in Kelsey's eyes. Oh, Grandmother, do you think the money matters so much? Do you think so little of me? Consider the consequences, Kelsey. She picked up her bag, certain the threat would bring the girl quickly to heel. Hey, Kells, you never guess what I... Channing came to an almost comical halt, two strides in front of Millicent. Grandmother! Enraged, Millicent whirled on Naomi. "'So you'd have him as well? "'Philip's daughter and now the son he considers his own? "'Grandmother, I'm just... "'Quiet,' Millicent snapped at him. "'You paid once, Naomi, and I swear to God you'll pay again.' "'After she swept out, Channing hunched his shoulders. "'Ah, bad scene, huh? "'And one of the more colorful ones. "'Drained, Kelsey rubbed her hands over her face. "'Channing, you did call Candace and tell her you were here, didn't you?' I called her. He stuck his hands in his pockets, then drew them out again. I just told her I was okay and settled in. I didn't mention where I was settled. I thought I'd avoid the complications. He blew out a breath as Kelsey continued to stare at him. I guess I'd better let her know before it gets any stickier. Kelsey shook her head as he clattered up the stairs. Channing's prone to leaving out vital pieces of information. She glanced back at her mother. Want a drink? Naomi managed to smile and eased her shoulders back against the cushion. Why not? Two fingers of whiskey ought to take out some of the sting. We'll try it. Kelsey walked to the sideboard and poured. I'm sorry for that. So am I. Kelsey, the money might not be important to you, but it's your heritage. I don't want to be responsible for your losing it. Absently, Kelsey ran a fingertip over one of Naomi's crystal horses, following the flow of glass from withers to tail. I have no idea if she can block my trust fund. And if she can, well, I haven't exactly been squandering the interest to date. With a shrug, she handed Naomi a glass. I don't particularly want to lose it, either, but I'll be damned if she'll rein me in with dollar signs. Cheers. She wrapped her glass against Naomi's. Cheers. With a shake of her head, Naomi began to laugh. Letting her eyes close, she ordered her body to relax. Oh, Christ, what a day! She'd spent the last two hours with her lawyers, working out the details on how to align her own wishes with the ones her father had outlined before his death. Now, she thought, if Millicent made good on her threats to cut Kelsey off, 
she'd have to make further adjustments. She opened her eyes again and tossed back the first swallow. I was awfully proud of you, the way you stood up for yourself. Same goes. When I saw you in that doorway, I thought, Jesus, she's like a lightning bolt, frozen, cold, sharp, and deadly. She's always affected me that way, not that everything she said was completely off the mark. I've made mistakes, Kelsey, very bad mistakes. Kelsey turned the glass in her hand, around and around. Did you love Dad when you married him? Yes, oh yes. For a moment, Naomi's eyes softened. He was so shy and smart and sexy. Kelsey choked on a laugh. Dad, sexy? Those tweed jackets, that dreamy, poetic look in his eyes, that calm, patient voice reciting Byron, that unflagging kindness. I adored him. When did you stop? It wasn't a matter of stopping. Naomi set her half-finished whiskey aside. I wasn't so patient or so kind. And the dreams we had were different ones. When things began to go wrong, I wasn't smart enough to compromise, to bend. It was one of my mistakes. I thought I could hold him by proving I didn't need him. I opened the distance, raced away from him, and I lost. I lost Philip. I lost you. I lost my freedom. A very high price for pride. She grimaced as the doorbell rang again. It looks like the day isn't over yet. I'll get it. For the second time that afternoon, the visitor was unwelcome. Lieutenant Rossi. Miss Biden, sorry to disturb you. I have a few follow-up questions for you and your mother. We're in the sitting room. Is there any progress, Lieutenant? She asked as she led the way. We're investigating. Trained eyes took in the sedate comfort of the room, as well as the two glasses of whiskey, the half-full glass of milk. Naomi rose as he entered. As a man, he appreciated her grace. As a cop, he admired her control. Lieutenant Rossi? Though her skin had gone cold, she offered a hand. Won't you sit down? Would you care for some coffee? I appreciate the offer, Miss Chadwick, but I've had my quota for the day. I just have a few more questions. Of course. They always had a few more questions. She sat again, keeping her spine erect. What can I help you with? You were fairly well acquainted with the victim? I knew Mick. Keep the answer short, Naomi reminded herself. Say nothing more than necessary. He was employed at Longshot for the last five years, approximately? I believe that's correct. He also worked for the previous owner, Cunningham. On and off. Off, Rossi continued, when he was fired about seven years ago. Bill Cunningham let Mick go, as I recall, because he felt Mick was too old. At the time, my trainer offered Mick a position here, but he decided to leave the area. The information I have is that he worked the tracks in Florida during that two-year period. I believe so. Would you know if he had any enemies? Mick? She dropped her guard for a moment. The question was so absurd. Everyone loved old Mick. He was an institution, a kind of monument to the best in racing. Hard-working, tough-minded, big-hearted. No one disliked him. But someone killed him. Rossi waited a beat, fascinated by the way Naomi drew herself in. The horse was injured. Mick Gordon was assigned to that horse as groom. My report is that there was a long, shallow slice on the left flank, approximately 12 inches in length. He took out his book as if checking facts. Preliminary reports indicate that this wound was caused by the same weapon used against the victim. Obviously, someone was trying to hurt the colt, and Mick tried to stop him, Kelsey put in. Moses told me that colt's very level-headed. He'd never have trampled Mick if he hadn't been hurt or frightened. That may be... Rossi had to wait for the autopsy report before he could be sure if the knife had killed Mick Gordon or the horse had. Murder or attempted murder, he intended to close the case. Mr. Slater's colt was competing with yours that day, Miss Chadwick. Yes, or he would have been if it hadn't been necessary to scratch him. And your horse won, didn't he? She kept her eyes level, steady. 
by a neck, as we say. He paid three to five. You and Mr. Slater have a history of competition, particularly in the last year between these two horses. He's edged you out of the top spot several times. Double or nothing is an admirable colt, a champion. So is my Virginia's pride. They're incredibly well matched. I don't know much about racing myself, he smiled placidly. But from an amateur's standpoint, it seems it would be to your benefit to... He tipped his flattened hand back and forth. Shift the odds. That's an uncalled-for accusation, Lieutenant. In automatic support, Kelsey dropped a hand on her mother's shoulder. Absolutely uncalled for. It's not an accusation, Miss Biden. It's an observation. Horses are sometimes deliberately injured, drugged, even killed to up another's chances, aren't they, Miss Chadwick? Unscrupulous and criminal behavior happens in all walks of life. She fought against trembling. Cops' eyes could detect even the slightest fear. Those of us in racing prefer to say it happens much more often in the show ring than at the track. Three Willows doesn't need to resort to tactics like that, Kelsey said, furious. And I've told you that my mother was with me all morning. Dozens of people saw us. They did, Rossi agreed. As a veteran of the racing world, Miss Chadwick, wouldn't you agree that an owner or a trainer interested in improving his chances would hire someone to do the job rather than risk harming a horse himself? Yes, I would. You don't have to answer questions like this. The outrage of it seared Kelsey's throat. I'm sure your mother is well aware of her rights, Rossi said coolly. And the procedure of a murder investigation? I'm perfectly aware of both, Lieutenant, and equally aware that those rights don't always protect the innocent. Her lips curved humorously. Certainly not the half-innocent. I could remind you that my colt wasn't the only other contender in that race, and that not once in the fifty years that Three Willows has been in operation have we been cited for any infraction. But I'm sure you know that, just as I know an ex-convict always carries a cloud of suspicion. Is there anything else I can tell you? Not for the moment. A hell of a woman, he thought, and tucked away his pad. He was going to have to schedule extra time to study her file a little more closely. I appreciate the time. Uh, one thing, Miss Biden. You did say you met Mr. Slater outside the barn yesterday, before the two of you went in to look over the horse? Yes, he was talking to his trainer. Thank you. I'll see myself out. That was outrageous. Kelsey exploded the moment the door closed. How could you just sit there and take it? He all but accused you of paying for murder. I expected it. And he won't be the only one to consider the possibility. After all, I'm once guilty. Don't be so calm, damn it! I'm not. The pretense is all I've got. Weary, she rose. She needed a quiet room, a bottle of aspirin, and the coward's escape of sleep. But she paused took a chance by framing Kelsey's face in her hands. You're not even considering it a possibility, are you, that I might have had a hand in this? No. There was no hesitation. Then I'm wrong, Naomi murmured. It seems I have a great deal more than pretense. Go for a ride, Kelsey. Work off some of that anger. She went for a ride, but her temper continued to rage. She headed for Longshot with a dual purpose. Handing over Justice's reins to a willing groom, she strode from barn to house. Too stirred up to think of the propriety of knocking on the front door, she went in through the pool house, moving from spring to high summer, then up a short flight of stairs into the steady warmth of a casually furnished great room. She realized then, because she hadn't a clue which direction to take, that she was trespassing. Upbringing warred with instinct until she turned left and headed down a corridor. So, she thought, she'd work her way to the front door, go outside, and knock. Unless, of course, she found Gabe in the meantime. It wasn't his voice she heard, not immediately. It was Boggs's, his grainy tones coming through an open door. He wouldn't want no fancy service, Mr. Slater. None of that flowers and organ music stuff. Once, when we were sitting around... He told me how he thought he'd want to be cremated, 
Maybe his ashes could be spread over the practice track here, so he'd always be a part of the place. Sounds kind of funny, I guess. That's what he wanted. That's what we'll do. That's good, then. I got some money set aside. I don't know what it costs to do things that way, but... Let me do this for him, Boggs, Gabe interrupted. I'm not sure I'd be sitting here today if it hadn't been for Mick. I'd appreciate it if you'd let me take care of him. I know it ain't the money, Mr. Slater. Maybe it's not my place to say, but he was real proud of you. Told me he knew the first time he saw you hustling to walk hots at the track that you'd amount to something. I sure am going to miss him. So am I. Well, I better get back. He stepped out of the doorway, flushed a bit when he saw Kelsey. Miss, he muttered, tipping his cap and hurrying off. Ashamed at having so blatantly eavesdropped on a private conversation, she stepped into the doorway to apologize. He sat at a beautiful old desk, the arched window behind him letting in the watery sunlight. Wherever there wasn't glass welcoming the light, there were books. The two-level library was stunning and unmistakably masculine. The man who owned it had his head in his hands. Embarrassment melted into compassion. She stepped forward, murmuring his name. Her arms were around him before he lifted his head. I didn't know you were so close to him. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. He hadn't felt grief, not in years, not since his mother. It surprised him how deep it could cut. He was good to me. I must have been about fourteen the first time he grabbed me by the scruff of the neck. He took an interest in me, I don't know why, and talked Jamie into hiring me. And he made sure I learned. God damn it, Kelsey. He was seventy. He should have died in bed. I know, she drew away. Gabe, Rossi was just at the house. Busy man. Gabe dragged his hands through his disheveled hair. He left here less than an hour ago. I think he's got some idea that Naomi's involved. When Gabe said nothing, she moistened her lips. I need to know if you think so. Composed again, he studied her. No, I don't. And neither, I see, do you. Rossi has a couple of ideas. The other is that I arrange the business myself. He waited a beat. Double or nothing's heavily insured. You'd shoot yourself in the foot first. She let out a sigh. That was the other reason I came over. I could tell when he was questioning me that he was toying with the idea. I guess I came over to warn you. I appreciate it. He rotated his shoulders once to ease the lingering tension. Kelsey, standing there in splattered work clothes, compassion in her eyes, took care of the rest. You look good, darling. Yeah, mud's becoming. On you. He took her hand, played with her fingers. Why don't you sit on my lap a while? Amused, she tilted her head. Is that the setup or the punchline, Slater? In answer, he tugged, cradling her when she tumbled. Yeah. He inhaled deeply, nuzzling her hair. It smelled of rain and of spring. This is exactly what I needed. Sit still, Kelsey. You'll cause a lot more trouble by wiggling around, believe me. I'm not a lap sitter. So learn. Testing, he grazed his teeth over her earlobe, pleased with her quick shudder. You only came over to tell me about Rossi? That's right. This time he exhaled deeply. Okay, but I'm going to have to find a way to make you pick up the pace here. I'm starting to suffer. I think you're tougher than that. She rested her head in the curve of his shoulder. It was entirely too comfortable. "'Entirely too tempting. "'I'm not playing games. "'That's too bad. "'I usually win. "'Chapter 11 "'Sure you don't want a blindfold?' "'Kelsey tucked an arm around Channing's waist. "'A last cigarette?' "'He tipped down his red-framed Oakley sunglasses. "'You're right, Kels. "'No, really, I feel like I'm sending you off "'to the firing squad alone. "'I can handle Mom.' He unstrapped his helmet from the back of his Harley. And the prof's no problem. And grandmother? With a grimace, he slipped on the helmet. Hey, I've been dodging those bullets for years. As long as my brilliant mind keeps me in the top 15% of my class, they can't hassle me much. 
the trusty shield of a 4.0. She'd used it herself. What about this summer? Mom's just going to have to accept that there's more to my life than hitting the books. My brother. Grinning, she tapped her fingers on the side of his helmet. The hard hat. Actually, Naomi offered me a job here this summer. Here? Channing Osborne, stable boy. I like it. I like her. In a lithe move, he straddled the bike. You know, I stopped by here to be sure you were all right. I had this image planted of some hard-faced, hard-living bitch with a drink in one hand and a forty-five in the other. Sowed, Kelsey said dryly, by the magnificent Millicent. With a few seeds tossed out by Mom, they're as solidly aligned against you being here as they were for you marrying Wade the weenie. He glanced back toward the house. It made a lovely picture with the willows greening, the daffodils and hyacinths spearing up in their Easter egg hues of yellow and blue and pink. She's not anything like she's painted, is she? It doesn't seem so, Kelsey murmured. I'm glad you came, Channing. I'm glad you got to meet her. Hey, it was the most interesting spring break I've ever had. He leaned forward to kiss her goodbye. And I'll be back. See you in a couple of months. I... She wanted to tell him she couldn't guarantee she'd be here, but he'd kick the engine to life. With a final salute, he roared off down the drive. Lost in her own thoughts, she walked back to the house. Had she decided to stay, Kelsey asked herself. The month Naomi had asked of her was almost up, yet neither of them had mentioned plans to leave. And what was waiting for her back in Maryland, in that tidy Bethesda apartment? job hunting, solitary meals, and the occasional lunch with a friend who would sympathize over the divorce, then mention a cousin, office pal, old friend who just happened to be single. The idea was more than depressing. Here she had work and a world she already loved, a lifestyle that suited her nature, people who accepted her for what she could do. And there was Gabe. She wasn't quite sure what was going on there, but it would be a great deal more difficult and certainly inconvenient to try to figure it out if she moved away. It would be dishonest to say he didn't fascinate her. His moods, impossible to read one minute, bold as a banner headline the next. She appreciated his humor, the easy charm, the equally easy arrogance. He'd moved her in so many ways. The way he'd grieved for old Mick, standing solemnly in the soft dawn light, while Boggs had ridden slowly around the practice track, spreading the old man's ashes. He'd held her hand, she remembered, trusting her to understand the ritual. That kind of loyalty and love couldn't be learned. Yet he could be hard, ruthless enough to gamble and win a small fortune. Even that intrigued, and the underlying recklessness that had pushed him to raise another man's house and build his own. Then, of course... There was that basic animal attraction, the kind she'd never felt before for any man, even her husband. Kelsey? Naomi paused at the foot of the stairs. The girl looked so solemn, she thought. Missing Channing already? No, I was thinking of... She trailed off, blew her breeze, tousled hair out of her eyes. Nothing, really. Realigning her thoughts, she studied Naomi. "'slim, strong, self-contained. "'It was nice of you to offer him a job this summer. "'Not that nice. "'He has a strong back, willing hands, "'and I enjoy having him around. "'The house has been empty a long time. "'I think he wants to be a vet. "'So he told me. "'He told you?' "'With a baffled laugh, Kelsey shook her head. "'He's never mentioned it to me, not once. "'I've always thought he was revved to be a surgeon like his father.' Sometimes it's easier to tell those secret hopes to someone who isn't so close. He loves you, admires you. Could be he's afraid you'd be disappointed in him. I couldn't be. Her breath came out in an impatient gush. Candace has been talking for years about him carrying on the Osborne tradition. I just assumed he wanted it, too. Why do people try to shoehorn their children into slots? Family honor, a terrifying obligation. She opened her mouth, closed it again. Family honor. Hadn't that been why she'd married Wade? How many times had she been told how perfect he was for her until she'd believed it? Good family, good prospects, excellent social standing. 
It had been her duty, after all, to marry well and to marry properly. God, had she loved him at all? And when you can't hold up that obligation, Kelsey said slowly, it's the worst kind of failure. I don't want that for Channing. He'll do what's right for himself. You did. Eventually. You can talk about eventually when you're my age. Kelsey, she wasn't quite sure of her approach. Casual, she decided, was probably best. I'm going down to Hialeah. I want to watch Virginia's pride run. And I want to stick close to him after what happened at Charlestown. Oh, so she wasn't to have the last week after all. That makes sense. When are you leaving? In the morning. I thought you might like to go with me. To Florida? Well, it's not spring break, but it should be quite a spectacle. As cautious as Naomi, she nodded. I'd like to see it. Good. How would you feel about taking the rest of the day off? Kelsey's brows lifted. She hadn't seen Naomi take more than an hour off in over three weeks. Four? What else? Naomi's laugh was quick, bright, and young. Shopping! What's the fun of taking a trip if you can't splurge on some new clothes first? Kelsey's grin flashed. I'll get my purse! In a dingy hotel room off Route 15, Lipsky gulped down warm Gilby's gin. The ice machine a few feet outside his door was on the fritz. Not that he cared. Warm or chilled, the liquor went down the same. I tell you, sooner or later they're going to come looking for me. You're probably right. You got sloppy. Rich straightened his bolo tie. Neatness counts, friend. I was just going to take care of the horse. With his free hand, Lipsky reached for the cigarette, smoldering in a chipped glass ashtray crammed with butts. Just enough so he couldn't race, that's all. But that wasn't your job, Rich reminded him with an affable grin. Ears and eyes open, remember? Just ears and eyes until I told you different. He didn't bitch when I fixed his other colt. Resentment gleamed in Lipsky's red-rimmed eyes. He gave me another hundred for it. You were tidy, Fred. I did tell you I believe not to take chances, but, he spread his arms wide, that's behind us now, and Gabe's favorite colt won't be wearing a saddle for another week or so. It fit nicely into the master plan, the damaged horses, even the murder. Such things stirred gossip and excited the press. Feeling generous, Rich reached into his pocket. He carried his lucky money clip, the oversized silver dollar sign he'd picked up in Houston. There was nothing he liked better than to have it straining with bills. Normally, he would load it with singles, putting a fifty, or if he was lucky, a C-note on the outside. He was really in the groove now, he thought. The money clip was fat with hundreds. He peeled one off and laid it on the table. Lipsky stared at it with a mixture of hunger and guilt. I wouldn't hurt the peacock. Nobody could have paid me to hurt old Mick. An unfortunate accident. In sympathy, Rich patted a hand on his shoulder. Lipsky gulped more gin. I never killed nobody. Maybe I cut a few when they deserved it, but I never killed nobody before. He could still see Mick's face, the shock, the pain, the way his eyes had rolled back right before the horse reared and felled him. And he could see the blood pumping and pooling, Mick's trademark blue cap going red with it. He snatched the bottle and poured another shot. He shouldn't have poked his nose in. An excellent rationalization. Rich poured a glass for himself. He hated to see a man drinking alone, even a revolting specimen like Lipsky. But he kept his cigarettes and his monogrammed lighter tucked away. Now it's time to consider the next move. Cops are going to come looking for me. Plenty of people saw me around the track that day at the shed row. You were hustling rides, Rich reminded him. Perfectly permissible. You're a familiar face at the track, Fred. Otherwise, the guards would have blocked you from entering the barn. Yeah, and sooner or later, somebody's going to remember that I did. Then they'll notice I ain't been back. He tamped out his cigarette, spilling ash and old butts over the rickety table. Then they'll remember I carry a blade. Your deductive powers are admirable. My advice is to run. Lose yourself in Florida, California, Kentucky, maybe Mexico. They've got tracks south of the border. I ain't living in no foreign country. I'm an American. Ah, patriotism. Rich toasted with his glass of gin. You're a resourceful man, Fred. 
Otherwise, I wouldn't have put you on the payroll. But I'm afraid we'll have to sever our relationship under the circumstances. It's going to take more than a hundred. Rich's smile never wavered, but his eyes turned jellied. Now, Fred, you wouldn't put the arm on me, would you? Desperation was leaking sweat down Lipsky's back. He could smell himself. I can't take the rap for this alone. If I'm going to run, I need money. Fuck, Rich, I was working for you. You got a part in this. Is that the way you see it? The way I see it, I need ten thousand to hide and to keep my mouth shut about you if I don't hide good enough. It ain't too much to ask, Rich. Rich sighed. He'd been afraid it would come to this. I understand your position, Fred, I truly do. Listen, uh, let me make a phone call, see what I can come up with. He bolstered his smile with another pat on Lipsky's shoulder. Give me a little privacy, huh? Yeah, okay. I gotta piss anyhow. He rose and staggered into the bathroom. Rich didn't pick up the phone. Instead, he took a small vial out of his inside coat pocket. It really was a shame, but he couldn't afford to call Lipsky's bluff. Even if he paid, odds were the man would sing like a bird the minute the cops nailed him. And they'd nail him, Rich thought, as he tapped the liquid into Lipsky's gin. Come on back, Fred. We got it all taken care of. He was beaming when Lipsky reeled back into the room. I'll have the money for you tomorrow. Relief and liquor had Lipsky tumbling into his chair. No shit, Rich. Hey, we go back a ways, don't we? Rollers like us. We take care of each other. He lifted his glass. Here's to old friends. Yeah. Eyes tearing in gratitude, Lipsky brought his glass to his lips. I knew I could count on you. Yeah. Rich's smile hardened as he watched Lipsky literally drink himself to death. You can count on me, Fred. Palm trees and striped awnings, brilliant sunshine and trailing bougainvillea, men in white suits and women in sundresses, the ambience added to the glamour of the track. But Hialeah Park was still about racing. At the Gulf Stream receiving barn, horses arched their necks, pranced, sniffed the air, athletes psyching themselves up for competition. Many of the sights and sounds were the same as Charlestown. Vendors still hawked daily racing form. Handicappers still hovered, working the odds. But the weather itself, the sheer glory of it, drew a different breed from the chilly spring in West Virginia. Kelsey amused herself watching a woman, teetering on ice-pick heels, leading a filly around the walking ring. Her shoulder-length rhinestone earrings flashed. Nobody could call a horse a dumb animal looking at that. Kelsey glanced up at Gabe. Meaning? What do you see when you look at her face? The horse or the woman? The horse. Obliging, Kelsey looked back at the filly, plodding, head down, behind the giggling woman. Embarrassment. You got it. That's Cunningham's latest acquisition. The horse or the woman? Both. She let loose a laugh and realized how glad she was she'd come. Maybe it was the quick peek at summer or the simple pleasure of discovering herself a part of the close-knit group, but she was glad. I heard you'd be here, but I didn't see you at morning workout. I just got in an hour ago, he told her. What do you think of Miami? Well, some of the grooms were grumbling this morning about losing sleep, gunshots outside their quarters. But I cruised the beach yesterday and it hit me that I must be an adult. I had no desire to strap on rollerblades. Other than that, she drew in a deep breath, I love it. It's a beautiful park. The bottom line, race trackers don't have much use for the outside world anyway. I wouldn't go that far. You're not a race tracker. He looked down at her. At least not yet. She frowned, unsure if she'd been complimented or insulted. Rather than pursue it, she watched the losers returning from the first race. The winners, she knew, would be taken to the spit box so that samples of urine and saliva could be tested for drugs. But it was the losers she thought about now, her heart aching a little to see them limping in, their flanks sweaty, faces dirty. If a filly could feel embarrassed by being led around in public by a tarted-up Barbie doll, she wondered how deeply these suffered the pangs of failure. Sad, isn't it? she murmured. Like watching soldiers struggling back from the front. All that color and show, and in just a couple of minutes it's done. It's a hell of a couple of minutes. 
Too bad you missed the Florida Derby. Now that's a show. Acrobats, a camel race. Camels? Really? Never bet on one. They walked past the tack rooms around the back stretch. It was nearly time for the second race, and Pride was in the third. She wanted to see Reno before Moses gave him that leg up. It had become her personal superstition to add her last wish for good luck before he walked his horse from the paddock. Not going to head for the windows? Gabe asked her. Nope. I've picked my horses. Pride in the third and three aces in the fifth. She stopped to buy a lukewarm Pepsi from an ancient black man. I've got my own system now. Gabe accepted the can, took a swallow, and handed it back to her. And what is that? Sentiment. I just bet my heart. It's a lot to lose. She shrugged. Gambling's no fun without the risk. Damn right. Come here. They were nearly at Pride's saddling stall, and there was plenty of traffic. Cut it out, Slater. But he'd already caught the ponytail she'd looped through the back of her cap. I'm just going to kiss you. The risk's on both sides. She thought she heard some of the grooms hooting with laughter before her mind went blank. She'd wondered if that first, that only intellect-sapping kiss had been a fluke, a coincidence, a one-time trip. Apparently not. There was something about his mouth. She opened hers to it, eagerly, swamped in the taste, the texture, the heat. It moved against hers, clever and tormentingly slow, as if there was all the time in the world to sample. On a moan of agreement, she plunged her hands into his hair, holding on until the sounds of the track were no more than misty white noise. I want, it was all he could think. He'd spent so much of his life wanting. Decent food, a clean bed, the simple peace of living without fear. As he'd grown, those wants had grown with him. He'd wanted women and power and the money that would ensure both. But he'd never craved anything, certainly not anyone, as he craved now. One woman, one night, he'd have gambled everything he had for the chance of it. How much longer, he murmured against her lips. I don't know, she struggled to catch her breath. I don't know you. Sure you do. I didn't know you existed a couple of months ago. She drew away, surprised her legs didn't fold under her. I'm not... She straightened her cap with a shaky hand as applause rang out behind them. We need to talk about this later, without an audience. Well, he skimmed a fingertip over her jaw. I accomplished something anyway. The word's already going out that you're off limits. That I'm... She set her teeth. Is that what that was for? Some sort of macho claim staking? No, it was for me, darling. But it worked. See you around. She kicked the soda can she dropped when he'd kissed her. Idiot, she muttered. Fighting for dignity, she turned and nearly ran into Naomi. It's odd, Naomi began while Kelsey struggled for words. Watching that, if you'll pardon the analogy, I often have the same sensation when I see one of my horses led to the track. It's like watching your child get on the school bus or reciting a class play. You suddenly realize that they're not just your child anymore, and that there's so much you don't know about them. He just did it to annoy me. Though her heart was still swelling, Naomi smiled. Oh, I don't think so. She took a chance and lifted a hand to Kelsey's cheek. Confused? Yes, but not ready to talk about it. Would you like me to speak with Gabe? He won't appreciate it, but he's fond enough of me to put up with the intrusion. No, I'll handle it. She glanced around. There were still a number of grinning faces pointed her way. Don't we have a race coming up? She snapped. You're not being paid to gawk. As Kelsey stalked over to the saddling stall, Naomi let out a grin of her own. On the track, pride ran like a dream, bursting through the gate with a fierce look in his eyes and Reno driving him on. At the first turn, he was fighting for position, but after that it was over. Down the back stretch, there were three lengths of daylight between him and the closest contender. Looks like a rich man's horse, she heard someone comment behind her. Yes, she thought, he did, but money had nothing to do with it. Gabe joined her at the fifth race. As cool and casual as if they'd recently shared a sandwich rather than a torrid public embrace. Reno ran a smart race. He and Pride make a good team. 
She shot Gabe a look. The best team on the circuit. We'll see, he murmured. Keep your eye on Cunningham's big Sheba. Tell me what you see. Frowning, Kelsey watched the horses being loaded in the gate. The big bay filly was fractious, nervous. She took a swipe, a bad-tempered kick at a groom, and sent him sprawling. She's wound up. That's not unusual. She shifted her gaze to three aces. He was giving his own handlers a fight. Your colt's feeling frisky himself. Just watch. The bell sounded. Horses charged. Cunningham's filly took the lead, her long legs extended, digging up dirt. Kelsey narrowed her eyes behind the binoculars. Big Sheba was sweating heavily by the first turn. She's fast. Why is he pushing her so hard? She winced as the jockey used the bat, quick and often. He's doing what he's been told. At the halfway mark, she began to flag, just a fraction, but enough for the field to close. Kelsey felt her eyes begin to tear. Big Sheba had gallantry, but she didn't have wind, and they were hurting her. On the back stretch, she fell a half length behind Gabe's colt, then a length. Sheer heart kept her in the place position by a nose when they crossed the wire. That's inexcusable. Furious, she whirled on Gabe. There have to be rules. We've got plenty of them. None say you can't push a horse past its limits. Rumor is she's got lung trouble, so the idiot has his jockey runner full out at seven furlongs. He wants the fucking derby so much he'll kill her to have a shot at it. I thought he was just a fool. He's a fool, all right. An ambitious one. He wants that first jewel. Don't we all? Yeah. The difference is just how far we'll go to get it. He left her to head down to the winner's circle. Kelsey turned her back on the track. Suddenly it had lost a great deal of its glamour. Chapter 12 Jack Moser ran a clean place. Maybe some of his clientele rented a room by the hour, but that was none of his never mind. Jack figured what went on behind closed doors went on behind closed doors at the Ritz Hotel, just as it did at his place. Only they paid more for it. He didn't have bugs, wouldn't tolerate carryings on after the decent hour of midnight, and paid extra so his guests could have cable. At $29 a pop for a single, it wasn't a bad deal. Children under 18 stayed for free. He gave his guests the amenity of a silver-sized bar of ivory soap, along with a bath mat-sized towels, and for their convenience, he had a deal going with a nearby diner to deliver meals after 6 a.m. and before 10 p.m. Maybe he slipped some of the cash under the table and didn't push for ID, but that was his business. The sheets were laundered, the bathrooms disinfected, and there was a good, sturdy lock on each and every door. He liked the summers best when vacationing families heading north or south spotted his blinking vacancy sign. Mostly they just tumbled out of their aging station wagons and into bed. Didn't have to worry about them spraying beer on the walls or tearing up the sheets. He'd been watching people come and go for twelve years and figured he knew a thing or two about them. He knew when a couple rented a room to cheat on a spouse, when a woman was hiding out from the guy who was as likely to put his fist in her eye as look at her. He recognized the losers, the drifters, the runners. He'd pegged room 22 as a runner. None of my never mind, Jack told himself as he hooked the passkey from the pegboard. The guy had paid cash for three nights in advance. So what if he'd had the smell of fear around him, or if he'd had a way of looking over his shoulder, as if he was expecting somebody to shove a knife in his back? He'd paid his eighty-seven bucks plus tax and hadn't made a peep since, which was the problem. Room 22's time was up, and according to skinny-butted Dottie, the housekeeper, his lock was still bolted and the do-not-disturb sign was out, just the way it had been for three days. Well, he was going to have to be disturbed, Jack thought, as he strode across the parking lot to the line of identical gray doors and shaded windows. Room 22 could come up with another day's rent or get his butt moving. Jack Moser didn't extend credit. He knocked first, sharp, authoritative. Nobody but Jack knew the secret pleasure it gave him to hustle along a deadbeat. Manager, he said crisply, and caught Dottie poking her head out of 27 where her cart was parked to give him the eye. "'Probably dead drunk,' she called out. Jack sighed and straightened his sloped shoulders. "'Just do your job, Dottie. I'll handle this.' He knocked again, missing the face she made at him. "'Manager,' he repeated. 
then slipped his key into the lock. The smell hit him first, gagging him. His first thought was that Twenty-Two had ordered something from the diner that had disagreed with him violently. His second was that it would take a frigging case of Lysol to cover the stench. Then he had no thought at all. He saw what sat slumped at the tiny scarred table, eyes staring, body bloated. Whoever had checked into Twenty-Two had metamorphosed in three days into a thing as horrible as anything Jack had ever seen on a late-night horror movie. He staggered back, overwhelmed by the sight and the odor. A strangled cry caught in his throat, and he threw up on his shoes. It didn't stop him from running. He continued to run even after Dottie hurried into room 22 and began to scream. The body had already been bagged by the time Rossi pulled up at the motel. It had been through sheer doggedness and a touch of luck that he was there at all. His ears didn't perk up at every suspicious or unattended death that came into homicide. But the name Fred Lipsky had rung a bell. It was a name on his list, one he'd been unable to check out. Now, it seemed, he had his chance. The medical examiner, Dr. Agnes Lorenzo, was pecking up. Rossi nodded to the small, athletic woman with graying hair and puppy-dog eyes. Lorenzo? Rossi, I thought this was Newman's case. It ties into one of mine. What have we got? He hooked his badge to his pocket and moved through the uniformed men stationed at the open door. The body was already zipped, ready for transfer to the morgue. The air still smelled ripe, but it wasn't a smell that affected him much any more. He scanned the room, taking in the unmade bed, the bag of clothes tossed in the corner, the dust left over from the forensics team, a bottle of gin, three-quarters empty, a single glass, and an ashtray full of lucky strike butts. "'Don't ask me for cause of death, Rossi,' Dr. Lorenzo began. "'I can tell you it occurred forty-eight to sixty hours ago. "'No wounds, no sign of a struggle. "'Cause of death?' "'She'd known he would ask and smiled thinly. "'His heart stopped, Rossi. They all do. "'He ignored the jibe and formed a picture. "'A man drinking alone. Angry? Guilty? Afraid? "'Why did a man rent a cheap room to drink in "'when he already had a cheap room thirty miles away?' and if Lipsky had been running, it meant he had something to hide. Since he'd taken her sarcasm well, Dr. Lorenzo decided to give him a break. He had about three hundred in his wallet and an expired credit card. There was a copy of Daily Racing Form in his bag, four days old, and a knife in his left boot. Rossi sprang to attention like a setter on point. What kind of knife? Six inches long, thin blade, smooth edge... Rossi's cop's heart began to swell. Forensics would have the knife, and if there was any trace of blood, man or horse, they'd find it. Who found him? Manager. Name's Moser. He might still be in the office over there, with his head between his knees. Not everyone's as tough as you, Lorenzo. You're telling me. She stepped outside again, sorry the spring air was marred by the whoosh of traffic on Route 15. She'd left a body on the slab and now she had another to add to her backlog. Every day, she thought, was a picnic. I'll need a copy of the autopsy report. Two days. Twenty-four hours, Lorenzo, be a pal. We're nobody's pals, Rossi. She turned away and got into her car. Hey! He grabbed her door before she could close it. He'd known Agnes Lorenzo for three years. She didn't have many buttons that could be pushed, but he'd uncovered a few. You know that stiff you did last week, Gordon, Mick Gordon, old man, gut-knifed? She pulled out a cigarette, a habit she no longer bothered to feel guilty about. The one who got his skull cracked and most of his internal organs smashed for good measure? Yeah, I remember. I think this stiff's the one who did him. She blew out smoke. She hadn't gotten a close look at the knife. There had been no need for her to examine it. But she remembered the wound. She had dozens of wounds filed in her head never to be forgotten. She nodded. The weapon could be right. Okay, Rossi, I'll burn the midnight oil for you, but I can't promise all the tests will be done. Thanks. He closed her door, forgot her, and zeroed in on the office and Jack Moser. Gabe learned about Lipsky ten minutes after he returned from Florida. The press had found a gold mine in Dottie, the housekeeper. The news that Lipsky had died in a motel room spread from barn to track, from groom to exercise boy. Gabe's twice-weekly housekeeper brought in the news and the paper before he'd done more than tossed his bags on his bed. 
Fury flared like a gasoline-soaked match. He was working on banking it when Rossi tracked him down. Nice to see you again, Mr. Slater. Lieutenant, Gabe offered the paper he'd brought down with him, then sat in the sun-drenched living room. Odds are you're here to tell me about this. You win. Rossi set the paper aside and made himself comfortable. Fred Lipsky worked for you up until a few weeks ago. Up until I fired him, which I'm sure you know he was drunk. And objected to the termination? That's right. He pulled a knife. I knocked him down, and I thought mistakenly that that was the end of it. His face still sternly controlled, he edged forward. If I'd had any suspicion that he would have used that knife on one of my men or one of my horses, he wouldn't have walked away. You don't want to make statements like that to a cop, Mr. Slater. It hasn't leaked to the press yet, but the knife in Lipsky's possession at the time of his death was the weapon that killed Mick Gordon. As yet, no one can definitely place Lipsky at the scene at the time of the murder, but we have a weapon and we have motive, revenge. Case closed, Gabe finished. I like them neat before I close them. This one isn't neat. How well did you know Lipsky? Not well. He came with the farm. The statement made Rossi smile. An interesting way of putting it. When I took over here, I kept on anyone who wanted to stay. It wasn't their fault Cunningham played lousy poker. Intrigued, Rossi tapped his pencil against his pad. That's a true story, then? Sounded made up. No point in mentioning a deal like that would be on the shady side of the law. No point at all, Gabe agreed. I'll talk to your trainer again and the men. I'm interested to know if anyone who did know him thinks he was suicidal. You want me to think Lipsky killed himself? The rage began to work in him again, gnawing away. Why? Out of guilt? Remorse? That shit, Lieutenant... He was as likely to stick a gun in his mouth or put a rope around his neck as he was to dance on Broadway. You said you didn't know him well, Mr. Slater. Not him, but I know the type. He'd been raised by Lipsky's type. They blame everyone else, never themselves, and they don't take that last dive because they're always figuring the angles. They drink and they cheat and they talk a big game, but they don't kill themselves. An interesting theory and one Rossi subscribed to himself. Lipsky didn't eat a gun or string himself up. He drank a nasty cocktail of gin, and what I'm told is called asopromazine. Are you familiar with it? Gabe's voice was carefully blank. It's used to relax horses. It's a tranquilizer. Yeah, so I'm told. Funny, I thought when a horse broke his leg, you put a gun behind his ear. The noise annoys the customers, Gabe said dryly, and every break isn't terminal. There's a lot that can be done so that a horse doesn't have to be put down. Quite often he can race again or breed. When there's nothing to be done, a vet gives the horse an injection. There's not supposed to be any pain. I've always wondered how the hell anyone knows that. You won't be able to check with Lipsky. Do you keep any of that stuff around here? It's administered by a vet, as I said. Nobody puts a horse down on a whim, Lieutenant. I'm sure you're right. It would be a hell of an investment to lose. Yeah, Gabe's voice was cool. Have you ever seen it happen? No. The horse stumbles on the track, falls. The jockey's off him like a flash, panicked, fighting it back. Everything gets quiet and grooms race out from everywhere. It doesn't have to be their horse. It's everybody's horse. Then you call the vet, and when there's no choice, when it can't be put off, the vet finishes them behind a screen for privacy. Have you ever lost one that way? Once, about a year ago, during a morning workout. That's a more dangerous time than a race. The rider's relaxed. Everybody is. He could still remember it, the helplessness, the impotent anger. This was a pretty filly, the Queen of Diamonds, I called her. The groom in charge of her cried like a baby when it was over. That was Mick. Gabe resisted the urge to ball his hands into fists. So if you're telling me that somebody finished off Lipsky the way you finish off a terminal horse, I have to say they sent him off in better style than he deserved. Do you hold a grudge, Mr. Slater? Yes, Lieutenant, I do. Gabe's eyes were steady and shielded. 
You want to ask me if I killed Lipsky? I have to say no. I'm not sure what the answer would be if I'd known what you've told me today, and if I had found him first. You know something, Mr. Slater? I like you. Is that so? It is. Rossi offered one of his rare smiles, an expression that never quite sat comfortably on his face. Some people dance all around questions. Some fumble, some sweat, but not you. Rossi picked a moat of lint from the leg of his trousers. You hated the son of a bitch and might have killed him if you'd had the chance, and you're not afraid to say so. Thing is, not only do I like you, I believe you. He rose. Now, it could be you're bluffing me through this, and I'll find out if you paid a quick visit to that motel. But I always circle around, so that doesn't worry me. He took another long, careful study. But I don't think so. Lipsky would have gotten one peep at you through the Judas hole and barricaded himself in for the duration. Do you mind if I go down and talk to your men now? No, I don't mind. Gabe stayed where he was. Rossi knew the way. He closed his eyes and concentrated on relaxing one vertebra at a time. He gave Rossi an hour before he went down to the barn himself. The atmosphere was charged with the combination of excitement and dread that blooms around death. Men stopped their gossiping and instantly looked busy when Gabe appeared. He found Jameson in conference with Matt over the injured colt. The inflammation's down, Matt was saying. It's healing well. Go to changing the dressing once a day, using the same antiseptic. He's going to scar. Matt nodded, eyeing the long healing slice along the flank. More than likely. Goddamn shame. Jameson picked up the syringe to bathe the wound. Prime looking horse like this. It'll add to his prestige, Gabe commented, moving up to take the colt's halter himself. He ran his knuckles down Double's cheek as a man might caress a woman. The colt responded by butting his hand, playful as a puppy. Battle scars, he murmured. It won't affect his time or his ambition. How soon can we put a rider up on him? Don't be in a hurry. Matt jerked aside as the colt swung his head and aimed for his shoulder, no longer a puppy but nine hundred pounds of temperament. The teeth missed by an inch or so. This one's always testing me. Like to take a chunk out of me, would you, fella? He gave the colt a good-natured slap on the neck when he was sure Gabe had tightened his grip. He'll run in Kentucky for you, Gabe. If I was a betting man, I'd put money on him myself. Gabe accepted Matt's diagnosis, then turned to his trainer. Jamie? I've been laying out a new training schedule for him. It'll either work or it won't. That'll have to do, then. Did Rossi talk to you? Jameson's eyes turned grim as he completed the new dressing. Yeah, he was down here asking his questions. Got everybody all stirred up. Peterson figures it was a mob hit. Kip thinks it was a woman. Lynette didn't take to that and took some skin off his nose. They've been arguing over it with the boys taking sides. Nobody thinks it was suicide? Jameson shot Gabe a look and stepped out of the box. Nobody that knew him. He could have gotten his hands on some acepromazine, Matt reminded Jameson. He'd have known what it would do. Surely he had to know the authorities would catch up with him eventually. A man like Lipsky could have lost himself at a hundred tracks. Jameson looked back at the colt. He was dressing the wound himself as penance for his part in it. I should have fired him months ago. Everything might have been different then. And Mick might have been alive. That part's done, Gabe said, but it's not over. Whoever gave Lipsky that last drink is part of it. I'll tell you what I told Rossi. Matt scratched his chin as they headed outside. It had to be someone who knows horses and who had access to veterinary supplies. He smiled wanly, which doesn't narrow it down too much. It includes all of us. Gabe watched Matt's jaw go slack. And several hundred others. Thanks for stopping by. Matt swallowed nervously. No problem. I'll check on the colt in a couple of days. I um, think I'll drop by Three Willows. Oh? Eyeing Matt, Gabe took out a cigar and lit it casually. Is there a problem over there? No, no, I just, well... Gabe's smile came easily. Most of the tension drained away. She's a pleasure to look at, isn't she? Matt flushed, a curse of pale skin. It isn't a hardship. Channing told me he thinks she might stay around a while. 
He'd done his best to pump Channing for details, but the young man was either very discreet or very dense when it came to his stepsister. Oh, I think she'll stay a while. Gabe was going to make certain of that. And you look all you want. He swung an arm over Matt's shoulder as he walked Matt to his truck. A saint couldn't blame you for it. But watch where you touch, Doc. As Matt fumbled for a response, Gabe opened the truck door for him. Mine, he said simply. You, he broke off, flushed, crimson. I didn't realize. Kelsey never, I never. If I thought you had, I'd have to hurt you. Gabe's smile was friendly, even sympathetic, but the warning was clear. Give Kelsey my best when you see her. Sure. Scurrying to leave, Matt scrambled into the truck. But, you know, maybe I should get back. I've got a pile of paperwork. Then I'll let you get to it. Gabe stepped back, grinning as he watched the truck zip up the long lane. You scared that boy white. Jameson thumbed out one of his favored cherry lifesavers. Just saving him some trouble down the road. That may be. Studying the last of Matt's dust, Jameson let the cool, slick flavor dissolve on his tongue. Does she know you've put your brand on her? Gabe chuffed out smoke, remembering with fondness her reaction to his very deliberate public kiss. She's a bright woman. Bright women are the ones that give a man the most trouble. I haven't had any trouble in a long time. And he hadn't known just how much he'd wanted some. I might just drive over myself and see if I can stir some up. The distraction would do him good, he decided, and he turned to look at his trainer. He'd been focused on the colt in the barn and on Matt. Now he could see the lines of weariness, the shadowed eyes. You look beat, Jamie. He'd been sleeping poorly, and he'd found it harder yet to choke down a decent meal since Mick's murder. I've got a lot on my mind. One thing you can get off it is any responsibility for what happened to Mick. When Jameson merely looked away, Gabe tossed down his cigar and ground it out. The expression in Jameson's eyes only churned up his own feelings of guilt. Okay, you used poor judgment in keeping him on. I used it in firing him in front of the men. You want to consider that the trigger? Fine. But it wasn't the finger that pulled it. I see him, Mick, every time I close my eyes. Jameson's voice was low, strained. The way he must have looked when Lipsky and the colt got done with him. It should never have happened, Gabe. He let out a sigh. There was no answer for that. He knew there was none. The Derby's in three and a half weeks. That colt's got to be ready, and it's my job to make him so. But I look at him, and I think how proud Mick was to be grooming him. Saying nothing, Gabe looked out over the hills, his hills. The Derby was more than a race, more even than a goal. It was the holy grail he'd been chasing all of his life. Now, after a lifetime of struggle and five years of concentrated effort, it was nearly within reach. Maybe it would be empty when he finally grasped it, but he had to know. The colt's got to run, Jamie. If you can't work with him, I'll pass him to Duke. Duke Boyd, the assistant trainer, was competent. They both knew it. But he didn't have that extra flair Jameson had been born with. One way or another, he'll be ready for Churchill Downs. I'll do my job, Jameson said, and rubbed his tired eyes. I need your heart in it. Jameson dropped his hands. You'll have it, God damn it, and my soul as well. He turned away and stalked back to the barn. Kelsey knew she wasn't supposed to fall in love with the horse, but intellect had nothing to do with it. She was as fascinated with the new wobbly-legged foal as she was with the older colts, and had been kicked only once in return for her affection. Perhaps because she'd taken that philosophically, and had hauled herself up and brushed herself off, Moses began to increase her training. He liked her style, the way she responded to the horses, and what was more important, he liked the way they responded to her. Still, he was pleased when he saw she was as much nerves as eagerness when he took her to the yearling stable. He'd consulted with the yearling manager, and between them they culled out this particular filly, a bold little chestnut, weighing in at a trim 750 pounds. The light was gold, almost liquid with dawn. It poured onto the filly's coat, 
inflamed it. Eyes dazzled, Kelsey stood just inside the box. She was sure she'd never seen anything quite so beautiful in her life. She's got spirit, Moses said as he worked with a handler to calm her as she was saddled. And she's got heart. That's why Naomi called her honor. Naomi's honor. As if responding to her name, the filly butted Moses hard. The vibration sang up his shoulder. He gave a firm jerk on the shortened reins and continued. You'll be the first weight she's had on her back. Now don't go thinking she's sweet and eager to please. She's used to having her freedom. We can't know what to expect. She's a lot stronger than you. He glanced back at Kelsey, as if dismissing her slight frame in the padded jacket and hat. So you have to be smarter. He stroked a hand over the yearling, neck to withers, and kinder. That's why he'd chosen Kelsey. No one could work successfully with yearlings without kindness. The stall was quiet. Moses spoke so softly they might have been in church. He clucked to the yearling, then to Kelsey, signaling her to move in and make her connection. Her heart was thudding so loud and hard in her throat she was sure it would spook the yearling. But her hands were gentle, her movements slow. She spoke barely above a whisper, watching Honor's ears prick to the sound of her voice. You're so pretty, so pretty, Honor. I can't wait to ride you. We're going to be friends, you and I. The yearling snorted, reserving judgment. Her ears laid back when Moses slipped the bridle over her head. Easy now, Kelsey murmured. Nobody's going to hurt you. Before long, you'll be a queen around here. I bet that feels strange, doesn't it? She continued to soothe while Moses tightened the saddle. You should try pantyhose. I'll lay odds they're more uncomfortable than this little saddle. The light changed subtly, warmed. I'm going to give you a leg up, Moses told her. Remember what I said to do? Yes, She had to take a deep, clearing breath. I don't sit in the saddle yet. The bellying comes first. That's right. Remember, it's an announcement. You're telling her this is what she's here for. Slow now. And remember where the door is if you need to get out quick. The idea of that had Kelsey taking one more breath before she put her knee and her welfare in Moses' hands. The yearling shied, surprised, annoyed, as Kelsey draped herself over the saddle. Kelsey felt the agitated movement under her and refused to think about being sprawled over several hundred pounds of irritated horse. She followed Moses' instructions and her own instincts, easing herself up and around, shifting her weight to saddle and stirrups. Honor danced, kicked out with the hind leg, trying to shift to get a good clean shot at Moses. Instinctively, Kelsey leaned forward, spoke softly, firmly in the yearling's ear. Stop that. You don't want everyone to think you're common. It wasn't magic. The voice and the tone didn't immediately calm her. But after a few more arrogant maneuvers, the yearling settled. She likes me, Kelsey announced. She's thinking about how to shake you off her back. No, Kelsey grinned down at Moses. She likes me. We'll see. He made Kelsey sit until he was satisfied. All right, let's get to work. This, as Moses explained, was kindergarten. Kelsey would simply sit in the saddle while the handler walked Honor on the yearling track, the high walls preventing both of them from being distracted from the job at hand. Once the yearling had become accustomed to a rider's weight, she would be turned loose by the handler, and Kelsey would guide her. They'd learn together. How did she do? Naomi asked when she joined him. Like you'd expect. She's got plenty of Chadwick in her. Moses put a hand over hers, squeezed briefly in one of his rare displays of public affection. I thought you'd come down and watch for yourself. I was too nervous. She watched Kelsey control the yearling with a light tug on the reins. She's been here a month, Moses. She hasn't said anything about leaving. Naomi hooked her thumbs in her front pockets. With everything that's happened in the past couple of weeks, I keep waiting for her to pack up and go. You're not looking close enough, Naomi. He smiled a little when Kelsey forgot the training and leaned forward to press her face into the yearling's mane. 
She's not going anywhere. At Moses' signal, Kelsey straightened, then walked the yearling sedately over. She's gorgeous, isn't she? Yes. The pride that welled up in Naomi was almost frightening. She lifted a hand to stroke the yearling and let her fingertips brush against Kelsey's. You look wonderful together. I feel wonderful. After Moses had fed Honor a carrot as a reward, Kelsey held out a hand. Don't I deserve one? I guess you do, at that. She accepted one and bit in. Now that I've stopped being terrified, I can enjoy it. After patting Honor on the neck, she tried not to gloat. Can I work her tomorrow, Moses? And the day after, he said. She's your responsibility now. Really? She wanted to leap off and kiss him, but settled for beaming at him. I won't let you down. You do, and I'll dock your pay. Now she grinned. I'm not getting paid. You've been on the payroll for two weeks. He had the satisfaction of seeing her jaw drop. You get your first check on Friday. But it isn't necessary. I'm just... You do the work, you get the pay. He said it firmly. He was, after all, in charge of this particular matter. Of course, you're starting at the bottom. That's about where you started, isn't it, Naomi? Rock bottom, she replied with a grimace. My father insisted I earn every penny of my salary, paltry as it was. The idea was, when it all came to be mine, I'd appreciate it more. He was right. Kelsey considered. It was probably best, more of a business arrangement. How paltry? You should probably clear about two hundred a week, Moses told her. She lifted a brow. When do I get a raise? With a laugh, Naomi stepped closer. He'd have appreciated you. Gently, she skimmed her fingertips over the yearling's throat. She likes you. Kelsey sent Moses a smug smile. That's what I said. I missed twenty-three birthdays. Naomi's tone shifted Kelsey's attention back, and now her eyes were wary. Twenty-three Christmases. A lot to make up for. Steadying herself, she looked up and met her daughter's eyes. I'd like to start, if you'll let me. Will you take her? Take her? Staggered, Kelsey stared. Honor? You want to give her to me? I'd like you to accept her. No strings. I realize it might be a bit awkward to keep a horse in an apartment. She struggled to keep her voice light. But she can stay here as long as you like. Moses can work with her, if that's what you want. But she'd be yours, if you'll take her. Swamped with emotion, Kelsey dismounted slowly. Her palms grew damp on the reins, and she felt the warm breath of the yearling across the nape of her neck. I'd love to take her. Thank you. You're welcome. I have to get back. I have a lunch meeting. Kelsey took a step forward, then stopped, suddenly pushing the reins into Moses' hand. She had to dash to catch up with Naomi's long strides. She laid a tentative hand on Naomi's shoulder and did what came more simply, more naturally than she'd imagined. She kissed her. Thank you, she said again, but the rest of the words slid down her throat when Naomi embraced her, held her hard. And where, Kelsey thought, as she felt the urgency, the need pulse from her mother, had this passion come from? How could it have been there all along and never showed? I'm sorry, Naomi murmured, and stepped back quickly. I'll have the ownership papers drawn up right away. I'm late, she managed, and hurried away. Conflicting emotions battered her. Kelsey stood helplessly, wishing she understood herself, much less the woman who'd given birth to her. I don't know what to do. You're doing fine. Moses handed her back the reins. Now go groom your horse. Chapter 13 Days passed quickly. Kelsey had a horse of her own, an intriguing romance with a fascinating and frustrating man, and a fresh curiosity about the mother she was beginning to love. She hadn't expected to love Naomi, to wonder about her, certainly, perhaps to come to respect her. But it was impossible to live in such close proximity with a woman of Naomi's breed and not have emotions become tangled. There wasn't much time to dwell on it, 
As the bluegrass stakes approached the gateway for the all-important derby, both Three Willows and Longshot were hives of activity. Kelsey wasn't ready to admit it, but she was already visualizing honor covered in a blanket of red roses a couple of derbies down the road. Today she was taking an important step toward that goal. A starting gate was set up outside the practice oval at Three Willows. Though there was no longer any bite of winter, the air was still cool. Kelsey tugged nervously at her jacket, hoping she wasn't transmitting any of her tension to honor. A thoroughbred was born to run, she reminded herself. This was just a lesson in format. No amount of champion blood could carry a horse over the finish line if it didn't learn how to go through a steel cage and come out running. Heard you think you've got a contender here. Gabe sauntered over and rubbed a hand over the yearling's nose. Honor laid her ears back and eyed Gabe, then, approving of scent and touch, perked them up again and sidled closer. I know I've got one. Kelsey put a proprietary hand on Honor's halter. I haven't seen you around in a couple of days. Miss me? Not particularly. Kelsey could be grateful she hadn't fallen into that humiliating habit of waiting by the phone. Yet. We're all pretty busy these days. We've got double back in full training. She dropped all pretense and caught his hand. Oh, that's wonderful! I'm so glad! He pleased himself by taking a nip at her knuckles. Remember you said that after he wins the derby. My money's on pride, and so was her heart. Though I might set some aside for double to place. We're sending him on out to Keeneland for a race. Jamie wants him to have a solid test before the bluegrass stakes. Are you going? she said casually. I'm going everywhere the colt goes, including the winter's circle at Churchill Downs. He stroked a hand down her hair, in much the same way he had caressed the horse. Want to keep me company? She turned to check the cinches on Honor's saddle. I'm planning on joining Naomi in the winter's circle. He gave her hair a sharp tug. To Keeneland, darling. A couple of days, more or less alone. He moved closer. She carried the scent of horses about her now, twined with her own fragrance of citrus and spring. I wonder how many times I can make love with you on one quick out-of-town trip. The muscles in her thighs turned to warm wax. Is there a record? There would be. Eyes on hers, he leaned down and caught her bottom lip between his teeth. You have. He nipped once and watched her pupils widen. The most incredible mouth. Leave the girl alone. Trying to look annoyed, Moses gave Gabe a hefty shove on the arm. You going to fraternize with the competition, Kelsey, or you're going to do your job? She picked up her hat and lifted her chin. I can do both. She turned toward her horse, and Moses obliged her with a leg up. Cocky, he muttered at her. Confident, she corrected. And anything but, she walked on her toward the steel cage. The gate doors were opened to ease the yearling into the notion of moving through the confining tunnel. Honor swung her head once and tried to veer off, testing, Kelsey knew, the balance of power. Oh, no, you don't, she muttered. I'm still in charge here. You don't want to embarrass us both in front of company, do you? A touch of the knees, a firm hold on the reins, and Kelsey pressed her on, bringing Honor to a full halt when they were closed in by the gate. It's not so bad, is it? she murmured. And you hardly have to spend any time in here at all. What really counts is once you're through. Slowly they walked out the other side, circled and repeated the process. She's got good hands, Moses commented. She looks more like Naomi than ever on the back of a horse. Gabe tucked his hands in his pockets. There might have been a better way to spend the morning than watching Kelsey guide the flashy yearling through the lesson, but he couldn't think of one. How's it going between them? Slow, steady. It's not a flashy sprint, but I'd say they passed the first turn when Naomi gave her that yearling. She has high hopes for that horse. She's got higher hopes for the girl. Gauging the timing, Moses angled himself to face Gabe. I know she's got a father, but he isn't here. So I'm taking it on myself to tell you to mind your step. Kelsey isn't one of the disposable types, and it would upset Naomi if you hurt her girl. Gabe's face closed up. 
When he spoke, there was none of the resentment he felt, none of the temper, only mild curiosity in his voice. And you're assuming I will. Moses plucked a cigar from Gabe's pocket and stuck it in his own. Don't pull that inscrutable shit on me. My tribe held the trophy for inscrutable while your ancestors were still huddled in caves eating their meat raw. And I'm not assuming anything. Two of you look good together. He shifted his eyes to check on Kelsey's progress. Just make sure you think it through. You don't know if a roll in the hay is going to hurt anybody until you're picking the straw out of your hair. Gabe's lips quivered into a smile. Which tribe did that one come from? The inscrutable one or the lost one? Just don't push her over the wire too fast. She's got heart. Irritated with himself, Moses trudged across the grass to fine-tune Kelsey's work. Yes, she had heart, Gabe agreed, studying her as she listened intently to the trainer's advice. And blue blood. There were plenty who knew him who would say he had no heart at all, and no one would mistake his blood for blue. It hadn't stopped him before. He didn't intend to let it stop him now. There were any number of women who were willing to overlook those particular flaws in his breeding. Many who had. More, he thought coolly, who would shrug aside a drunk, abusive father, a short stint in a cell, and a lingering taste for playing against the odds. But he didn't want any number of women, he decided, while Kelsey guided her mount into the gate and steadied her in the confining tunnel. He wanted this woman. He waited, taking out a pair of sunglasses as the sun grew stronger. The morning was slipping away, and he needed to get back to his own operation. But he drew on his store of patience, staying on the sidelines until Kelsey dismounted. She did well, Kelsey said, pressing a kiss to the yearling's cheek before offering her a carrot. She wasn't afraid at all. I want to see you tonight. What? She turned her head, her cheeks still brushing Honor's glossy hide. I'd like to take you out tonight. Dinner, a movie, a drive, your choice. A date, he continued, when she only studied him with eyes that grew more speculative. I realize I've neglected that particular ritual with you. A date. She rolled the idea around. Such as you pick me up, we go somewhere and do some planned activity, then you bring me home and walk me to the door? That's more or less what I had in mind. Well, it would be different. She cocked her head, considering. I have to be up at five, so we'll need to make it an early evening. I wouldn't mind seeing a movie. Say a seven o'clock show, maybe a pizza after. Now it was his turn to consider. It wasn't the sort of evening he'd expected her to choose. Maybe it was about time they learned about each other. An early movie and a pizza. I'll pick you up around six. He tipped up her chin, kissed her almost absently. Hey, Slater, she called after him. Do I get to pick the movie? He kept walking but glanced over his shoulder. No subtitles. On a first date? She laughed at him. What kind of woman do you think I am? Mon, he shot back, and she stopped laughing. There was nothing romantic about a pizzeria crowded with teenagers, which had been precisely Kelsey's point. Keep it casual, she decided. Avoid a situation where things could become too intense and try to find out what made Gabriel Slater tick. This is perfect. She settled into the booth with paper placemats of Italy printed in red and green. I'd almost forgotten there was life beyond racing horses. It happens to all of us. Amused at finding himself dining with a woman in a place that sported pictures of grinning pizzas and calzonis on the wall, he stretched out his legs. You've taken to it quickly, and in a big way. A talent of mine, or a flaw, depending on your point of view. Why do anything if you don't do it full out? She relaxed and propped her feet on his bench. That way you either reap the glory or you crash and burn. Is that what you're after, Kelsey? Glory? She smiled. I always get glory and satisfaction confused. She glanced up at the waitress, back at Gabe. Your pick. I'll eat anything. I won't. Bring us a small, large, 
Kelsey corrected him. Large, he said with a nod. Pepperoni and mushrooms, a couple of Pepsis. Very conservative, Kelsey noted when the waitress walked off. I like to know what I'm eating. It came, he supposed, from a lifetime of scrambling for scraps. Speaking of which, wasn't it you who ate about two gallons of popcorn less than an hour ago? Still smiling, she toyed with a simple gold chain around her neck. Movie popcorn doesn't count. It's simply part of the experience, like the music score. Was there a music score? Hard to tell. So I'm shallow, she said with a shrug. I like action films. I actually wrote a script once for this course I was taking. Lots of good battling evil in car chases and gunfire. What did you do with it? Absently, she tapped her foot in rhythm with the Guns N' Roses number blaring from the jukebox. I got an A. Then I put it away. I decided against sending it off because if anyone actually bought it, they'd start changing everything and it wouldn't be mine anymore. The waitress served their drinks in big red plastic cups. Besides, I didn't want to be a writer. What then? Lots of different things. She moved her shoulders, then leaned forward for her cup. It always depended on my mood and the courses I was taking. Her smile was quick and slightly off-center. I'm very big on taking courses. If you want to know a little about anything, from computer science to interior design, I'm your girl. Makes sense. You grew up with the college professor. He lifted his cup. Knowledge is sacred. That's part of it, I suppose. But mostly I figured if I tried enough things, sooner or later I'd hit on the right thing. And have you? Yes, she sighed. My family would be quick to point out that I've said that before. But this is different. I've said that before, too, she murmured. But it is. Nothing I've done has ever felt as right as this, as natural, as real. God knows I've never worked as hard in my life. To remind herself, she glanced down at her hands. They were toughening up, she thought. She liked to believe she was toughening up with them. What about you? Have you hit on the right thing? He kept his eyes on hers. For an instant, she thought she saw secrets behind them and hungers that had nothing to do with a sense of garlic and melted cheese. It's possible. Do you always look at a woman so that she thinks you could start nibbling away at her from the toes up? His lips curved, slow, easy, but his eyes didn't change. No one's ever asked. He laid a hand on her ankle, which rested on the seat beside him, and began to caress it. But now that you mention it, it might be an interesting way to end the evening. The waitress plopped down their pizza, along with a couple of white plastic plates. Enjoy your meal, she said automatically, and hurried off to fill her next order. I love the atmosphere here. Cautious, Kelsey put her feet on the floor and sat up. But I got off the track. I was asking about your farm. Have you found what you wanted there? He used a plastic knife to separate some slices, then slid one onto her plate, one onto his. It suits me. Why? You know, darling, you might have made a mistake giving up writing, at least journalism. You can't have the answers without asking the questions. She took her first bite, stinging with red pepper flakes, stringing with cheese, and sighed with approval. At least with some people. Don't you like questions, Slater? He avoided that one and skipped back to the one before. It suits me because it's mine. It's that simple? No, it's that complicated. You don't want to spoil the evening with a rundown of my life story, Kelsey. Bad for the appetite. I have a strong stomach. She licked sauce from her thumb. You know mine, Gabe. At least several of the highs and lows. There's no moving to the next stage for me without some understanding of who I'm moving with. She continued to eat while he frowned at her. That's not an ultimatum or a guarantee. It's just a fact. I'm attracted to you, and I like being with you. But I don't know you. If she did, he knew there was a good chance her other feelings would dim considerably. Long odds. Well, he'd played them before. When the prize was rich enough. Let me tell you something about yourself first. The only child of a devoted daddy... Well-connected, sheltered, spoiled. 
The last rankled a little, but she wouldn't deny it. All right, it's true. I got almost everything I wanted when I was growing up. Emotionally, materialistically. I suppose a lot of it was to make up for the lack of having a mother. But I didn't notice the lack. A big house in the suburbs, he went on. Good schools, summer camp, three squares, and ballet lessons. If he was trying to annoy her, he was succeeding. Coolly, she chose another slice. You forgot piano, swimming, and equestrian. It's all part of the whole. Proms, the college of your choice, and a big splashy wedding to top it off. Don't forget the long, tedious divorce. What's your point, Slater? You haven't got a clue where I came from, Kelsey. I'll tell you, and you still won't understand it. But he would tell her, he decided, and see how the cards fell. Maybe I'd go to bed at night, not quite hungry. There might have been enough money for food that time. Or I'd manage to steal or beg enough. Kids make good panhandlers, good thieves, he added, watching her eyes. Adults feel sorry for them, or overlook them. A lot of people are put in the position where they have to ask for money, she said carefully. It's nothing to be ashamed of. That's because you've never had to ask, or take. He rattled the ice in his cup, then set it down. At night, I'd probably be listening, or trying not to listen, to the fighting going on in the next room, or my mother crying, or the neighbor earning an hour's pay with some faceless John. If I was lucky, I'd wake up in the same bed I went to sleep in. If I wasn't, my mother would come in in the middle of the night, and we'd sneak out before we were tossed out because my father had lost the rent money again. She saw the picture he was painting for her, and it was dark with harsh edges. Where did you grow up? Nowhere. It might have been in Chicago or Reno or Miami. In the winter we stuck to the south because the weather's better and the tracks run longer. It might have been anywhere. Places all look the same if you're broke and running. Of course, the old man would say we were just moving on. That he was working on a big score. My mother scrubbed toilets so we didn't starve, and he took most of her pay and blew it on the horses. Or the cards, or how far a fucking grasshopper would jump. It didn't matter what the bet was as long as he could flash a few bills and play the big shot. He spoke without passion, the bitterness barely a flicker in his eyes. He liked to cheat, mostly he was good at it, but if he wasn't, my mother scraped enough together to keep him from getting his arms broken. She loved him, and that was the most bitter of all the pills he had to swallow. Lots of women loved Rich Slater. He continued to eat as if to prove to himself it didn't matter any more. He liked to hurt them. Some women keep coming back for another fist in the face. They wear the black eyes and split lips like badges. My mother was one of those. If I tried to stop him, he'd just beat the hell out of both of us. She never thanked me for it. Used to tell me I just didn't understand. She was right, he added. I never understood it. There must have been somewhere you could have gone. A shelter, social services, the police? He simply looked at her, the flawless complexion, the breeding that went down to the bone. Some people get swept into dirty corners, Kelsey. That's the way the system works. No, it doesn't have to. It shouldn't. You've got to look for help. Expect it to be there. Have the nerve to ask for it. My mother didn't do any of that. She kept her eyes down, expected nothing, asked for nothing. It was Kelsey's eyes that held him now, the horror and the pity that darkened them. But you were only a child. Someone should have done something. I wouldn't have thanked them for it. I grew up being taught to spit if I saw a cop, to think of social workers as interfering paper pushers whose job it was to keep you from doing what you wanted. So I avoided them. Sometimes I went to school, sometimes I didn't. Christ knows he didn't care. And my mother didn't have the energy left to reel me in. So I did pretty much as I pleased. The old man liked me to hang out with him, sometimes to shill or to drum up a game of my own. And if I was there, I could make sure some money was left once he got too drunk to care. You must have thought of running away, of getting away from him. Sure, I thought about it. But I figured if I stayed... I could keep him from beating her to death. 
And I did, for what good it did any of us. My mother died in a charity ward, pneumonia. I gave it six months, squirreling away the money I made hustling games or jobs at the track. Then I took off. I was thirteen. And tall for his age, he remembered. Canny, already old. The old man caught up with me a few times. The problem was I had a taste for the horses, so I usually ended up at a track. So did he. He'd knock me around, shake me down. I could usually buy him off. Buy him off? If I had been having a run of luck, I'd have money. A couple of hundred would send him off to a game of his own or the nearest bar. Of course, Gabe thought, the price had gone up since then. Every time I cut loose, I'd start over with one thing in mind. One day I'd have my own. He wouldn't touch me. Nobody would. You're not eating. I'm sorry. She reached out and caught his hand firmly in hers. I'm really sorry, Gabe. It wasn't pity he was looking for. He realized now that he'd wanted her to be horrified, wanted her to look at him and cringe back. He'd have an excuse then, wouldn't he, to step away from her and stop the headlong race to a future he couldn't see? I spent some time in jail over a poker game I wasn't quick enough to spot as a sting. He waited for her to comment on that, but she said nothing. I was a small fish, but I got reeled in with the big ones. When I got out, I was smarter. I worked some short cons, but I was more into gambling than the grift. Working at stables was a good way to earn a stake, and I liked the horses. I stayed clean because I didn't like prison. I didn't drink because every time I started to, I smelled my old man. And I got lucky. Finished, he sat back and lit a cigar. Understand better now? Did he really think she couldn't see the anger, the scarred over hurt? People might pass by their table and see a man chatting over a meal, enjoying the company. But if they looked into his eyes, really looked, how could they miss that cold, steely rage? Determined, she put her hand back on his. Maybe I can't understand the way you mean, but I think I know it was a nightmare to live with an alcoholic who... He's not an alcoholic, Gabe cut in, his tone frigid. There's a difference between an alcoholic and a drunk, Kelsey. No twelve-step program is going to change the fact that he's a drunk, a mean one, who likes to beat up on women or anyone weaker than he is. And it wasn't a nightmare. It was life, my life. She withdrew her hand. You'd rather I didn't understand. He turned his cigar, stared at the tip. He hadn't realized that simple, unquestioning sympathy would bring so many memories and the feelings that went with them swirling to the surface. You're right. I'd rather you look at me and take what you see, or leave it. We're both a product of our upbringing, Gabe, one way or another. I'm not going to care about someone because of what they seem to be. Not again. And if you want me, you're going to have to accept that I care. He tapped out his cigar. That definitely sounds like an ultimatum. It is. She shoved her plate aside and picked up her jacket. It's a long drive home. We'd better get started. She would think a great deal about the little boy who had hustled and conned his way through childhood, a child who had gone to bed at night listening to whores and drunks instead of lullabies. How much of the boy remained with the man, she didn't know. More, she thought, than Gabe believed. More, she was certain, than anyone would ever be allowed to see. He had quite simply refashioned himself. The smooth, easy manners, the stunning house on the hill, his stable of champions. How many of the upper crust of the racing circle knew his back alley upbringing? If they did, was it considered some amusing eccentricity? Whatever Gabe wanted to the contrary, she was beginning to understand him, and whether he could see it or not, she already cared. It was nearly 1 a.m. when Bill Cunningham hurried to answer the banging at his front door. Over his naked paunch he wrapped a Chinese red silk robe. A peek through the window made him glad Marla, his latest honey, was a sound sleeper. He liked to think it was great sex that had her snoring away in his big water bed, but more likely it was the lewds she ate like candy. Whatever the reason, it relieved him that he was alone to greet his late and unwelcome visitor. 
I told you to never come here, Cunningham hissed while smoothing down what was left of his hair. Once the derby was over, he was going to treat himself to a weave. Now, now, Billy boy, nobody saw me. Rich was past the midpoint of a solid drunk. He didn't wobble, didn't so much as slur a word, but it showed in the sun-bright glitter in his eyes. And if they did, hell, no law against a man visiting an old poker buddy is there. He grinned, casting his gaze around the opulent foyer. Old Bill had bounced back pretty well, Rich noted, and figured he could squeeze his pal for a few more bills. How about a drink? Are you crazy? Despite the fact that only Marla was in the house and she was cruising on barbiturates, Cunningham whispered. Do you know the cops have been here? Here, he repeated, as if his overdone home was as sacrosanct as a church. Asking questions because some big-mouthed groom told them I'd let Lipsky shovel shit for a couple of days. Told you that was a mistake, but a little one. He held up two fingers close together, squinted at them. Where's the bar, Bill? I'm dry as the fucking Sahara. I don't want you drinking in my house. Rich's grin only widened, but his eyes turned hard. Nah, you don't want to talk to a business partner like that, Bill, especially since I have a new proposition for you. Cunningham moistened his lips. We've got our deal. Just what I want to talk about over a friendly drink. All right, all right, but make it quick. He shot a look up the stairs as he walked by them, going into a sunken living room done in golds and royal blue. And quiet. I got a woman upstairs. You dog. Rich gave him a friendly poke in the ribs. Don't suppose she's got a friend. I've been dry there a while, too. No, and keep your distance. I don't want her to know about you or any of this. She's built, but she's not bright. Best kind of woman. With an appreciative sigh, Rich dropped down into a wide-backed chair covered in gold velvet. You sure know how to live, pal. I always said, that Billy boy, he knows how to live. Just make sure you don't go around saying it now. Cunningham poured two drinks, both twelve-year-old scotch. It seemed like a waste on Rich, but he needed to impress. Always. You were supposed to handle Lipsky. I did. Pleased with himself, Rich swirled the scotch, sniffed it, then swallowed it. Classy, don't you think, to put him down like it put down a horse? Cunningham's hand shook as he lifted his glass. I don't want to hear about that. I'm talking about before. Jesus, Rich, nobody was supposed to get killed. Old Mick was like a saint around the track. An unforeseen complication, Rich said, getting up to refill his glass. And Lipsky certainly paid for it. But seeing that he did adds to my overhead, Bill. It's going to cost you another ten thousand. Are you nuts? Cunningham sprang up, spilling some scotch. You did that on your own, Rich. To protect your investment, it would have taken the cops five minutes to have Lipsky pointing a finger at me. It points at me, he said affably. It points at you. So another ten, Billy. It's a fair prize. He swallowed hard. The money that had come into his hands for Big Sheba had been a miracle, but the miracle had a price. You might as well ask for ten million. I'm leveraged to the hilt. Rich had expected that and was ready to be reasonable. I can wait until after me, no problem. Well, it's a couple of weeks between friends. Now, he crossed his legs. I've come up with an idea, Billy. Little variation on our theme that will pay off for both of us. You want to collect at Churchill Downs, and so do I. But I also have a job to do, and a score to settle with that boy of mine. I don't give a good goddamn about your family problems as long as the job gets done. But the idea of paying Gay back began to creep through him, warming more thoroughly than the Scotch. This business with Lipsky damn near ruined things. Not to worry, not to worry. Lazily Rich waved his glass. I've got it covered with, as I said, a little alteration. What kind of alteration? Well, now, Rich sighed, sipped. I'm going to tell you. 
and I think you're going to appreciate the irony of the deal, Billy boy. I really think you are. Later, when Cunningham crawled back into bed, he was shivering. He wasn't a bloodthirsty man, he assured himself. It wasn't his fault two people were dead, just the luck of the draw, as Rich had said. Maybe he was crazy to have tied in with Rich Slater, but he was desperate, and the timing had fallen so perfectly in his lap he'd considered it a sign. Rich's adjusted plan made a hideous kind of sense. What choice did he have, Cunningham asked himself. If he lost at Churchill Downs, there would be no more Marlas, no more big country house, no more strutting into the paddock. Big Sheba was, he'd thought, his ace in the hole. He'd sunk his money, every spare dollar and all he could borrow into that filly, and she had short lungs. He squeezed his eyes shut, cursing himself for gambling on the horse. He needed the derby, just the derby, to recoup. Once that was done, he'd breed her. He could live well on the price of her foals. It had been done before, he thought, going back over Rich's plan, and he'd slip through that without much more than a ripple. One race, he thought, just one good race. Needing warmth, he wrapped himself around Marla until her snoring lulled him to sleep. Chapter 14 It was a longer drive than Kelsey remembered from rural Virginia to suburban Maryland. A long time to think. She didn't doubt she would meet with resistance, and unless things had changed in the last few weeks, formidable resistance. Candace was sure to have contacted Millicent to tell her Kelsey was on her way. Better to face them all at once, Kelsey decided. To shock them, disappoint them, outrage them. A perfect description, she thought with a wry smile. Candace would be shocked, her father disappointed, and her grandmother outraged. And she, she hoped, would be happy. When she pulled up in the drive, her father was working in the flower bed. He wore an old sweater patched at the elbows and grimy kneed chinos to weed the just budding azaleas. The surge of love came first as she dashed from her car and across the neatly trimmed lawn to hug him. They stayed knee to knee, admiring the flourishing shrubs. I love this house, she murmured, resting her head on his shoulder. Just recently I realized how lucky I was to grow up here. She thought of Gabe and brushed a hand over salmon-colored blooms. How lucky I was to have you, to have flowers in the yard. She smiled a little. Ballet lessons. You hated ballet lessons after six months, he remembered. But I was lucky to have them. He studied her face, brushed at the hair that tumbled over her shoulders. Is everything all right, Kelsey? Yes. We've been worried about you. This recent violence. I know. She cut him off. It's horrible what happened to both of those men. I wish I could tell you it doesn't affect me, but of course it does. But I am all right. I like seeing that for myself. Phone calls aren't the same. He gathered his gardening tools in a wire basket. Well, you're home now. That's what matters. Let's go around through the back, or Candace will skin me alive for tracking the floors. Kelsey slipped an arm around his waist as they walked. I see Grandmother's car. Yes. Candace phoned her when you said you were driving in. They're inside, planning for the spring charity ball at the club. He shot her a sympathetic smile. I believe finding you a suitable escort is at the top of their list. She winced automatically, then remembered. The spring ball. That's in May, isn't it? Yes, the first Saturday. That was the day when spring came to Kentucky, she thought. The same day every year, Derby Day. She supposed missing the ball would be another sin on her part. Dad, she waited as he set down his tools in the little mud room that was as spotless as the rest of the house. I'm not going to be in town that weekend. Not in town? He moved through to the kitchen to wash his hands. Kelsey, you haven't missed a spring ball since you were 16. I realize that. I'm sorry, but I have plans. He said nothing, only dried his hands on a towel. The disappointment, she thought, had already begun. I have plans, she repeated. I'd better tell all of you about them at once. All right, then. Trying not to worry, he went with her to the sitting room. Candace and Millicent were already there, 
chatting over tiny, crustless sandwiches and Dresden cups of tea. Jasmine, Kelsey deduced, after a discreet sniff of the air. It occurred to her that if she'd been at the barn at this time of day, she might be wolfing down a sloppy cold-cut sub and strong black coffee. Her tastes, among other things, had changed quickly. Kelsey! With a delighted laugh, Candace rose to kiss both of her stepdaughter's cheeks. Kelsey caught the subtle scent of l'air de ton that mixed with the tea and her grandmother's signature Chanel. Drawing room scents, Kelsey thought. She'd gotten entirely too used to barnyard ones. She embraced Candace with more enthusiasm, almost in apology. You look wonderful, new hairdo! Instinctively, Candace patted her short sable locks. You don't think it's too ingenue, do you? I swear Princeton can talk me into anything. It's perfect, Kelsey assured her, remembering suddenly that she hadn't visited Princeton or any other hairdresser, for that matter, in weeks. Hello, Grandmother. The greeting, like the kiss on the cheek, was stiff and dutiful. You're looking well, too. You've gained back some weight, I see. Millicent sipped her tea, appraising Kelsey over the rim. It's flattering. Be careful you don't let it go too far, though. Small bones don't carry weight well. Most of it's muscle. Kelsey flexed her biceps just to irritate. It comes from shoveling manure and hauling hay. Smiling, she turned to a dubious Candace. I'd love some tea. Don't worry, I washed up after the morning workout. Of course, of course. Uh, sit down, dear. Philip, you're not carrying that garden with you. Not a speck. He accepted the tea and a tiny sandwich without complaint. When Channing returned home that evening, Philip knew he'd have company on a refrigerator raid. The azaleas are early this year. I don't think they've ever looked better. You say that every spring. Affectionately, Candace patted his hand. You know, we're the only house on this block without a gardener, and there isn't a yard that can compete with ours. Not when Philip gets done working his magic. A nice hobby, Millicent agreed. I've always preferred tending my own roses. She turned her attention to Kelsey. At least, she thought, the girl had had enough sense to dress suitably. She'd been nearly certain Kelsey would flaunt her prickly stubbornness by driving out in muddy boots. But the apricot-toned jacket and slacks were flattering and tasteful. As it happens, she began, Candace and I were just discussing the floral arrangements for the spring ball. We're on the committee. You have a good eye for such things, Kelsey. We'll delegate you to work with the florist. I appreciate the confidence, but I'll have to pass. I'm afraid I won't be here. For the ball? Candace laughed again, poured more tea. Of course you will, dear. It's expected. I realize you might feel a little awkward with the divorce finalized and Wade attending with his fiance, but you mustn't let it bother you. In fact, Millicent and I were just working on a solution to that problem. Kelsey started to explain, then stopped. Oh, were you? Yes, indeed. All enthusiasm, Candace added a lump of sugar to her tea. It was certainly sweet of Channing to escort you last year, but we hardly want that to become a tradition. In any case, people will talk less if you have a more conventional date. The perfect hostess, she offered around the tray of cucumber sandwiches. As it happens, June and Roger Miller's son has just moved back to the area. You must remember Parker Kelsey. He's been practicing oral surgery in New York for the last few years and has just taken a position with a prestigious practice in D.C. She added with a sly smile, Parker's never married. Yes, I remember him. Excellent family, social status, the right schools, the right profession, the right everything. It wasn't his fault, Kelsey supposed, that she saw him as a Wade Monroe clone. I've already spoken with the Millers. Pleased with the maneuver, Millicent sipped the delicately fragrant tea. Parker will escort you. It's all arranged. Typical, Kelsey thought, fighting a rising anger. It was all so typical. I'm sure Mr. and Mrs. Miller are delighted to have Parker back in the area, and you'll have to give him my best. But I won't be here. I'm leaving for Kentucky this week and won't be back until after the first weekend in May. Kentucky? Millicent snapped her cup down in its saucer. Why on earth are you going to Kentucky? The Derby. 
Even in your circles, Grandmother, it's an acceptable event. I imagine it'll be a very hot topic of conversation at the ball after Three Willows Colt wins it. She looked at her father, hoping he would understand. I'm going to be there when he does. This is inexcusable, Millicent shot back. The Bidens are founding members of that club. Back to your great grandfather. We have always attended the ball. Things change. Kelsey fought to keep her tone reasonable rather than hard. I have a job, a responsibility, and a need. I'm not willing to overlook any of them for a dance at the country club. And, Candace, as much as I appreciate your concern, I don't want an arranged escort. I'm involved with someone. Oh? Candace blinked and struggled to look pleased. Well, of course, dear, that's delightful. You must bring him. I don't think so. In sympathy, she squeezed Candace's hand. I don't think he's the country club type. One of your stable hands, I suppose, Millicent said bitterly. No, unable to help herself, Kelsey didn't leave it at that. He's a gambler. You're just like your mother. Spine ramrod stiff, Millicent rose. I warned you, she said to Philip. You wouldn't listen to me about Naomi, and you wouldn't listen to me about her daughter. Now we all pay the price. Millicent! Standing quickly, Candace hurried out of the room after her mother-in-law. Kelsey set her tea aside. She'd been sorry almost before the words were out, not because of Millicent's feelings, but her father's. That wasn't very tactful of me, she began. Honesty was always more your forte than tact. His voice was weary and stirred up more guilt. You're disappointed, I wish there was a way I could do what I need to do and not disappoint you. It's a situation that can't please everyone. He rose, turning his back to her as he walked to the windows. He could see his azaleas, the tight buds, just freeing up the inner blossoms. The blossoms wouldn't stay trapped, but would burst through the well-meaning protection and spring defiantly to life. You've connected with her, he said softly. I can't say I didn't expect it. So much about you is the same, so much more than your looks. A part of me, a part I'm ashamed of, wants to tell you that you're making a mistake, that you don't belong there. That part of me doesn't want to see how happy it makes you that you do belong there. I feel as though I've found what I'm supposed to do, that I don't need to race around the next corner to see if there's something there more interesting, more important. That's all I was doing with my life. We both know it. You were searching, Kelsey. There's nothing to be ashamed of. I'm not ashamed of it, but I'm tired of it. I'm good with the horses, with the work, with the people. I can't go back to my apartment, to busy work jobs, to weekends at the club. I feel as if I'm opening up. Because it hurt him to look at them now, he turned away from the flowers, breaking free. Yes, I didn't know how dissatisfied I was, especially with myself. That may be, Candace swept back. Her jaw was set, her eyes angry. But you had no reason to be rude. Your father and I and your grandmother are only trying to help you through a difficult time. I think, Kelsey said slowly, the problem is that this isn't as difficult for me as you think. Then you might think of others, about how Philip feels, about how all of this looks to outsiders. Candace, Philip said, this isn't necessary, isn't it? Maybe you're right, Candace. I'm very much concerned how Dad feels. I'm sorry, but I don't have your sensibility about what outsiders think. I don't want to embarrass you, she continued, or calls problems between the two of you. Yet you encourage Channing to deceive me and stay at that place. Boggy ground, Kelsey thought, and cursed Channing for leading her on to it. I encouraged him to stay, yes. Now he has some notion about going back there, working there this summer. Flushed with emotion, Candace gripped the back of a chair. She might have lured you away, Kelsey, but I won't have her corrupting Channing. Good God! At wit's end, Kelsey dragged her hands through her hair. Where does this come from? 
You haven't even met the woman, but you've cast her as some B-movie siren who seduces young boys and destroys all she touches. She didn't open her home to Channing to corrupt him or to spite any of you. She did it for me, and she offered him the job because he showed an interest in the farm. Well, I won't have it. Candace detested sounding shrewish, resented the fact that Kelsey's stubbornness made her so. I won't have my son loitering around racetracks and associating with gamblers and a convicted murderer. Kelsey dropped her hands. That's certainly between you and Channing. Yes, it is. It's quite true I have no right to tell you what to do. Her lips quivered. She'd done her best by Kelsey, her very best to be a friend, a guiding force instead of the textbook stepmother, and now it seemed she'd failed. Even if I did, you'd continue to do as you choose, as you've always done. Philip stepped forward, as perplexed as he was hurt by the outburst. Candace, we're losing the perspective here. It's only a club dance. I'm sorry, Philip. Her angry embarrassment over the scene with Millicent pushed her forward. Millicent was more than her mother-in-law. She was her friend and her ally. I feel I must have my say in this. It's much more than a dance. It's a matter of loyalty and proper behavior. This situation cannot go on. You've hurt your father enough by choosing Naomi over him. Is that what you think I'm doing? She whirled on her father. Is that what you think? Can't you believe that I'm capable of caring for both of you? Of learning to accept and forgive? You've nothing to forgive Philip for, Candace put in staunchly. He did everything that was right. I did what I thought best, he murmured. This is difficult for me, Kelsey. I can't tell you it isn't, but I still want what's best for you. I'm trying to find out what that is, or if not what's best, at least what's right. I don't want to hurt you in the process. I'm sure you don't, Candace said wearily. She'd never really understood her stepdaughter. Why should that change now? The problem here, Kelsey, is the same as it's always been. You look straight ahead toward a goal and don't notice the consequences of achieving it. And when you have it, you don't always want it. The thumbnail analysis stung more than any whip of anger. Which makes me cold and shallow. Her voice trembled no matter how she fought to control it. It's not the first time that's been pointed out to me, so it's hard to argue. That's not true. Philip took her by the shoulders. And certainly not what Candace meant. You're strong-minded, Kelsey, and you can be stubborn. Those are virtues as well as flaws. Candace took a mental step in retreat. She knew from experience her preferences would never hold against a united front. We're concerned about you, Kelsey. If I criticized too harshly, it's only because of that concern and the fact that the situation is becoming difficult for everyone. The recent publicity has stirred up old memories. People are beginning to talk, and that puts your father in a delicate position. Two men were killed. Steadier, Kelsey stepped back. I had no control over that, nor do I have any over the gossip it generates. Two men were killed, Philip repeated. Can you expect us not to worry? No, I can only tell you it had nothing to do with me or Three Willows. Violence happens everywhere. The racing world isn't a hive of vice and debauchery. There's no time or energy for either when you're up at dawn every morning. It's work, hard work. Some of it tedious, some of it exciting, and all of it, to me, rewarding. There's no partying every night with champagne and mobsters. Hell, most nights were sound asleep before ten. I've watched fools being born and seen grown men sing a sick horse to sleep at night. It's not a Disney movie, but it's no orgy of sin either. Philip said nothing. He knew he'd lost. It might have been Naomi standing there, defending a world he had never understood and could never belong to. I'm sure it has its merits, Candace tried for calm. I've watched the Kentucky Derby myself on television, and there's no denying the horses are magnificent, the entire event exciting. Why, the Hanahans had an interest in a racehorse a few years ago. You remember, Philip. We're not condemning the entire... profession, she supposed it was called. 
We're concerned about your associations. You did say you were involved with a gambler. Kelsey let out a huff of breath. I said that to Needle Grandmother. What I should have said was that I'm interested in a man who owns a neighboring farm. I'm sorry I caused trouble. Now I'll apologize in advance because I'm about to cause more. I'm not renewing the lease on my apartment. I'm going to stay on at Three Willows, at least for the time being. I may look for a house later in the year, but I'm going to keep working at the farm. Candace put a hand on Philip's arm, a gesture of support and unity. No matter what the consequences. I'll do my best to minimize them. I realize you won't want to visit me there, so I'll come to you as often as I can. I'll be out of town for a while, but I'll call. She picked up her purse and twisted the strap in her hands. I don't want to lose you, either of you. You can't. This will always be your home. As Philip gathered his daughter close, Candace said nothing. It seemed to take longer to drive back, a sobering interlude where Kelsey wavered between tears and anger. Most of the anger died by the time she pulled up at Three Willows. It left too much room for hurt. She turned from the front door. She didn't want to go inside just yet and face Naomi. Certainly it would be poor form to discuss with her what had been said about her and the world she lived in. Better, Kelsey decided, to get over it first, to just sit with the fading daffodils and blooming dogwoods until the inner storm passed. She lost her chance for solitude when Gabe stepped onto the patio. I've been looking for you. Oh, I thought you'd gone. He joined her on the narrow stone bench that looked out over early pinks and columbine. I'm not leaving until tonight. He wanted to see her again, a simple enough reason to juggle his plans. Taking her chin in his hand, he had a good look. She'd been crying. Both that and the fact that it unnerved him came as a surprise. What's wrong? She shook her head, shifted away. Do you spend much time on self-reflection? Not if I can avoid it. It's hard to do that when your faults are held up in front of you like a mirror. You look at them and you see yourself. He slipped an arm around her shoulders and kept his voice light. Who has been mean to you, baby? I'll go beat him up. With a half laugh, she nuzzled against him, then drew away. I'm not a nice person, Gabe, and I hardly ever think about trying to be. It used to surprise me when someone would tell me I was spoiled or stubborn or single-minded, and I could say to myself, that's not true. I'm just doing what seems right to me. Restless, she rose, leaving him on the bench while she took a few steps along the bricked path that wound through the infant flowers. When Wade said I was cold and self-absorbed, rigid, unforgiving, all those things, I could rationalize that he'd said it to justify his own adultery. I wasn't hot enough in bed, so he found someone who was. I wasn't sympathetic enough, interested enough in his career. Someone else was. I refused to overlook the fact that I'd found him cozied up with another woman. If I was too rigid to understand his physical needs, well, that was my problem. I've never had any trouble tossing the baby out with the bathwater. Break a marriage vow? The marriage is over, and that's that. Well, I am rigid. She spun back, ready to dare him to disagree. There's right and there's wrong. There's truth and there are lies. There's law and there's crime. Take seat belts. Cautious, he nodded. All right. Take seat belts. Maybe before it was passed into law, I'd forgot to use mine. You're busy, you're in a hurry, you're just going down the block. Why bother? But the minute the law was passed, Kelsey straps herself in, every time, no question. And you figure that makes you rigid. Before they passed the law, it was just as stupid not to use them. The law didn't change the basic common sense. But I could ignore common sense, never the law. Well, speed limits, she admitted. But whenever I overlooked them, I rationalized it. If I went to Atlanta to try to fix my marriage, if I knew something was wrong with it and I was willing to make the effort to work on it, why wasn't I willing to forgive what I found there? Because he'd made a promise. He'd taken a vow and he'd broken it. That was enough for me. Gabe rubbed a hand over his chin. Do you want me to tell you that you were wrong to dump the bastard, Kelsey? I can't, for two reasons. One, I agree with you. And two, I want you myself. I can say that if 
it had been you and me, and I'd walked in on you, cozied up with another guy, he'd be dead and you'd be sorry. Does that help any? She closed her eyes, scrubbed both hands over her face. How did I get into all this? My guess is you've had a rough morning. Where have you been? I went to see my father. She wanted to cry again, ridiculously, and turned away until she had the tears fought back. I wanted to tell him face to face that I was giving up my apartment and staying on here, at least for now. So he gave you a hard time? No, not really, not him. He's the kindest man in the world. I'm hurting him. She let the tears come now. The hell with him. I don't want to. I don't want to make him unhappy, but I just can't bend enough, not enough to make it all right for everyone. He didn't say anything, but simply rose and gathered her close. He never battled words against tears. It was best to let them flow until they ran clean. This is stupid. Sniffling, she searched her pocket for a tissue, then took the bandana Gabe offered. This whole thing started over a stupid dance, the derby and the dentist. Why don't we sit down again, and you can decode that for me? It's tradition, she said, and plopped down on the bench again. And living up to family expectations. I'm not going to claim that my childhood was fraught with peril, but there's always been the Biden name to live up to, especially where my grandmother's concerned. She balled the bandana in her hand, wished she could ball her anger and resentments with it and heave it away. She still miffed at me for divorcing Wade, putting that blot on the family honor. Needless to say, she's furious about my being here. Struggling to lighten her own mood, she forced a smile. I have been, in the best Gothic tradition, cut out of her will. Well, he picked up her hand and toyed with her fingers. You can always move in with me, be a kept woman. That ought to show her. Christ, I'd have my name expunged from the family Bible for that. When he realized he'd been only half joking, he released her hand. Can't have that, can we? So, what about the dance, the derby, and the dentist? Sounds like the title of a very bad play. Trying to relax, she lifted her hair off her neck and shoulders, then let it fall again. When I went to see Dad, I had the bonus of Grandmother and Candace, my stepmother, eating cucumber sandwiches and planning the floral arrangements for the spring ball at the country club, which they fully expected me to attend. They'd even arranged for my escort, since I've refused to date since I walked out on Wade. They'd hold it. He held up a hand. For my personal interest, run that last part by me again about not dating. I haven't gone out with anyone in two years. Partly because until the divorce was final it felt wrong, and partly, mostly, because I didn't want to. <laughs> Sex has never been a driving force in my life. He picked up her hand again, kissed it. We can fix that. I'm trying to explain. She tugged on her hand, found it firmly caught in his, and gave up. The dentist, an oral surgeon, is the son of friends who's recently relocated to D.C., He meets all the Biden standards. You, by the way, don't. That's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. Let's go back to my place and celebrate. You're making me feel better. I wasn't ready to feel better. Smiling, she laid her head against his shoulder. Anyway, I had to tell them not only that I wasn't interested in Dr. Acceptable, but that I wouldn't make it to the spring ball at all. It's the first Saturday in May. The Derby. Now all the pieces fall into place. Yes, the Derby. That started a row, a fairly civilized one initially, but Grandmother was getting under my skin. So, she gazed slyly at him from under her lashes. I told her I was involved with a gambler, just to piss her off. You got a nasty streak. He caught her face in his hand and kissed her hard before she could decide to evade or not. I like it. They didn't. Grandmother stormed out. My father looked devastated. And Candace was so angry. We've butted heads before, but this time she aimed low, and she hit the mark. The longer I stay here, the more it disturbs the family. And since I'm too rigid to bend, I won't look for a compromise. Sometimes there isn't any compromise. Nice people find them. A delicate situation, he thought, 
studying the young geraniums in the patio pots. A family situation, and he had very little experience with family. Did it ever occur to you that your family isn't looking for a compromise either? He watched as she turned her face slowly to his. All or nothing. Isn't that basically how they put it? I hadn't thought of it that way. No, because you're so cold, you're so rigid, you're so hard that you've automatically taken all the blame for it. They can toss out the guilt, threaten to disinherit you, tell you how selfish you are, but it's all your fault. To her knowledge, no one had ever taken her side against the family. Certainly not Wade. It had always been she who'd caused the scenes, ruffled the feathers. Strange that it had never passed through her mind that their side of issues was as unyielding as her own. I'm doing what I want, regardless... Regardless of what, he demanded. Perhaps he'd never had a family to shelter him, but neither had he had one to lock him in with guilt and obligation. Regardless of the fact that some people have to make adjustments, if you trotted off to your dance with the designated dentist, would it make any difference? No, she said after a long moment. It would just postpone the next scene. Are you staying here to spite them? Of course not. Insulted, she snapped her head back. Of course not, she said again, this time more subdued. This must seem awfully foolish to you, all of this chaos over propriety and tradition. I just figure you've beaten yourself up long enough over who you are and what you want. Feeling better? Much. She let out a big cleansing sigh. I'm glad you were still around, Slater. I wanted to see you again before I left. His fingers slid over the nape of her neck, teasing out chills. You're screwing up my schedule, Kelsey. Oh, she kept her eyes on the hands she'd folded in her lap. I'm starting to think about you before my eyes are open in the morning. I figure there are three times when a man's most vulnerable. When he's drunk, when he's lost himself in sex, and at that instant right before he wakes up. I don't drink, and I haven't had any interest in sex with another woman since I saw you. But you've caught me in that one instant when the defenses are down. She'd had men recite poetry to her who hadn't stirred her so deeply, emotionally, romantically, sexually. She'd lifted her gaze to his as he'd spoken, drawn by that soft, alluring voice. Now she was caught. Now she was defenseless. I'm afraid of you. She'd had no idea she'd felt it, much less that she'd been about to say it. Good. That makes us even. He framed her face, slowly combing her hair back with his fingers, drawing out the moment so that they would both remember. Bird song, spring flowers, the slant of the afternoon sun, then the jolt of mouth against mouth, the quick leap of a heart, the long, slow moan of mutual pleasure. What happens inside me when I do that scares the hell out of me. He rested his brow against hers while the new and almost familiar emotions worked through him. The fact that as soon as I've done it, I want to do it again scares me even more. Me too. It's probably best you're going away for a few days. There's so much to think about. I've about finished thinking, Kelsey. She nearly had her breath back and nodded. Me too. With some regret, she eased away. Good luck at Keeneland, and thanks for the shoulder. I needed it. I guess I needed you. Chapter 15 Naomi didn't question Kelsey's decision to accompany the team to Kentucky. She'd wanted her there, badly, but hadn't allowed herself to take it for granted. Naomi no longer took anything for granted. The only disagreement between them occurred when Kelsey insisted on paying her own expenses. Naomi simmered over it privately during the packing and preparations, throughout the flight, and while they'd checked into their hotel. It wasn't until she'd asked Kelsey to join her in her suite that the simmering boiled over. This is absurd. Agitated, Naomi paced, ignoring the light meal and bottle of wine she'd ordered up to help keep the discussion amiable. 
You're here with Three Willows Farm. You'll be helping Boggs with pride. It's a simple business expense. I'm here, Kelsey corrected, because I want to be here, because I wouldn't miss the bluegrass steaks or the derby for anything in the world. And I'm extra baggage as far as pride's concerned. Moses and his team don't need me. I do, Naomi shot back before she could stop herself. Do you know what it means to me to have you here? To have you want to be here? To know after all this time and all the loss that you'll be standing with me, not just at post time, but through all the wonderful foolishness that goes on before that final two minutes? I'd rather have you here from now until the first Saturday in May than win a dozen derbies, and you won't even let me settle your hotel bill. More than a little taken aback, Kelsey stared as her mother stalked around the room. She'd never seen Naomi so overwrought, so brimful of emotion. Finally, here was the woman who had laughed for her wedding photo, who had flirted recklessly with men, who had killed one. It just didn't seem right to me, Kelsey began, but stopped the moment Naomi whirled on her. Why isn't it right? Because I wasn't the conventional mother? Because I was in a cell when I should have been teaching you to tie your shoes? That's not what I... I don't expect you to forgive that, Naomi snapped back. I don't expect you to forget it. You're not required to love me or even to think of me as your mother, but I thought you were beginning to think of Three Willows as your home. And how, Kelsey wondered, had she started this whirlwind by simply using her own charge card? I do, she said carefully, ready to parry the next explosion. That doesn't mean I want to take advantage of it. Or you. But the explosion didn't come. Naomi sat, deliberately fighting back her anger. If you don't want to accept the trip from me, I'd like you to accept it from Three Willows. Your association there might very well have cost you at least part of your inheritance. I regret that. So, this is a payment on guilt? All right. Kelsey threw up her hands when Naomi's eyes went to smoke. This is silly. I didn't realize you were so worked up over it. Pay the bill if it's important to you. She tossed back her hair. You know, I've always wondered where my temper came from. Dad is placid as a lake. And you, you're so cool, so controlled, so in charge. It's worth losing a fight to have seen that I came by my temperament honestly. I'm glad I could solve one of life's little mysteries for you. After a jerky shrug, Naomi plucked a strawberry from the fruit plate she'd ordered. Win or lose, a fight makes me hungry. Want to eat? Yeah. Kelsey chose a slice of apple. I want to tell you something. She began in a tone that had Naomi's hand pausing as she poured wine. I do think of you as my mother. I wouldn't still be here if I didn't. Naomi leaned forward and kissed Kelsey's cheek. Then, steadying her hand, she filled their glasses. To the women of Three Willows, she tapped her glass against Kelsey's. I've waited a long time to drink to that. The days before the bluegrass stakes passed in a blur. Kelsey met more people than she could ever remember. She rose each morning at dawn to watch the workouts, worrying, comparing pride to every other colt and filly who soared through the mist. She haunted the shed row, studying jockeys, judging trainers, and badgering bogs for tidbits of news or speculation. Whenever she could corner him, she harassed Reno, prodding him for his thoughts, grilling him over strategy. She worried over him, over the colt, over the track. Hey, he asked her, who's going to ride that colt, you or me? She pouted a bit, rocking back on her heels as the two of them spent a private moment with pride. You are, but but you'd rather have your hands on the reins. The pout turned into a small smile. Maybe. She stroked pride's nose, enjoying its warmth, its softness. I guess I've got the fever. You're burning up with it. Reno hooked his thumbs in the pockets of his navy silk suit. He had a woman waiting for him and a great deal on his mind. That's part of it, isn't it? The nerves, the ambition. She took the apple she'd been saving and held it out to pride. The love. It gets to you, Reno agreed. It would be no use telling her that sooner or later other things would interfere with the innocence of it. The numbers, the angles, the odds. She'd find out for herself, he thought, 
and gave her a friendly pat on the back. You keep our boy happy, kiddo, and remind him about that Kentucky colt. Keep him on edge. With a wink, Reno sauntered out of the barn. You don't have to worry about that flash in the pan, Kelsey assured Pride. He can't compare to you. Pride crunched his apple, obviously in complete agreement. Midnight Hour, a Kentucky bred colt, was the local favorite. He'd been the surprise winner of the Florida Derby, outdistancing both Pride and Double by a neck. The small, easily spooked roan was getting a lot of national press. And Kelsey had to admit, this one was a beauty. The classic lines, the unpredictable disposition, the fire in the eyes. The colt used a shadow roll on the track to prevent him from shying at shadows and things that weren't there. But he could run. She'd seen that for herself. Bill Cunningham's filly had her supporters as well. One didn't have to admire the man to admire his horse. Sheba had heart and courage and could break through the gate like a tornado. But the sound of her wheezing after a hard workout chilled Kelsey's blood. There were others who showed heart and grit, not the least of which was Gabe's double. But Kelsey's money was on pride. She told herself it wasn't simply loyalty, not even simply love but the eye she was beginning to develop under Moses's careful tutelage. The colt was one in a million, as she was sure her own honor was. The day of the stakes, she stood beside her mother, eager to have her confidence justified. He looked so good this morning. Kelsey took long, deep breaths. She wanted to enjoy the post-parade, the pageantry, the anticipation, but she couldn't stop talking. Moses said he had Reno hold him back a little because he wanted to keep him on edge. The field's hard and fast, just the way he likes it. I heard some of the clockers. The sentiment's riding with midnight hour, but the cool heads are split almost even between pride and double. She rubbed a hand over her mouth. Still, sudden force might be the missing link. That's the chestnut colt in from Arkansas. He looked ready this morning, and we can't count out Cunningham's filly. She's got such heart. Amused and impressed, Naomi ran a soothing hand up and down Kelsey's arm. Just take a deep breath. It'll all be over in a few minutes. I just have time to wish my two favorite ladies good luck. Gabe slipped between them, kissed them both. Looks like we're both seven to five, he commented, studying the odds board. What do you say the winner buys dinner? And the loser springs for the champagne. Naomi gave him a quick grin. I've always preferred to have a man buy my drinks. Good one, Kelsey murmured. Then, rather than taking a breath, she held it. The horses were being led to the gate. From the shelter of the stands, Rich watched his son. The boy had always had taste in females, and the devil's own luck with them. Just like his old man, Rich thought, and patted the derriere of the tipsy little blonde he'd picked up the night before. Keep your eye on number three, he told her. I've got me an interest in that horse. A real close interest. The bell sounded. The horses surged forward, and the woman beside him squealed and began to cheer boozily for number three. Rich narrowed eyes, shielded behind mirrored lenses. The local favorite had the lead, with the colt from Arkansas pressing close to the rail. The pack was hardly more than a blur of color and pounding legs, but he never lost sight of number three. Cunningham's filly ran valiantly, clipping the lead down to a neck by the first turn. But already Virginia's pride was bursting out of the pack, eating up the light, spewing up turf. Rich nodded slowly, a smile beginning to curve his mouth. Double won the rail and streaked up the inside on the back stretch. Even the thunder of hooves was lost in the wild cheers of the crowd. For an instant, one of those gorgeous photographic moments, three horses were neck and neck, Strides almost in unison, silks blazing. Then pride drove forward, a nose, a neck, a half-length. They crossed the wire within fractions of a second. Virginia's pride, double or nothing, big Sheba. Win, place, show. Rich tossed back his head and laughed. Honey, I've hit the big time. She pouted, swirled her beer. Number three didn't win. Rich laughed again fingering the ticket for the thousand dollars he'd put on Pride's nose. That's what you think, darling. Old Richie's hunches always pay off. Oh, God! 
Kelsey still had her hands covering her mouth. Toward the end, she'd nearly given in to the urge to place them over her eyes. He did it! He won! On a whoop of laughter, she tossed her arms around Naomi. Congratulations! It's just the prelude to the derby. I can feel it. So can I. Naomi squeezed back hard, ignoring the sudden intrusion of cameras and press. Come with me to the winner's circle. I want you with me. You couldn't keep me away. She swung back to Gabe. For someone who'd just lost by half a length, he looked awfully pleased with himself. Your colt ran a good race. He did. Yours ran better. He tugged the braid that ringed down her back. This time. See you at dinner. The victory glow wasn't allowed to distract anyone from the job at hand. They'd stay in Kentucky until after the derby, moving from Keeneland to Churchill Downs. Dawn still meant workouts, clockers, black coffee, and trainers watching from the backside rail. Only this was the derby. Workouts were no longer a private affair. Even as exercise boys roused themselves from bed, reporters were setting up equipment. Television, newspapers, magazines, all wanted features, all wanted that definitive interview, that perfect picture. Kelsey knew what hers would have been. The soft dawn, that most magical time for horse and horseman, with mist rising, blurring color, muffled sound, and the signature twin spires of the track spearing up through it. Tubs of hot water added steam. Birds sang their morning song. Spring had come to Louisville, but there was still a vague chill at this hour, bracing, exciting. It touched off more white steam from the flanks and shoulders of horses returning from a gallop. Pampered and pushed, they slipped through the mists as magically as any pegasus rising from hooves to wings. But they were athletes. It was easy to forget that these half-ton creatures, balanced on breadstick legs, had been born to run. Of the thousands of thoroughbreds fold every year, only a few, a special few, would ever walk through the morning fog at this track, on this week. Only one would stand on Saturday with a blooming blanket of red roses over its glistening back. Grooms carried the tubs and the wrappings, moving through the thinning swirl among the horses, while the sun streamed softly, burning away the dawn, turning dew to diamonds. A cat meowed, boot heels crunched, and then the sound of hooves on dirt, eerily disembodied at first, then growing, swelling as the grayish mists parted like water, a colt swimming through them. That was her picture, the memory Kelsey would take with her, quiet and comforting amid all the colors and the pageantry. "'What are you doing?' Kelsey said nothing at first, simply took Gabe's hand in hers. She should have known he would walk into the scene and make himself part of the memory. "'Taking a picture, I don't want all of this to get lost with the parties and the press and the pressure. "'You're up early for someone who couldn't have gotten to bed before, too. "'Who can sleep?' In answer, Gabe nodded toward a stable boy who was leaning back against the barn wall, dozing. She laughed and took a deep gulp of air, swallowing the sense of horse, liniment, leather, manure. It's too new to me. I saw your jockey working double this morning. They looked good. I saw you, leaning on the backstretch rail. You looked good. I don't know how you have the energy to flirt with all that's going on. This is like Mardi Gras, a Kawanian convention and the Super Bowl rolled into one. She began to walk. Parades, hot air balloon races, owners' dinners, trainers' dinners. That steamboat race yesterday, I've never seen anything like it. I won 5,000. She snorted. Figures. Who was foolish enough to bet against you? He grinned. Moses. She tugged down the brim of her cap. Well, with his 10% of Saturday's purse, he can afford it. You're getting cocky, darling. I've always been cocky. You're going to the museum for the draw, aren't you? Wouldn't miss it. He hadn't missed the drawing of the field in five years. His presence, or lack of it, would make no difference as to which position his colt was assigned, but it was his colt. There's breakfast in the old paddock before. Hungry? Moaning, she pressed a hand to her stomach. I've done more grazing than a Holstein since I got to Louisville. I think I'll skip it. If you... She trailed off, noting his attention had wandered. No, she realized, it was more than that. It had focused, frozen, beamed in like a laser on something back at the shed row. Something wrong? No. For an instant, he thought he'd seen his father. 
that familiar swagger, the pastel suit so out of place among denim and cotton. But it had been only a glimpse, and surely Rich Slater wouldn't be wandering around the barns at Churchill Downs at an hour past dawn. No, he said again, and shook off the automatic dread. If you don't want to eat, come watch me. He didn't think any more about it. Before the morning was over, Gabe was busy analyzing his Colt's number three position with Jameson and his jockey. We got the rail. Kelsey stood with Boggs in the barn, nibbling on one of the apples she had in her pocket while the old groom hooked wraps on a line. It's a sign from God. Boggs took one of the clothespins clipped to his pant leg and meticulously hooked a royal blue wrap. I figure God watches the derby, like everybody. Probably got his favorite. He ran his fingers over a saddle, well worn, the irons rubbed and polished by his own hand. I might just put some of these dead presidents I got in my pocket down on that colt. I thought you never bet. Don't. With the same slow care, he draped a blanket over the line. Not since April 73. He shot her a look to see if she realized that was the year her mother had killed Alec Bradley. When there was nothing in her eyes but mild interest, he continued. "'Was at Keeneland, too, over to Lexington for the stakes race. Three wheelers had a derby hopeful then, too. Fine colt. I loved that colt more than I ever loved a woman. Name was Sunspot. I guess I got me a fever, cause I put a month's pay on him. He came out of the gate like a whirlwind, like he could already see the wire. At the first turn, the colt beside him stumbled, bumped him hard. Spot went down, and it was soon as I saw him go, he'd not race again.' Shattered his near foreleg. Nothing to do but put him down. Your ma put the gun behind his ear herself. It was her cold, and she cried when she did it. But she did what had to be done. He sighed gustily. So I ain't never bet since. Maybe it's bad luck if I do. She put an arm around Boggs, and together they studied the tools of his trade. The drying wrappings, the blinkers, the blankets and cotton padding. Nothing's going to happen to pride. He nodded, taking the apple Kelsey offered him. It's a mistake to love a horse, Miss Kelsey. He polished the apple in his shirt and handed it back to her. I break your heart, one way or another. She only smiled, tossed the apple up, caught it. Is this for me, Boggs, or for pride? His gummy grin split his face. He does like his apples. Then I'd better go give it to him. When she started out, Boggs shifted, then scratched his throat. You know, I saw somebody today I ain't seen in a while. Somebody I knew back in that spring of 73. Oh? Stalling, Boggs took the apple from her and twisted it in his gnarled hands so that it came apart in two neat halves. Mr. Slater's old man. Gabe's father? You saw him here? Thought I did, but my eyes aren't what they were. Funny he'd be here. I recollect he was around the day spot went down. Kicked up a fuss, too, like as if Miss Naomi had planned to lose the race and the horse that day. Of course, he was drunk. But Rich Slater's persuasive to check the horse for drugs. Kelsey stood, the sun at her back, her face in shadow. And what did they find? They didn't find nothing in that colt. The Chadwick's run clean. But they found them in the colt that bumped him. Amphetamines. Who owned the colt? Cunningham. He spat on the ground. Funny, isn't it? Fingers pointed at Cunningham at first, but it turned out the jockey'd done it. Benny Morales. Damn good rider he was. Left a note that said so before hung himself in Cunningham's tack room. God, that's horrible. There's plenty that don't smell so sweet around racehorses, Miss Kelsey. Rich Slater. He had it figured that the Chadwicks bribed Benny to drug his horse, so as even if he won, he'd be disqualified if and they found out. That's pure shit, of course, but a man like that's got to point the blame at somebody. Thing was, most everybody lost that day. Probably wasn't him I saw, but I figured if it was, you might want to keep your distance. I will. Rich Slater had no intention of crossing paths with anyone from Three Willows. He was there as a spectator, and although it would certainly have been wiser for him to be well away from Louisville on Saturday, he wanted a front-row seat. He was on a roll, a wad of bills in his pocket, a willing woman in his bed, 
and a raucous round of parties at his fingertips. He'd made it, finally, to the big time. And the best part, the sweetest part, was the people who would go down as he went up. He had to admit he was brilliant, and he made sure he didn't get drunk enough to share that opinion with anyone but himself. Not only would he pay off an old debt and slap down his ungrateful son, he would also make a small fortune doing it. And really, he was doing nothing at all. He'd simply put the right instrument in the right hands. The Chadwick bitch would pay. Naked, he padded over to the honor bar to raid the stingy bottle's liquor. His companion for Derby Week was passed out on the bed, her tight little body sprawled on the tangled sheets. He'd proved his manhood there, he told himself, and toasted the reflection in the mirror. He still had it. With the glass in his hand, Rich preened in front of the mirror. His vanity was blind to the loose flesh sagging at his waist. He saw the body of a thirty-year-old, trim and tough, the body he'd passed on to his son, who had blown him off with a five-thousand-dollar check. Wouldn't let your dad spend a night under your roof. I'll own the fucking roof when I'm done. He tossed back the whiskey and watched his throat ripple as he swallowed. The boy thought he was better than anybody, always had. In a couple of days he wouldn't be so high and mighty. In a couple of days the worm would have turned. He really had to thank circumstances, past and present, for giving him the opportunity. Cunningham was a bonus, one that had fallen beautifully into his lap. Of course the man was a fool, but fools were the best birds to pluck. And he was going to be plucking Cunningham for many years to come. A nice, steady sideline of blackmail would bring in a nice, steady income. But the payoff, oh, the payoff would come just before 6 p.m. on Saturday. A job, he was sure everyone would agree, well done. He opened another bottle, poured another drink. He wondered if Naomi Chadwick would remember him. If he walked right up to her, took a handful of that pretty little butt, would she remember him? He was tempted to try it to walk right up and give her a quick squeeze and a wink. He didn't like the idea that a woman, any woman, could forget Rich Slater. He remembered her all right. He remembered that fancy, spoiled bitch advertising herself in low-cut dresses or skin-tight jeans, strutting around the track like a filly in heat, spreading her legs for any man who could still get a heart on. He'd wanted her, bad, wanted to lift those frilly skirts and dive in, show her what a real man could do. But when he'd offered, she'd looked at him as though he were something smeared on the bottom of her boot after a walk through the paddock, and she'd laughed at him, laughed until he'd wanted to smash his fist into that beautiful face. Maybe he would have, Rich thought, absently pounding one clenched hand into the palm of the other. Maybe he would have, if that half-breed Jew hadn't come along. Problem here, Miss Naomi? No, Moses, no problem. Just a track rat. How's our boy doing? She'd sashayed off, flicking her tail to coo over her prize colt, and Rich had had no choice but to go home to the dingy rooms he'd rented and smash his fist into his wife's pale, homely face instead. Thought she was too good for him. She'd cost him his pride that day, but he'd cost her a great deal more later when he'd fixed the race. That hadn't been his intention, of course. Nobody could have predicted Morales would lose control of his hyped-up horse and knock into hers so hard. But then again, he thought now. Then again, it had turned out fine. Better than fine, because he'd been smart, he'd been cagey, and he'd used the circumstances against her. He'd paid her back, all right. But he wasn't through. The ten years she'd spent in prison had been only partial payment. The rest of the debt was coming due Saturday. Kelsey passed on the Derby Day breakfast at the governor's mansion. Not only couldn't she eat, she couldn't bear the idea of being so far away from the track. Post time for the first race was precisely 11.30. Like the grooms, jockeys, and trainers, Kelsey was there by six. The idea of going back to the hotel at noon for a nap was impossible. Instead, she stayed with Boggs and some of the other crew, nibbling on the fried chicken she'd bought. Still here? Moses dropped down on the ground beside her and poked in the bucket for a thigh. Where else? 
She was eating from nerves rather than hunger and washed down the chicken with ginger ale. You could sit in your box. It's already a hell of a show. The infield's packed, grandstands filling up. Too nervous. Besides, some reporter will just stick a microphone or a camera in my face. You won't avoid them here either. Your mama's got pull. You could hide out in the Matt Wynn room. Uh Uh-uh, Kelsey licked her fingers. That's for businessmen. Might as well be sitting in a boardroom. That's no place to watch the race. How's Naomi? Wired. You wouldn't know it to look at her, but she's wound tight. Half of that's you being here. She wants you holding that trophy with her. We could do it, couldn't we? I'm not going to tempt the gods and say so. He squinted up at the sky. Good day. Dry, clear. We've got a fast track. I was out there earlier while they were prepping it. It's beautiful, all those neat furrows. I was going to watch some of the early races, but it just made me jittery. Because her stomach still had too much room to flutter, she chose another piece of chicken. Have you seen Gabe? He's sharing the box with Naomi. He'll be back around to harass Jamie and stand in the paddock while his colt's saddled. Things were so busy yesterday, I barely saw him. And never alone. I didn't know whether to bring it up, since I have a pretty good idea how he feels, but Boggs mentioned that he thought he saw Gabe's father. When? Moses asked so quickly, Kelsey was flustered. Well, uh, Thursday, late morning. He said he wasn't sure. Moses! She scrambled to her feet because he'd already gotten up and was heading toward the barn. The man's trouble, he spat out. Bad medicine. Bad medicine? She wanted to smile, but she couldn't make her lips obey. Come on, Moses. Some people carry trouble with them and like to pass it out. Rich Slater's like that. He moved quickly to Pride's box, satisfying himself, then forcing himself to relax. Horses picked up on emotions. He wanted Pride edgy, revved, but not spooked. If he's around, I don't want him near here. The guards won't let anyone in here who isn't authorized. Boggs wasn't even certain. Besides, what trouble could he cause? None. Moses stroked the colt's nose, murmured to him softly. Guess I'm wired, too. Slater's old news. Bad news, but old. Boggs told me about the race in Lexington when Sunspot broke down. Hard. That was hard on her. Slater tried to stir up a hornet's nest there, but they stung the wrong person. Benny Morales was a good jockey. He was making a comeback that year. He'd been out for a while with a broken back. Cunningham put him up on his colt. I was never sure if Benny doctored that colt because he needed the money that bad or if he just needed to beat the Chadwick colt. It hardly mattered why, Moses thought now. The worst had happened. He'd been riding for three willows when he took a bad spill at a morning workout. It was a year and a half before he was back on his feet. Mr. Chadwick offered him a job, assistant trainer, but Benny wanted to ride, wanted to prove himself. So Cunningham put him up. Was he capable? I can't say. He ate a lot of painkillers, worked himself to death to get back down to weight. There weren't a lot of takers, so Cunningham bought him cheap. It ended up costing a lot more than a cut of the purse. Well, he stroked pride again. That's old news. We've got a new race here. The race. It's almost time to take our boy to the paddock. A horse would take this walk from barn to paddock on the first Saturday in May only once. Less than three years before, he would have frolicked cheerfully alongside his mother in green pastures. One of the first steps in a dream. As a yearling, he might have danced in meadows, raced his companions, or his own shadow. Training, growing as muscle and bone developed, learning the poetry and power of movement that was exclusive to the breed. He would come to the bridle eager, or fitful, feel the first weight of man on his back in a dawn-washed stall. One day he would be walked to an iron gate and urged to accept the confinement. He would have trained on the lunge, on the practice oval, He would learn the scent of his groom, feel heat in his legs and the crop on his back. He would do what he had been born to do. He would run. But he would take this walk to this race only once. There was no second chance. At 5.06, they were in the paddock, pride moving into his stall to be saddled. Tattoos were checked, as were the colors and markings of each of the 17 entrants, no different from any other race and different from any other. 
There had been only one scratch. No one mentioned the colt from California who had broken down at the morning workout with an injured foot. Bad luck. Inside the jockey's quarters, Ryder stepped on scales. One hundred and twenty-six pounds, no more, no less, including tack. Reno stepped up, watched the scale, and smiled. The hours in the steam room had been worth it. Moments later, the silks bright, riders made their way from the second floor of their quarters to the paddock. The waiting was nearly over. In the stands, people grew restless, excited, jubilant. Celebrations continued in the infield, some of them heated from liquor smuggled inside hollowed loaves of bread or diaper bags. The odds board flickered, and the betting windows were packed. It was 5.15. The horses were saddled, their lead ponies outfitted brightly with braided tails and flowers. Despite the powder puff clouds riding high overhead, the air was thick. Tension had weight. Don't worry about taking the lead, Moses told Reno. Let the Kentucky Colt set the pace for the first turn. Pride runs well in the pack. He'll thread like a needle. Reno agreed. Though his voice was cool, casual, he was sweating under his silks. And talk to him. Talk to him. He'll run his heart out if you ask him to. Reno nodded, struggling to keep his cocky smile in place. There was so much writing on that quick two minutes. Riders up! At the paddock judge's announcement, Moses slapped a hand on Reno's shoulder, then vaulted him into the saddle. They would head back through the tunnel now on the way to the track. Ready? Naomi clasped a hand over Kelsey's. Yeah. She took a deep breath, then another. Yeah. Me too. After two steps, Naomi shook her head. Wait one minute. In her trim red suit and elegant pearls, she made a dash across the paddock. She was laughing when she caught up with Moses, threw her arms around him, and kissed him. Naomi. Blushing with a combination of pride and embarrassment, like a schoolboy caught pinching the head cheerleader, he wiggled away. What's wrong with you? There's people watching, she finished and kissed him again. The hell with your reputation, Moses. She was still laughing as she dashed back to Kelsey. Well, that settles that. Amused and oddly touched, Kelsey fell into step with her. Does it? A running argument we've had for more years than I care to count. He hasn't wanted our relationship made public because it's unseemly for a woman in my position. She tossed back her hair. God, she felt young and free and incredibly happy. Nothing but male pride, of course, which they all wear in their jock straps. Kelsey snorted out a laugh. Why don't you just marry him? He's never asked me. And I suppose I have too much female pride to ask him. Speaking of males, she saw Gabe walking toward them. I'd like to say, before he can hear me, that there is one of the most gorgeous examples of the species that I've ever seen. There's something about the eyes, Kelsey murmured, and the mouth, and the cheekbones. Her smile curved slyly. And, of course, there's that incredible butt. I've noticed... Naomi giggled. Just because I'm nearly old enough to be his mother doesn't mean I've lost my eyesight. Ladies? Gabe cocked his head. When two women had gleams like that in their eyes, something was up. Want to share the joke? They looked at each other and shook their heads in unison. Nope. Each hooked an arm through one of his and strolled to their box to the strains of My Old Kentucky Home. Deep in the stands... Surrounded by pitcher hats and silk jackets, Rich Slater swirled his third mint julep. The seats Bill Cunningham had arranged for him weren't choice, but he'd sprung for a new pocket-sized set of binoculars. With them, he watched Gabe escort the women up to their glitzy box. Quite a picture they made, he thought. Naomi in her flashy red suit, the daughter in her flashy blue, both blonde heads gleaming, like a couple of sexy bookends for the tall, dark man between them. He wondered if the boy had taken them both to bed yet, a blonde sandwich with four milky legs and arms. He'd bet they could fuck like rabbits. Look, honey, aren't they the cutest things with the flowers in their hair? Sherry, who'd lasted out the week with him due to tireless sex and a high tolerance for slow gin fizzes, tugged on his arm. 
Dutifully, Rich shifted his attention back to the game at hand. They sure are, baby, cute as can be. The entrants were ponied around the track, their flower-bedecked escorts carrying liveried riders. The Arkansas colt danced and tried to nip at the colt in front of him. The pony rider helped the jockey calm him. The entrants cantered around the track to the cheers of the crowd. It's incredible, Kelsey said, all of it just incredible. She shook her head at Gabe's offer of a drink. I can't swallow. I can hardly breathe. Oh, God, they're loading them in the gate. Everyone was in place, horses, jockeys, assistants, officials. In the steward's stand, two judges stood outside, peering through binoculars, waiting for the start. A third remained in the steward's room with two television monitors. Others were stationed at poles and the finish line. From the announcer's booth, It is now post time. Once they started the derby with a whip. Now it was the press of a button and the words everyone had waited for. And they're off. A plunge through the gate, the roar of the crowd, and the first feet of the race were eaten up by flashing hooves. Kelsey's heart leaped to her throat and stayed there. So much color, so much sound could be lost in the blur of dazzled eyes and speeding pulse. The pack swept past the grandstands for the first time, around the clubhouse turn. The first quarter whizzed by in a fraction more than 22 seconds, with the Kentucky-bred favorite in the lead. With her binoculars all but glued to her eyes, Kelsey searched the pack for pride. His colors blazed as he began to surge forward, almost hoofbeat to hoofbeat with Gabe's colt. Cunningham's game, Big Sheba, thundered between them. He's moving up! He's moving up! She was screaming but didn't know it. Her voice was lost in the wall of sound. Naomi's fingers were on her arm, digging in. Pride nosed out midnight hour at the half mile. In 45 seconds flat, Reno curved over his back. She could see the turf fly, the swing of silk as bats were whipped, the incredible power of long, slender legs bunching, reaching, lifting. Midnight hour dropped back to fourth, horse and rider battling for the rail. At three quarters, Pride inched ahead, a neck, a half length, but the long shot colt dug in and stole back the distance. A two horse race, some would say, with a valiant filly behind by two lengths at the mile. The Arkansas colt surged from the pack, making a bid for a come from behind that had the crowd frenzied. Then that last sprint for the wire, all or nothing. It happened fast. Just before the sixteenth pole, Pride stumbled, those plunging forelegs folding like toothpicks. Reno, balanced in the irons, sailed over his head and rolled like a stone into the infield. As the horses and riders fought and veered in the dust cloud to prevent a collision, the colt made one fitful attempt to rise, then crumpled on his ruined legs and stayed down. Double or nothing sailed under the wire in two minutes, three and three quarter seconds as grooms scurried from everywhere onto the track to aid the injured champion.